need my coffee. Hot time in the city. My hair plugs ain't pretty. Hot times in the city. I'm feeling kind of bad. Seven to eight hours twice a week. The, the show hasn't started yet. Just uh, just getting it ready. Show hasn't started yet. Welcome to the mop up for March 24th, 2022. Critical race theory doesn't need to be taught in our schools. It does not need to be taught in our schools today. President Biden in Brussels said he is prepared to accept 100,000 Ukrainians into America as migrants. I'm sorry they're white so they would be refugees and that's great we're accepting a hundred thousand ukrainians we should be accepting more i'm glad we need them our economy needs more immigrants because without more immigrants medicare and social security will collapse we need young people we need new people coming into this country paying into medicare and social security and buying our worthless crap that's how our economy is sustained by more people our population isn't growing i welcome these ukrainians welcome to america let's take in more now along the southern border we also have roughly 250,000 refugees no, no, those are migrants. Those are the migrants, not refugees. Uh, people fleeing war-torn Central America, fleeing gang-infested countries run by gang-infested police, gang-infested military, gang-infested politicians. The people coming from the South, from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, those are not refugees, those are migrants. And there's no room at the inn for them. The same way, there's no room at the inn for the 75,000 people from Afghanistan who were given permission by President Biden to come to America because it's too dangerous for them to live in Afghanistan. They worked, these 75,000 people from Afghanistan made the mistake of trusting America. They worked, they collaborated with the American military. We gave them our word, and yet there's no room for them. Like I said, no need to teach critical race theory in our schools. Just have your child turn on the news. Ukrainians are white and they are welcomed into this country as refugees and they should be we should be taking in more than a hundred thousand the same people the same exact people the same people identical except in color the same people down at the mexican border they are not welcomed into this country we're flying them back especially the ones from haiti war-torn Haiti they're not our problem the people of Afghanistan not white not our problem but the people of Ukraine white we need them all into this country and that is your critical race theory that's all you need to know about critical race theory what else is there to teach America is a designer country. White people are welcome, people of color, not so much. It's why my grandparents coming from Europe were welcome into this country. Well, at the same time, the law said no more Chinese people. We're a designer country. 
just a dapple of brown, a splash of yellow, but the canvas, never forget this, our canvas is white and so is the paint. That's America. The people of color are welcome when we need them to pick our food, but they get no social security. Agriculture workers were not given social security when it was first passed because they tended to be people of color. And then when we no longer need these people of color, we round them all up and send them back, back to Mexico. In 1954, President Eisenhower's Immigration Department called it, and I quote, Operation Wetback. That's where our immigration department decided we no longer needed so many Mexicans. So we're going to round up, came to about a million uh, Mexicans, uh, rounded up and sent back to Mexico. It was called Operation Wetback. That's how it was funded in Congress. They funded Operation Wetback. And half of the people we were sending back were not agricultural workers. That was the 50s. That's the America our Republican Party wants us to return to. And by the way, thousands of Mexicans died in the 50s during Operation Wetback. They were, they were put on cargo ships. They were put on Greyhound bus stations and left, literally left to rot in the heat. That, uh, that was the 50s, and that's what our white-infested Republican Party wants to hearken back to when they say, make America great, the 50s. Not just the 1950s, but the 1850s as well. 1855 gave us the Greaser Act. Did you know about the Greaser Act? It was the companion bill to Operation Wetback. 1855's Greaser Act passed in California to round up Spanish-speaking residents. In Section 2 of the law, it identifies the people to be rounded up as vagrants. This was an anti-vagrancy law. We, we hate our vagrants if they're people of color. That's how we stocked our prisons after we freed the slaves, right? Everybody's read Michelle Alexander, the, the loophole in the 13th Amendment. Find a freed slave, arrest him or her for being a vagrant. Now you have free labor in the prisons. In the uh, 1855 Greaser Act, uh, California state identified the people to be rounded up. It's in section two, the word greaser. They described the, the vagrants as greasers. It's written into the, the law. Arrest the gre greaser. Oh, wait, I'm making a mistake here. I'm sorry. I'm teaching critical race theory. And we don't need to teach critical race theory. All we have to do is turn on the news. The first female African American has just been nominated to sit on our Supreme Court. How old is this country? 250 years? And after 250 years, the first female African American is finally about to sit on the Supreme Court. And you need to teach critical race theory in our schools. If your child doesn't understand that America is and always has been systematically racist, that the racism has been written into our Constitution and our laws, and our bylaws and our covenants, then your child is beyond teaching. If your child doesn't see the racism enshrined in all our institutions, from our schools to our voting rights, to our medical care, then your child is ignorant. And by that, I mean a future Republican. The show has not started yet. The show has not started yet. Did you have you been watching uh, the hearings for Judge Jackson? This is how the Republicans describe the hearings. I have a clip. I think I have a clip. This is how McConnell describes 
the hearings for Judge Jackson. The last 48 hours were a dry and friendly legal seminar compared to the circus the Democrats inflicted on the country just a few years back. The American people know it is not asking too much to ask a federal judge legal questions about her record. I just wish the Senate had gotten more answers. Yes, it was a very dignified, very dignified hearing. And the hearings are, I think they wrap up today. And the Republicans asked strictly legal questions like Lindsey Graham. He put, he proffered this question. What faith are you, by the way? Senator, I am um, Protestant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Non-denominational. Okay. Could you fairly judge a Catholic? Senator, I have a record of I mean, the answer would be yes. judging everyone. I believe you can. I'm just <laughs> asking this question because how important is your faith to you? Senator, personally, um, my faith is very important. Um, but as you know, there's no religious test in the Constitution under, under Article 6. Yes, it was a very dignified hearing that she got from the Republicans. And then there was Senator Cornyn from Texas. Maybe you can figure out this question. When you accuse somebody of a crime, are you calling them a criminal? Oh, Senator, I haven't accused anybody of a crime. That's not my question. When, when in common understanding in plain English, if you accuse someone of a crime, are you accusing them of being a criminal? I, <laughs> it depends on the context. It depends on what else you say about them. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on the circumstances. Yes. So you put this in the cat same category as defining what a biological woman is. No, I'm You're just- really not sure. I, I didn't say I wasn't sure. I said it depends so, on the so circumstances. So you are sure? No, I said it depends on the circumstances that, that you're positing as to whether or not you're calling someone a criminal. I just don't think that's credible, Judge. You know, I don't like to mug on this show. It's not fair to our listeners. So just imagine me mugging right now. I don't know what that was about. I don't know if you caught Ted Cruz. We're going to be discussing the hearings with the Reverend Barry W. Lynn in our eight o'clock hour. He is a member of the Supreme Court bar. He's a lawyer. And for 25 years, he ran Americans United for Separation Church and State. So we'll be playing clips from the hearings where Ted Cruz accused Judge Jackson of being soft on child porn. Ted Cruz insists he's not soft on child porn. In fact, when it comes to child porn, Ted Cruz is very hard. And the show still has not started yet, which is why I want to talk about Tootsie Pops. Um, specifically, chocolate Tootsie Pops. Did you know, some of you may not know that they make chocolate Tootsie Pops. And not only that, there are people who choose to eat chocolate Tootsie Pops. Like they go out of their way to buy chocolate flavored Tootsie Pops. I understand when you buy a variety pack and all that's left are chocolate Tootsie Pops and you figure, well, I'm not done inflicting all the punishment on my body, which deserves to be punished for being attached to me and I hate myself and I need to punish myself and my body for being me. So I'm going to go in for the kill and finish off that bag of Tootsie Pops with the remaining chocolate flavored ones. I get that. You know, it, it, I understand how people get to the bottom of their bag of Tootsie Pops and all that's remaining are chocolate Tootsie Pops. And that's where you go in for that, the final kill. In, in the pure degradation of your life. And also, you know, it's wrong, morally wrong to waste poison. So you, you eat the chocolate Tootsie Pop. You've barreled through an entire variety pack of Tootsie Pops and your inner Puritan 
takes over. And now you're Reverend Arthur Dimsdale from the Scarlet Letter, who instead of licking Hester Penn, you're tonguing the dirty, dark chocolate Tootsie Pop because she's gross and you're gross. So you lick and then you chew with abandon because this Tootsie Pop is one more tumbler on St. Peter's Gate that I won't be able to crack open. So I lap up all the poison because I'm a flawed, frail, and lost man, and I swallow the gooey center. I get it. I get why eating a chocolate Tootsie Pop is sometimes necessary when all that's left at the bottom of a variety pack, of a variety pack of Tootsie Pops, when all that's left are the chocolate Tootsie Pops, and you have to wrap up this ritualistic orgy of self-loathing and finish off the remaining Tootsie Pops. I get that. But to choose a chocolate-flavored Tootsie Pop all by itself because you like the taste? What could be more provincial than wanting, craving a chocolate Tootsie Pop? How limited is your horizon if you reach into your pocket and dole out money to buy a chocolate Tootsie Pop, to choose a chocolate Tootsie Pop? Like I said, if you're, if you're burrowing through a variety pack of Tootsie Pops on a rampage of self-puritanical loathing, and all that's left are the ch chocolate Tootsie Pops. I get that. But to buy a single chocolate Tootsie Pop for pleasure, just to eat, because you have a hankering for one? You know, to be honest, for years, I didn't even think chocolate Tootsie Pops were edible. I always thought they were the silica moisture absorber containers, the Tootsie home office puts in every bag to keep them factory fresh. I didn't think anyone actually ate a chocolate Tootsie Pop. I thought it was made of silica to absorb all the moisture. What kind of brutish swine would eat such a thing? I thought we were a civilized society, but no, it turns out some Americans eat chocolate Tootsie Pops because they chose to. How locked into your own information silo could you possibly be to go out of your way to polish off a chocolate Tootsie Pop? I've seen this. I've seen people actually buy chocolate Tootsie Pops. They chose a chocolate flavored Tootsie Pop. Of all the flavors splayed across the Tootsie Pop spectrum, these Pencil tucky rubes, these pencil tucky rubes opt for chocolate. Think about this for a second. You can buy a grape flavored Tootsie Pop. So when you lick that sharp, tangy grape all the way down to the middle, there is that final blanket of lackluster yet comforting chocolate that warms your palate by telling you it's all going to be okay. You're home. You're eating chocolate now. You're safe. That mean bad grape isn't going to hurt you. I know the grape challenged you with its tart and sour acerbic thrust of bitter sweetness. But now here's the chocolate. You're in mommy's bosom. Take off your shoes, mommy's here, and she's going to cover you in dull chocolate that's always sweet but never cruel because mommy loves you and she will never hurt you. Why would you eat a chocolate Tootsie Pop? You're eating, it's just chocolate. The center is the chocolate, not the outside. You're not supposed to eat chocolate to get to chocolate. You're supposed to power through grape or orange or, or, or strawberry to get to the chocolate. A chocolate Tootsie Pop is a chocolate pop. It's not a chocolate Tootsie Pop. The whole purpose of eating any type of Tootsie Pop other than a chocolate 
one, and I won't even call it a chocolate Tootsie Pop. Uh, I will not dignify this by calling it a chocolate. It's a chocolate pop. It's not a Tootsie Pop. The Tootsie, the chocolate is in the middle. That's it. Not on the outside. That's home. The middle is where mommy is. Mommy is the chocolate. Mommy loves you. She, she's the hearth. When you get to the chocolate, after powering through all the other flavors, you're home. Here, David, just suck on mommy's gooey, chocolatey center. See? Nothing to be afraid of. You're safe. Mommy's here with her warm, comfy chocolate in the middle. In the middle. No surprises with mommy. You know, you had those fruit-flavored balls of sugar on the outside, and they excited they excited you, but now you're home and the chocolate's going to soothe you in the center. The chocolate to remind you that everything you ever needed was always right here in the center. In mommy's bosom. Here, David. Here, baby David. Have some more chocolate. There you go. Keep licking, David. That's it. You're a good boy, David. You know that mommy loves her, David. And I don't care if all the other boys on your Little League team made fun of you yesterday for passing wind in the catcher's face. They're all jealous of you, David, because you don't need to swing a bat and hit a baseball to get on first base. You're brave enough to step into the pitch and take one right in the head. That's how mommy's baby David always gets to first base, because he's a big, strong man. He sticks his head into a fastball. And they're all jealous that you never strike out and that you always get to first base because all the other kids on the team are cowards, but not my baby David. They can't do what you can do. You don't need a bat to hit a ball to get to first base. That's for cowards. Real big boys stick their heads into oncoming fastballs. And after they come to, after they come to from the smelling salts, they take first base, just like Rabbi Mandelbaum taught you. Rabbi Mandelbaum says David is the best behaved kid in the entire Hebrew school. He says, unlike all the other boys, you just stare blankly, blankly at the blackboard and never utter a word because David's a good boy who loves his mommy and his chocolate and he always listens to Rabbi Mandelbaum by sticking his head into oncoming fastballs so that he always gets to first base and never questions the existence of God. David believes in God because he listens to Rabbi Mandelbaum and takes all those fastballs to the skull so he can get to first base. And that's the only reason they make fun of you for passing gas in the catcher's face. They're jealous because they, your other teammates, they have to take batting practice, but you don't. You don't need to take batting practice. And that gives you more time with Rabbi Mandelbaum to study the Torah and blindly believe in a kind and loving God who occasionally floods the planet or wipes out the firstborn males of people he disagrees with. Ah, anyway, how one dimensional is your worldview that you would lick a chocolate flavored Tootsie Pop and somehow be satisfied getting to the middle and finding more chocolate? And this, I can only imagine that this only happens in America. I suspect they do not sell chocolate Tootsie Pops in any other country other than America, because this chocolate Tootsie Pop is so typically American. It says, I'm an American. I know what I like, so why bother expanding my taste buds? I like chocolate, so just give me chocolate. Don't challenge me. We are a nation in crisis, and this is why. If you purchase, if you go out of your way to purchase a chocolate flavored Tootsie Pop and then you personally pay for it and eat it, you are everything that is wrong with America. You are the people who say, let's send soldiers into Ukraine, even though you couldn't recognize Kiev 
on a map of Kiev. All you know is chocolate and all you know is war because you're an American. You know what you know, and that's good enough. Hey, you want to go see an Andalusian dog? The 1929 silent film made by Salvador Dali and Luis Bunel. Bunuel? Nah, I'm going to watch Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory for the 16,000th time. Because when you get right to the end of the movie, there's chocolate. I like a movie that starts with chocolate, has chocolate in the middle, just like a Tootsie Pop. And then at the end, they surprise you with even more chocolate. Okay, how about the movie Chocolate? That's about chocolate. Yeah, but it's a French film that stars Judy Dench, Juliette Binoche, and Alfred Molina, and I've never heard of them, so pass. I know there's chocolate in it, but it's French chocolate, and I only eat English-speaking chocolate. So I'm going to stick with what I know because I'm a proud, patriotic, ignorant American who learned something 20 years ago, and that's good enough. Even if what I learned 20 years ago turns out to be wrong, I'm going to stick with it and insist it's correct. I'm only going to watch the same movie repeatedly because my limited brain capacity can only handle proof of concept franchises like war or tax cuts for the rich because that's what I was told works. And if you suggest otherwise, well, that forces me to think, and thinking always makes me feel stupid. And I don't want to feel stupid because I like to feel smart because I'm an American and I'm entitled to feel smart. And when smart people learn something, they remain loyal to what they learned and they never change. And if somebody is stupid enough to present evidence that tries to prove me wrong, I say, that's your opinion, because I did my own research and ivermectin kills COVID and you're stupid. I'm not stupid. You're stupid because you believe everything you read. And I do my own research by looking for things on the Internet that reinforces everything I already knew to be correct. That's the great thing about doing your own research. You're never wrong, which is why I eat chocolate flavored Tootsie Pops. I chose chocolate and I won't back down. That's my flavor, chocolate. It's who I am. It's who I am. I want to lick chocolate and I want to keep licking chocolate. And then when I get to the gooey center, I want to be surprised by the twist or chocolate. When I fill out my Tinder profile under likes and dislikes, I write, I like chocolate. And under dislikes, I put anything that's not chocolate because I like chocolate and I dislike anything that's not chocolate. Now, let's say I fill out my Tinder profile saying I like chocolate, right? But then I suddenly discover I like strawberry which I don't, but let's say I did, then I'd have to go back and update my Tinder profile because I would hate to start a relationship with a woman who is never going to fall in love with me because I have no idea how to give or receive love, but that doesn't matter. I wouldn't want to have a, a Tinder relationship with a cam girl who goes on Tinder, pretending she's looking for a relationship, but only wants to charge me for cam girl sex. I would hate for that transactional relationship, this transactional relationship that I don't realize is transactional, even though I'm constantly giving her my credit card number so I can pleasure myself while she does things to herself with a bar of chocolate. I would hate for that relationship as shallow and commercial as it is to be based on the lie that I like chocolate because now I like strawberry and I've lied to this cam girl. I've lied to this cam girl on my Tinder profile, this, this cam girl who I met 
on Tinder, who takes my credit card information based on, uh, she takes this information and, and she assumes that I liked chocolate and only chocolate, and then she's gonna be disappointed. She'll stop trusting me if she discovers that I also like strawberry, because I, I lied to her. And it's important that I, as a stupid American, never lie to the cam girls who charge me $6 a minute to let me pleasure myself while they do things to a voluptuous bar of cold, hard, English-speaking American chocolate. I like chocolate and only chocolate, so I'm only going to eat chocolate Tootsie Pops because I know what I know. I liked chocolate when I was a toddler, so there's no need to expand my palate. I'm a stupid American, and everything I ever learned at the age of one is good enough for the rest of my life. What else is there to know? I learned it already. Now I just need to buy things, eat, and plant myself in front of a screen, binge watching someone who looks just like me playing a video game on Twitch because I'm too lazy to play my own video games. I'd rather watch someone else play a video game on Twitch because it's too much effort to play my own video game. I just don't have the thumbs anymore. It's exhausting. So I'll just watch someone on Twitch play a video game because life, like love, is a spectator sport. I watch pornography and I watch people play video games. That's my life because I'm a proud American and I don't need to learn anything new other than that America is the greatest country on earth. Mommy and daddy will always take care of me. Our government doesn't lie. Democrats are all socialists. All advertising is true. Government is bad. Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11 and so were the Taliban. America never loses wars. We only promote democracy overseas. We let in more refugees than the entire world combined. Everybody wants to come to America because in America, nobody goes to bed hungry we can initiate a no-fly zone over Ukraine because our Patriot missiles can shoot nuclear-tipped missiles out of the sky, and I don't have to serve in our military, pay taxes, or vote. All I have to do is eat my chocolate Tootsie Pops, safe in the knowledge that life's only surprise will be a gooey center filled with even more chocolate. show hasn't started yet. If you eat chocolate Tootsie Pops, I hope you choke on them. Hi, show hasn't started yet. I'm David Feldman, now it's starting, coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 45 degrees and cloudy. President Biden met with world leaders in Brussels today because it's time for diplomacy. The war, the killing must stop. So President Biden got on Air Force One, flew to Brussels and met with all the world leaders because that's how you get peace through di di diplomacy. But Biden didn't meet with Putin. He didn't ask to meet with Putin. I'm sure by now Putin wouldn't meet with him. But Putin is talking to the leaders of France, Turkey, Israel, and Germany, hasn't quite met with Biden yet. I don't know why. Uh, meeting, uh, you know, Biden and Putin meeting, that would fall under the category of diplomacy, which President Biden, I believe, is engaging in right now in Brussels. He's holding all these high-level uh, diplomatic uh, meetings to bring an end to the war. He's meeting with everybody except the person we're fighting the war against. And uh, what do I know? What do I know? President Biden uh, today said Russia should be removed from the community of nations. So he said today, he said that Russia should be kicked out of the G20, making it the G19. Uh, I guess that's a good idea. Uh, Putin has nuclear weapons, so let's make him feel more isolated. 
what do I know? I, I don't know. Maybe this will work. Maybe it'll work. I, I hope it does. I hope the isolation, the economic sanctions work and that Russia will not be able to feed its troops in Ukraine and the Russian generals will finally come to their sense and mutiny. And then Biden will go down in history as George Herbert Walker Bush after the first Gulf War, who kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and he brought the troops home and they got a parade and he was the most popular president in modern history only to be defeated at the polls a year later. So I don't know. I'm hoping this works. What do I know? I know nothing. I always thought secretary of states were the ones who were supposed to be the diplomats. I always thought the state department had teams of ambassadors and negotiators who worked on treaties and improved relationships between countries, especially the ones we don't get along with and might go to war with. So, you know, we don't want dead people. I thought that's the role of our state department to make sure we have fewer dead people. Uh, that's what a secretary of state, I, I don't know anything. I don't understand diplomacy. I thought that's the job of our secretary of state. And then Colin Powell was our secretary of state. And he went before the United Nations in 2003 and said, it's time to destroy Iraq and bomb it. Uh, that doesn't sound diplomatic to me. That, uh, that's our secretary of state, Colin Powell. I didn't know uh, Secretary of States were supposed to speak out in favor of bombing other countries, like Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who convinced President Obama uh, to bomb Libya and to bomb Syria. And now, now we have a, a new Secretary of State. Uh, his name is Anthony Blinken, and uh, he, he's, you know, I, I don't understand what. I'm not a, I'm not as smart as Anthony Blinken. He went to Harvard and, and he's running around the world meeting with everybody over this Russia crisis. He's meeting with everybody uh, except Russia. Uh, and he's our top diplomat. And, and today he called Putin a war criminal. That's not diplomatic. It's true, but it's not diplomatic. That shouldn't be coming from our top diplomat. Meanwhile, and this is why I know I don't know anything, General Lloyd Austin, he's our Secretary of Defense. He's the one who says America should not enforce a no-fly zone over Ukraine. He's saying we don't want to start World War III. This is all very confusing to me. The people in this country who are supposed to make war are calling for peace, and the people who are supposed to make peace are calling for war. Our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is running around the world funneling weapons to the Ukrainians. Is that our top diplomat's job? To be rounding up weapons so the fight continues in Ukraine? I'm rooting for Ukraine. I'm not, just not sure it's the Secretary of State's job to be getting weapons to the Ukrainians. Uh, that's, why is, that's not the job of a sec, Secretary of State. Now, he used to be, Blinken, a lobbyist for the weapons manufacturers. Seems to me, and again, I don't know anything, when you take a new job, when you get paid to be Secretary of State, shouldn't you stop working for your old boss and start working for your new boss, the American people? I don't know. Maybe, maybe what they're doing will work. I hope it does. I hope it does. Just seems to me you want to end this thing as quickly as possible with as few lives lost as possible. Maybe this will work. I'm hoping it does. I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing it would work if Putin didn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, not sure it's going to work when one side, uh, when both sides have nuclear weapons. Maybe I'm a coward. Maybe I'm too afraid of a small scale tactical nuclear bomb that would only wipe out a few hundred thousand Ukrainians and a few more 
downwind, a few more thousand downwind in Belarus or southern Russia. Maybe I'm a coward. Maybe, maybe it, we can't live this way, terrified of bullies like Vladimir Putin who get away with war crimes because he knows we're afraid to fight him because that would mean World War III and nuclear destruction. Maybe we can't keep living this way. Maybe we need to just get it out of the way. Maybe it's time to, to, to have some nuclear bombs go off during war and, and realize, you know, it's not so bad. It's only a couple of million. It's not so bad. What do I know? I'm, I'm only, uh, I'm only a, a, an American citizen who pays his taxes. Maybe, maybe we can win this thing. And only 12 million people will end up as refugees. And only, you know, a couple hundred thousand will end up dead, maybe a million. And America will be the victor. And we will regain our status as the sole superpower like we did for six minutes after the first Gulf War. And, and we can have a, a quick parade, better hold it fast, so we can feel good for like six seconds until we look around after the parade and remember we spent all our money on weapons and now have the same logistical problems the Russians have in Ukraine. We can't feed our people. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the solution is hit them hard and hit them fast. And, uh, you know, we kind of did that during the first Gulf War and the second and uh, both times for a few minutes, it worked. Uh, you know, we got that sugar high of momentarily thinking we won, you know, like that momentary sugar high that comes from cutting taxes for the richest one percent and after six seconds we discover that only the yacht building sector has flourished i know nothing maybe being against an american invasion of ukraine or enforcing a no-fly zone over ukraine is disrespectful to all the american troops who haven't been set there, sent there yet. Maybe I'm being disrespectful to the American troops who haven't gone over there yet. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm so unpatriotic, maybe I hate America so much that I'm already telling the troops that haven't been sent to Ukraine that they're about to make a sacrifice in vain, that they are about to end up psychologically scarred in vain. And that's disrespectful to the families of all these troops who haven't been sent over there yet. Maybe I should do the patriotic thing and keep my mouth shut. Maybe, maybe I'm a coward who hates our military, our flag and our country, all because I don't want anybody to die. And I'd rather we spend money on food, medicine and education than on weapons that kill people. But then again, what do I know? It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comments too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Thank you.
Christmas Eve, the kids will have nice gifts, and the big boss will have more money, so he can go up into space, but there still won't be no chairs in this Bessemer place. It said, vote no, but maybe this year union can give us a little more and put some chairs on this Bessemer floor. I'm hoping the union might make things right. Some days I just don't have the strength to fight. This plant down here can take its toll. It'll break your body. It'll crush your soul. Feels like this packing ain't never gonna stop. And there still ain't no chairs in this Bessemer shop. We support Christian Smalls, who's trying to unionize the workers at Amazon, the fulfillment center out by JFK, AmazonLaborUnion.org. Well, Grace Jackson joins us in England, Great Britain. She is co-host of the Literary Hangover podcast, and she's an expert on history and fiction, as well as China. Welcome back, Grace Jackson. Thank you. Hi, it's good to be back. I have emerged from my winter hibernation. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Your heart beats only eight times a minute, as I understand. Yeah, something like that. That sounds about right. Although my heart rate is somewhat elevated right now. Well, there's a lot going on. Let's talk about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how that affects Russia's relationship with China, 
America's relationship with China and Ukraine's relationship with China? Mm, yes, this is a very interesting question. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. So, so China in all of this is, it's kind of got quite a delicate balancing act that it needs to maintain. And that is because, and I'm sure that many of your listeners are aware of all of these dynamics, but obviously China and Russia, particularly since I'd say the mid 2000s, and especially since the Crimean crisis in 2014, have been kind of converging somewhat in terms of their strategic interests and their relationship has been getting, getting stronger. And that's all culminated recently. There have been some meetings. I think there was a meeting around the Winter Olympics in Beijing that, that happened just before the invasion, where they declared their relationship to be rock solid, that there were no limits on this relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. And that is obviously now that Russia has invaded Ukraine, that is posing a few challenges, I would say, rhetorically for China. Um, and this is partly because China, in its own kind of identity on the world stage and diplomatically, China has really been committed to projecting an image of itself as a non-interventionist power, right? China wants to uphold, to, to take the moral high ground, especially vis-a-vis -vis America, and especially in the wake of the disastrous interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, those, those nasty NATO wars um, that I thought we'd seen the back of. But so it, it's very important for China to kind of have that moral high ground. At the same time, China has refused to actually outright condemn Russia for, for invading Ukraine. And domestically in Chinese media, um, the Chinese media are not describing this as a war of aggression. They are using Moscow's language, which is that this is a military operation. Maybe it's a conflict, but it's not a war of aggression. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's walking this fine line. There are some, some rumors that have, that have kind of come out of some leaks in the European Union that Russia has asked China uh, for military aid. The Chinese ambassador has denied this, has called it mis uh, disinformation. I would be inclined to believe him on that because at this stage, there's very little. Uh, I can't imagine that Russia would actually need China's military aid at this point. Um, so, yeah, those are the basic dynamics, but kind of underlying those dynamics, there's a very interesting history of a sort of a nationalism in both countries, in both Russia and China, that is shaped by a narrative of historical grievance. Right. Um, and in China, that is extremely uh, important to the, the Communist Party's kind of um, maintenance of, of power, I would say. You know, there's this sense in which China endured a century of humiliation at the hands of the West. Um, and this is all kind of beginning with the opium wars when the West opened up China by force uh, to free trade. So it opened its markets coercively. Um, and, you know, similarly in Russia, I think we've seen in Vladimir Putin's that grievance speech he gave right at the beginning of the invasion, the one that was it was so you could see it was very sincere. I mean, it was scary. It was very bitter. But I think. That historical grievance, um, similarly potent, but it's much later in provenance. So it's it's thinking about the collapse of the Soviet Union, the expansion of NATO and all those themes that we're very familiar with. But it was just interesting for me because I, I recognized a very similar tone to the way that China, Beijing talks about, for example, Taiwan or Xinjiang or Tibet. Um, there is this this commitment to territorial integrity and sovereignty that is connected to the, the anxiety of um, 
thinking about what happened in the 19th century when China says it was cut up like a melon by the imperialist powers. Incidentally, Russia was among those powers back in the 19th century, but no longer. The world has moved on. Um, and so, yeah, those are those are the sort of basic contours that I see. Right. I this is, I'm just kind of curious. So uh, we were taught that Dick Morris, the toe sucker, taught Bill Clinton had to triangulate to turn uh, the Democrats against the Republicans so Bill Clinton could get uh, reelected. And we were taught that he learned that from Henry Kissinger, who triangulated uh, Russia, America, and China, that the trip to China that Nixon took was really a poke in the eye to Russia to stir up trouble between Russia and China. Is that true? Did, did we create tensions between Russia and China? Have there been military tensions? Have there been little battles in the 20th century, border skirmishes between Russia and China that we exacerbate? I mean, there, there was the, the Sino-Soviet split that occurred in the late 1950s, early 1960s that was, that was quite serious. But I think when you mention Kissinger and that sort of triangulation idea, I think that is actually still very relevant. And I, I believe that from the perspective of somebody like Kissinger, the current conflict is really interesting because actually I think Kissinger would say China and the US need to be closer, that, that he would probably advocate for, I'm not sure if he would advocate this, but perhaps he would advocate for more kind of conciliation of China by the US precisely because of this threat from a unified Russia and China. You know, that's, that is a really serious proposition for US hegemony. Um, and I feel like Kissinger has the long view of that, you know, for all of his, his kind of, um, for all of the things that he has wrought in the world, which I would certainly never defend. What does China have in Ukraine? What does Russia have in Ukraine? What does America have in Ukraine? What what do we want from Ukraine? Oof. What's that, there? I wouldn't say that China wants anything from Ukraine specifically. I'd say that what China wants is to kind of uphold its own interests geopolitically, which, like I said at the beginning, it's it's more a question of China's sort of somewhat antagonistic relationship towards the unipolar, the kind of American-led world order. I wouldn't say there are kind of concrete, uh, you know, resources, although I'm not familiar with those aspects of Ukraine. Um, I think in terms of what the US wants, uh, I would say the US wants to basically not be a declining power in the world. And interestingly, I think, and I'm certainly not the first person to say this, I think Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine is actually only gonna strengthen the forces that he feels threatened by. You know, the West is gonna be more unified than ever. NATO is gonna be strengthened by all of this. And I think that is what the US wants. And I think the US has a strategic interest in arming the Ukrainians, in ensuring that this conflict does play out um, and not, and that it doesn't get resolved quickly, uh, diplomatically, you know, with an agreement. And I think, by the way, that Taiwan needs to be considered in all of this. I think China, yes. I think too much has been made of the parallel between Ukraine and Taiwan. Ukraine is not Taiwan. Taiwan is not Ukraine. There are so many differences in, you know, their economies, the, the nature of their states, the maturity of their states. Um, but I do think that it's it's sort of the elephant in the room. And, and China obviously um, has a huge interest in Taiwan not declaring independence. Um, but I think for what it's worth, the U.S. actually has more of an interest in Taiwan than it does in Ukraine. 
And I think if China were to ever invade Taiwan, the US would do more than it's doing right now with Ukraine. Why? That makes sense. Why? Because Taiwan is way more strategically important to the US than Ukraine is, I believe. Partly because if you look at the Taiwanese economy, it's a mainstay of semiconductor manufacturing. That's one reason. Um, look at its location. It's a very strategically placed island uh, that kind of straddles a lot of shipping routes. Um, it's a kind of connection to Japan as well, if you kind of go further up the chain of islands. There are just lots of reasons why Taiwan is very important to the US and always has been. Um, and there when are like Biden, some very interesting differences too with Ukraine. Yeah. When Biden first took office, Blinken and his uh, and uh, Biden's uh, national security advisor Sack and Jen Psaki were all saying it's only a matter of time before China makes a move on Taiwan. Do you see that happening? Do you see we've been told if you watch certain television networks, they'll say, well, how we respond to Ukraine signals to China how we're going to respond to their invasion uh, of Taiwan. You said the, the response will be different. This Ukraine thing is not a leading indicator of our pivot to the Pacific. No, I don't think it is. Um, but I also don't agree with Blinken. And I, I don't think that, you know, China is imminently going to invade Taiwan. In fact, I think in the past year or so, maybe two years, um, we've actually seen a little bit of a cooling off of the rhetoric coming out of Beijing. So for example, last year, there was a very important meeting of uh, the Chinese Communist Party where they issued their third ever historical resolution. This is basically um, something that happens every few decades in China where the party gets together and it actually talks about its own history. And then it releases a statement saying, well, what's happened in the past 20 years or so is this, this and this. And there's only ever been two before. Um, I think there was one in 1949 and one in 1981. And Interestingly, last year, whereas you might have expected there to be a lot of kind of belligerence towards Taiwan in that statement, um, I've got a quote here. It said that time and momentum are always on our side for the complete reunification of the motherland. And what that suggests to me is that actually China is still content to play the long game when it comes to Taiwan. It's not about to do anything rash plus the fact that the Chinese economy has slowed a little bit. Um, it may slow a little bit more this year, and that's always a huge source of legitimacy for the party, right? In a, in a country where, you know, you don't vote for the government, the state of the economy is a huge, huge issue. I mean, it's a, it's a huge issue for every country, but especially in China, if that begins to slip, I think you'll see that they'll kind of recalibrate the intensity of their rhetoric on Taiwan. And I don't think an invasion is imminent, thankfully. Right. Um, yeah, but I think the US would, uh, I think the US would do more than it's been doing with Ukraine. And that could get obviously really ugly and really scary quite quickly. I was living in San Francisco in 1989. I think it was 1989 when Prince Charles turned over the keys to China, gave Hong Kong, was it, I think it was 89, where he gave Hong Kong to China. 97 was the official handover. Okay. But 89, might, they might have like scheduled it then or, or agreed it then. Maybe he gave them the keys to the storage facility, like you can start putting stuff in the storage <laughs> facility. This is just an excuse for you to mention the monarchy. I that, see that. That's right. That's right. So... There was, there was a flood of uh, people leaving Hong Kong, coming to America, fearing uh, communism. Many stayed behind. Hong Kong flourished. We were convinced that it was a country all to its own, that China would never mess with Hong Kong because 
its economy, I think, was bigger than all of China's. Mm. I think that was, and, and for them to to change it would be would blow up in their face. Mm. Have the fears of the people who left Hong Kong come to fruition? Were they right for leaving Hong Kong? In your estimation, has it become dangerous for the capitalists left behind? Ha, huh, that's two different questions. I think it has not become dangerous for the capitalists left behind. But I'm not going to say whether some whether they were right or wrong to leave, but I think Hong Kong has been transformed in the past three years. And this is one of the major kind of like, it's something that partly because of COVID, we haven't really kept our eye on, I think. But Hong Kong is a completely different place. The, um, completely the umbrella revolution? Is that what they... Right. Well, that happened back in, in 2014, the umbrella movement. That was a kind of student uprising. People are going to tell me that it was actually an NED-funded imperialist, you know... What's NED? Or whatever. National Endowment for Democracy. So there's a right. there's a widespread belief in certain parts of the left that the Hong Kong um, independence movement, which does exist, uh, has been largely manufactured and funded by the US. And I, I don't really want to get into that because it's such a kind of, people get really, really upset. Right. And um, I also sometimes get upset. But in any case, Hong Kong has been transformed by the national security law, which was passed by China a couple of years ago. And I think that, you know, it's interesting, you, you mentioned that people thought China was never going to interfere with Hong Kong. Well, the date that was given for the current kind of status quo to be maintained was until 2047, right? So in 2047, the current status quo, which is referred to as one country with two systems, so Hong Kong and China being one country, but enjoying two systems, so that Hong Kong can have sort of limited democracy, certain kind of free markets, et cetera, that that could be maintained. And one of the kind of distinctive characteristics of Hong Kong, which is a legacy of, of British imperialism, is that it does have this kind of legal culture. And some would say it has pretty had a pretty robust rule of law uh, guaranteed by the courts, independent courts. You know, that stuff is, is disappearing. Um, and the, and yet, David, and yet, I think it is still very much a safe place for capitalists. So, so I asked you a question that belied my brainwashing. You were always told uh, that, that, that capitalism can't exist without democracy. Hmm. We, we always portray the, the communists in, in China and Russia as being against democracy. Could Hong Kong be a, a bastion of capitalism where people don't vote, where people have no say in their destiny? I think some people would argue that China is already that, that mainland China is in fact, in some respects, a bastion of capitalism where people so don't- Capitalism vote. and democracy are not synonymous. Is that what you're talking <laughs> Who <laughs> could believe it? <laughs> I, I'd also I'd also point out that most capitalist countries throughout history haven't been especially democratic, and in a great many cases, not democratic at all. Right. I, I, uh, let I, me bring I, in Professor yeah. Ben Burgess, and hopefully Grace can stick around. I'm going to ask you a question, Grace, that we that I think Professor Ben Burgess would want to answer. Professor Ben Burgess is author of countless books and the host of Give Them an Argument, and his late, how many books? Four, Four. I, I, I could actually count that that much. I, I, I you can't count that, that high. Yeah. See, living down uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line hasn't destroyed your brain <laughs> entirely. That's uh, so, uh, I shouldn't have said that. You have a piece in the Daily Beast, your columnist for Jacobin, but you have a piece in the Daily Beast, another one entitled, I hope I'm pronouncing this properly. Is it Marr? Bill Marr? Is that the man's name? Bill Marr didn't change. He's always been a cringe centrist, intellectually incorrect. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I will. I will. I will point out that um, that I think anybody who's ever read anything I've read knows I didn't write that headline uh, because. I, I, I have never used the word cringe as an adjective in my life, and I, uh, I don't plan on it, uh, but I do stand by the sentiment. I want to get to that in a second, but let's wrap up this conversation that we're having with Grace about capitalism, democracy, and empire. I keep hearing that America is terrified that we're losing our grip on the world, but... I don't feel like we're an empire. I don't feel like I'm the beneficiary of an empire. I, I don't have, you know, cart carts of gold landing in my feet. The, the price of nutmeg hasn't gone down. So what does it mean? You're you're living in Great Britain, Grace. Did you know that? You live in Great Britain? No, haven't the foggiest. I'm good at geography. So is empire a, a, psych, a psychological State thing? State of mind, yes. State of mind. <laughs> well, look, I think empire, that, that's not how empires work. Empires don't create wealth for the David Feldmans and the Grace Jacksons of this world, especially when they're run by oligarchs. Um, so I think that's all by design, feature not bug. Um, but if you want to talk about declining powers, yes, I am currently living in the bosom of, I would say, the world's most advanced and rapidly declining power. So I can really speak from my, ex my lived experience in that regard. And yet it houses all the oligarchs, all the Russian oligarchs come to London. So the money... The, the, the money, Great Britain has retained all the money that comes with empire, but they don't need any more, they don't need as big a navy to enforce the empire. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think... Pretty smart, if you ask me. Really? Well, Seems, I mean, I, 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 put, I put out that if you, you know... I mean, at the height of the British Empire, when they did have the big navy, I mean, read some Charles Dickens novels. It didn't particularly benefit uh, most ordinary people. Or, you know, at the at the height of the Roman Empire, most people in Rome lived on some pretty meager daily bread rations. You know, that's uh, right. you know, it's it's not. I I just just to underline and circle Grace's point about how that's not typically how empires work. But it seems to me the British have figured something out. Instead of looting a country of its rubber just loot it of its cash reserves, just take their money, mine, mine their money, mine their generals and their, their leaders. Yeah, well, I, I think like, just to, just to give credit to the chat here, and I have become distracted by the chat in the past few minutes, but- Never happened before. As, um, <laughs> as Lane points out, the city of London is not Great Britain. Uh, the city of London is the city of London and it is the financial capital of the world still. And it's where all of that, it's ground zero for kind of all the privatization, the financialization right. of the economy that we saw under Reagan and Thatcher. And I think you, what you see now is this kind of encrustation of, of empire where we do have this outsized financial role. Um, but truly, David, I mean, I want to emphasize the most people in the UK right now are suffering with the biggest cost of living crisis in a generation. It's the um, Democrats in this country. It's It was the stimulus bill giving $300 a month to kids here in America. It caused inflation all over the world. Uh, yeah, we well, have, Professor, let me... Let me uh, I, we love having you on the show. We we love having Ben Burgess on the show. And uh, I want to thank Lane, who sent me some reading material and a documentary about the, London's financial capital and how they kind of invented uh, offshore accounts hiding. My, uh, for another discussion, Professor Ben Burgess has a piece about Bill Maher. You say he didn't change. 
He's always been part of the intellectual dark web and his vax skepticism should come as no surprise. Yeah. I mean, How much are you watching of him? Why are you watching him? <laughs> well, I actually hadn't watched much of him in a long time. I will, I will admit to my great shame. I, uh, I, I used to watch him very regularly. Um, and for a long time, actually, like I, I would catch politically incorrect every now and again on ABC, you know, when, uh, uh, in the final years of that show, uh, and and I was I was a pretty I was a pretty regular uh, I was a pretty regular real time viewer for for a long time. Um, you know the opening monologues were god awful, but the uh, but you know but but I do think the new rules you know some of the new rules that you wrote were funny. But um, in any case, I I, I do uh, I was asked if I wanted to write something about Bill Maher for for the Daily Beast, and with particularly with the idea being that he seems to have taken uh, what some people have called a sort of pivot, you know, to uh, the IDW, uh, you know, lately. So in other Internet, words, the inter international dark web. Yeah, intellectual dark web. Yeah, like so. So intellectual dark. Web. Yeah, Ben Shapiro, Sam Harris, Brett Weinstein, people like that. Uh, and where people are getting this idea is that, uh, you know, he started like very regularly having conversations with these people and and there seems to be a lot more agreement the debate in those conversations and he has um and and he's he's taken to spending a lot of time complaining about wokeness which is seems to be defined in a very capacious way and and of course you know and of course he's said a lot of stupid shit about COVID. so uh you know which you know, I, I don't think is a, you know, I don't think is a death penalty offense or whatever many people have, but I, I do think is a, uh, you know, is, is part of what sort of gave some people this impression that he had, uh, that he had changed. And so I said, yeah, sure, I'll write that article. But I mean, if I do, my thesis is going to be that uh, he hasn't actually changed because uh, I was watching this guy 20 years ago. And I can tell you for damn sure that the stuff that he thinks now is what he thought then. Uh, and the fact that he was a bit of an icon of the liberal wing of the culture war uh, in the Bush era and even the Obama era uh, doesn't really mean that he's changed now. Uh, it, it, what it does is it tells you a lot about Bush and Obama era liberalism, that, that, that right. somebody, you know, that somebody with all of his views, because look, I mean, start with the anti-vax part. That's the easiest. In some ways, it's the least, um, I mean, it's obviously extremely important in terms of, you know, like getting everybody vaccinated is important, but in terms of his overall worldview, you know, that might be the less, uh, the less important part, but, uh, but it's also the most straightforward part of I mean, it. You know, you can go back and watch the stuff that he was saying about avian flu in 2005 or, you know, swine flu, you know, a few years later. Um, and, and it was actually worse in some ways than, than what he said now. I mean, now there are actually a few more caveats when he talks about it, but, but then uh, he would, he would just say like, um, you know, he would, he would, oh, I would never get a vaccine. I would, I, would, I would never get any vaccine. I think he actually said at one point, you know, that the, I don't trust the government, you know, with my, my health and uh, in any way, you know, Western medicine is bad because, you know, you should think about, you know, because we should think about health in this different way. And it's not the, it's the, it's the body and not the, not the invaders to the body that you should be focused on and all this kind of woo stuff. And that's that's kind of what he's always thought, right? I mean, the stuff that he'll say about COVID when he's talking to Ben Shapiro now is exactly what he's always said. I mean, it's it's always been a little unclear, frankly, whether he even believed in the germ theory of disease. Uh, and I mean, like literally unclear whether he believed in that. Uh, and and certainly in a more general way, like, yeah, I, I think that he's somebody who um, again, his his the sort of set of political opinions that he has now. I think we're very much what he had, you know, during the the Bush and and Obama eras. You know, it's it's you know that he has, in terms of partisan red versus blue politics, I'll pretty much side with Democrats. But you know, as as far as, you know, but as as but he's also always been an Islamophobic warmonger, uh, and um, and he has, you know, and 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 I think he does have some some pretty reactionary attitudes. It's just that back in the late two thousands, if you basically supported you know same-sex marriage equality and legalized weed and you know you talked a lot about atheism that was a that was kind of enough because that's that's right. what the that's what the shape of the discourse was like in the late 2000s 
So Bill Maher, I've always figured to be a libertarian. Mm -hmm. And so he could be perceived as a lefty, as you point out, because he believed in pot, strippers, mm -hmm. hated religion, you know, separation of church and state, pro-abortion, anti-war, although he did say Vietnam yeah, what, no, he wasn't really, he was never very libertarian on foreign policy, but on, on, well, on domestic but policy. I was there when the war, when we invaded, and he was against it. We invaded Iraq. Yeah, and he yeah, was against yeah, that invasion. Yeah, he, was, he was certainly for the invasion of Afghanistan. And, and I will say, I do remember watching real time, like just as the war was started, you know, which is also right. when real, real time was started. And, uh, and and he was, you know, uh, he was against it, but it was also he was also pretty ambivalent about it. I mean, they have a, you know, he would he would make comments like, you know, well, for every reason I see for it, I see a reason against it. But you know, it's mm -hmm. sixty forty. I mean, he did say things like this. Yeah, but what, 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 I, it it was a it was an exciting place to work, and you know, he was the only voice out there. Who was challenging the war in 2003 so by may and that was dangerous i mean there you know look what happened to scott ritter it's dangerous to challenge these people so yeah I, that, I mean if you want if you want to give them credit for for opposing the war i mean i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fight you on that i mean i think i think you could say despite the fact that it was not exactly a full-throated Thing, you know, he did still come down on the, on the side of don't do it, right? He was enthusiastically for invading Afghanistan. Uh, and, uh, and when the, the drone war started, he was all for that. But they have a, but in between, he was critical of the war in Iraq. And again, if the question is just sort of the, you know, is Bill Maher going to have a question? You want to give him some points for that? I have no objection to that. But if it's, but if we're trying to figure out his sort of overall view of politics, I would point out that even when he was critical of the war in Iraq, he was critical of it the way uh, that, um, you know, in much the way that like Barack Obama was, right? Like, like, like if you like go back and look at Obama's uh, anti-war speech in Illinois in you know, 2002, what did he say, right? He said, well, I think this is a dumb war because we're taking our eye off the ball of Afghanistan right. and getting right. distracted by Iraq. And that was very much the kind of critique that Bill Maher had of invading Iraq. Right. Now, in his defense, because I go after him all the time on this show, yeah. uh, in his defense, he was fighting the canard that he hated the troops. He had made a statement. Uh, he got fired mm -hmm. for saying that the people who fly jet planes into buildings are not cowards. People who press buttons 3,000 miles away and fire a drone on innocent civilians, that's... Yeah, cat. cruise 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 missiles. Yeah, that that's. Uh, but yeah, that's that's right. Like he. he no, did, hang on for one second. Hang on for one second. Uh -huh. He spoke the truth about America and how we fight our wars, and he he became the scapegoat for nine eleven. He really did. That everybody looked for somebody to blame for nine eleven. He became that guy. I don't know how he survived it. And he was speaking the truth, essentially. Mm -hmm. He paid a huge price and HBO, to its credit, mm -hmm. gave him a job. He was unhirable because, because he spoke the truth. He learned the lay of the land in corporate media, which is there's an Overton window. Mm -hmm. You can say this, but you better not be say anything bad about our soldiers or our troops you cannot be perceived as being unpatriotic even though the most patriotic thing to do is to keep our troops out of harm's way so he had a thread that needle and i thought he did an amazing job mm -hmm. during the the second iraq war i thought he was masterful but he got rich doing it mm -hmm. he got paid too much and he never was a leftist he never worried about class struggle and believed that people should just work harder mm -hmm. and so he got he became irrelevant 
as the conversation switched to class struggle, which was always going on, but not the way it is now. So he's now become irrelevant because he, I would even accept his anti-vax nonsense if he was a full-throated endorsement of Medicare for all and destroying big pharma, but it isn't. Yeah. I mean, I think that he, um, so I guess the first thing I'd say is on that, you know, on the way that politically incorrect ended, which I talk about in the piece, um, I call it his moment of moral lucidity uh, about, um, uh, you know, about cowardice and cruise missiles and all of that. Uh, like I liked the comment a lot. I was actually watching the night when he said it, I couldn't believe he said it. I thought it was great. Uh, and, um, and, and I did, you know, and, I, and he got a lot of points from me for that for a long time. Now I would point out though, a couple of things about that. One is that it is somewhat of an outlier in terms of his overall commentary. Uh, in the late 90s, as I think you alluded to earlier, you can see him on Politically Incorrect uh, defending the war in Vietnam, saying, saying that it was a, a just and necessary war. It was the right war for the wrong reason. No, it was the wrong war for the right reasons. Well, what he said was, um, was actually, you know, look, I mean, he says, for example, I remember, I, I linked to a clip of him saying something like this in the article. I also remember reading his book, uh, When You Ride Alone, When You Ride with Bin Laden, which was this sort of um, somewhat tongue in cheek uh, kind of, you know, pastiche of World War II propaganda, but also kind of serious for like what he thought, you know, in, in like all of his post 9 11 opinions. Which, which I did I did read when it first came out. Also, I'm, I'm embarrassing myself with a lot of these details. Uh, but, um, but in there, right, he says, look, you know, people tend to believe that, you know, Vietnam was an unjust and unwinnable war. I'm not one of them. In the clip, he says, what he says is, it didn't have to happen in Vietnam, but it had to happen uh, somewhere because we had to show the communists that we could stand up to the bullies and et cetera, right? I mean, that was his line about Vietnam. Uh, he was all for the invasion of, of Afghanistan. And most importantly, I think when you, when you think about his position on, on Iraq, uh, you know, not long afterwards, right? And it is, it is very telling, by the way, that, you know, very, you know, I mean, look, by the time, the, uh, by the time uh, Politically Incorrect, which was, I think, a very, you know, ironically named show, right? Because it suggested that he would constantly be saying things that would scandalize people and, and in reality... Right. Uh, he, um, the first time he said something that actually scandalized people, you know, he lost his show, but, um, but even by the time politically incorrect was over, right. He was a strong supporter of the, uh, the war in Afghanistan. And, and even if you look, I, I linked to it in the piece at his, uh, remarks that he made clarifying later, what he said when he was agreeing, by the way, with Dinesh D'Souza, who's the guest, uh, who'd said the thing about cowardice. And he enthusiastically agreed with him and said the thing about cruise missiles. And then in the statement he gave clarifying later, he said that, you know, again, I like the statement itself. I liked that. I still like it. But uh, his, his parsing of it was uh, his objection to, to this, right, was his objection to lobbing cruise missiles from 2,000 miles away was that it showed the, uh, the, you know, the squeamishness, the cowardice of politicians being unwilling to commit boots to the ground to like really get the job done, right? You know, that's his objection to lobbing cruise missiles from a thousand miles away. And in fact, um, even though, again, he thought like Obama did that, you know, that, that Iraq was a dumb war, right? That, that it was, that, that it was a, a tactical misstep, you know, to, uh, to fight this particular battle, uh, you know, the larger global war as he saw it within which it was being fought you know the the global war on terror he was all in on and very much framed as a clash of civilizations you know between between the west and and these desert people with their fundamentalist religion you know bringing their you know you know bringing their 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 nonsense and you know and their threats you know to uh to western civilization which he talks about many times right about how you know he's worried about you know that uh, that was it the most popular name for baby boys in London was Mohammed or whatever it is? Like there's, there's a like- know, He's not, I, I, we have to wrap it up. Uh, I had another question. Bill Maher is irrelevant. I used to love him. Uh, he's a, a bigot now. The stuff he says about Islam is pure, unadulterated bigotry. And 
I'm surprised anybody would still work for him. Uh, I know people need money, but what he says about Islam, uh, if it were said about the Jews, uh, he'd be off the air. Uh, but yeah, I, I, guess, I, I, I mean that could be right. Like, and, and again, no, that would, that's correct. He would no, be, if he no, said it about the sure. evangelicals, if he said it about the evangelicals. Well, to be fair, uh, he has he has said a lot of things about evangelicals. But look, I, I, I think that, um, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think some of those comments have been despicable. But I'm not even like my primary interest in all this is not um, everybody should agree that Bill Maher is a bad person and shun him or whatever, you know, that they have a, uh, I'm not super interested in that. I mean, I, I, I do, I do think some of the things he says are dumb and he shouldn't say them, but I think that the, but I'm not particularly interested in that. What I am interested in though, is like maybe understanding a little bit, like, you know, using the kind of prism of Bill Maher to understand the trajectory of, of American progressive politics from the 2000s to, uh, to now. And yeah, I do think the fact that now he does feel like a bit of a relic is actually a, a good sign. I mean, like I, I mean, I mean, I am agreed with one thing you said earlier about uh, class struggle that I think that to the that because um, because of the way that things have shifted, right? His recent conversation with Ben Shapiro, one of his objections to you know the what he sees as the woke kids because he's like conflating a lot of different issues there. Uh, is uh, is that they hate capitalism, and uh, and and I and I think that that's I think the fact that 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 like there is, you know that uh, that there is that more economically egalitarian current, you know that that has like a little bit more of a presence in um, in American progressive politics now. I I think and the you know which is part of one of the elements of along with a lot of other things why Mar feels like a bit of a relic now. Like, I, I actually think it's a sign that some things might have actually changed for the better. Right. Stick around. I want to bring in Emil, and then I want to ask you one more question. The thing about sure. uh, Bill Maher is he's not a reader. He doesn't read. He hires people who read, but he doesn't now listen to them. You, you can tell that his readers are not being heard. So... The man is not an intellectual. He's shallow. He learned some things 40 years ago. He read three books, and that shaped his worldview forever. He's become very shallow, and he's a reactionary and not informed. He is not. Bill Maher does not read books. Only three books, David? Yeah, I think the fourth was Good Night Moon, I think. Yeah. And he needs writers and he should listen to his writers. But that's a whole other story. Uh, Emil Guillermo joins us. He's the host of the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. He's also a columnist for ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Before I say goodbye to Professor Ben Burgess, columnist for Jacobin. He has a piece in the Daily Beast this week about Bill Maher. I watched, give, give them an argument. I've been watching your show because you treat debates as sporting events, and it's really smart and it's fun to watch. I watched you cover a debate between Destiny. Oh, God. Yeah, I don't well, know what you're talking about. Hang on. It was between Destiny and Jackson Hinkle. Uh, Destiny's partner, I believe, is from, was from the Gravel Institute, who I thought was absolute. I thought Destiny, I'm going to get, I know, I know some of my, Destiny was brilliant, and the guy from the Gravel Institute was brilliant. Uh, Jackson Hinkle is a whole source. I mean, that's like, I don't even want to go there. And then this guy with an accent, who who was the? Uh, yeah. So uh, well, hang on. Let me just say. And they were debating, uh, basically, uh, who who's right and who's wrong, Putin or Zelensky. That's basically. And That's I was like, now, wait a second, wait a second. There are people who think Zelensky and Ukraine 
are to blame for the invasion and that there are Nazis in Ukraine. I thought Destiny did an amazing job disarming. I, I, I mean, there are Nazis in Ukraine, but I, I also think that the fact, like, it's, um, you know, the, the idea that you can kind of decide whether an invasion is justified by counting the number of Nazis in each of the two countries, you know, which, which is pretty is much it, where Is we're... it my imagination or the people who say there are Nazis in Ukraine tend to be on the side of Nazis? I mean, again, it, I think it depends a little bit on whether, whether they're just saying there are Nazis in Ukraine, right? You know, which, which I mean, just say that there are like far right militias that have played some role in the civil war in you know, Ukraine. Have you found any is, evidence? Is, 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 is true, but that's such a far cry from. Have you found any that, evidence, yeah. any evidence other than articles written in 2015 and 2016 about the Azov Battalion and C 14? I keep finding articles from 2015, nothing after 2016 about the Nazi problem in Ukraine. Have you found more recent documentation? Yeah, I, I mean, I've certainly, I've certainly read more recent articles about it, but I, I have a, but I, I think the basic- link, But they link to the original source material is 2016. Okay, okay, that I that I could not tell you, but what I would say is this, like my, you know, my impression of things at least for whatever it's worth, right? Um, and that debate you're talking about with uh with with Destiny and I don't think it has anything to do with Gravel, but Dylan Burns is the guy you're talking about and um, with them and um, and uh Jackson Hinkle and this guy uh Haas uh who goes by infrared and infrared and is as as sometimes uh there you know people have a lot of uh i think people are very amused by him and have a lot of nicknames like the kremlin gremlin you know to uh, to describe him but i i have but that guy right like look usually when i do a debate you know when i like do a break out of a debate it's because i think it's going to be like interesting or informative or etc cetera, etc cetera. this one i will say was just shamelessly because i thought it would be entertaining and strange yeah uh, and um and it was and also i was just kind of fascinated to see what somebody would say right because like there are so many things look i mean people will say you know i'm a Putin apologist because like i don't think we should start world war three or whatever but like right. i take it for granted that of course the invasion is unjustified. I, I don't even I don't even see how you could really dispute that. So I was um, so I was just fascinated to see what they're going to come up with, you know. And, and and that's as much as anything why we watch that. Yeah, I'm being rude to Emil, but but I, but, I, but I, 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 I was just going to say right yeah. on the Nazi issue, right? My my impression is like, are there you know Azov Battalion, a couple others, but like that, that's the big one, right? Are there uh, are there far right militias in Ukraine, and is that a problem? I think yes and yes. Does that actually have a goddamn thing to do with why <laughs> with why Russia invaded the country? Uh, is uh, is is the is is Ukraine like run by Nazis, despite its Jewish president and prime minister? I uh, clearly not. Right? Is is the uh, um, in fact, they're not, even though they have militias, they could do, and, you know, I don't think, I think it's a concern that they're, you know, like, I, I think there's a real thing there, but also they have, like, very little electoral presence, like, nobody votes for them for, right. uh, for you know, for the parliament, and also, like, Russia has been willing to work with far-right militias, too. I mean, I think the whole issue is kind of nonsense, and um, and so I wanted to see, like, what they could come up with, and, and what I found was, like, mostly screaming, so uh, that right. that's, if, if you, if you, if anybody wants to watch that debate breakdown, I will just say full disclosure: uh, you you will you won't learn that much, but you know, but it is an entertaining thing to watch. Well, I was we have to wrap up. Who is Destiny's debating partner? Dylan Birds. I I, I found Destiny and it was Dylan who? Dylan Burns. From the Gravel Institute, right? I, again, I don't think he has anything to do with the Gravel Institute. I think he might just kind of look like one of those guys, but they, uh, but, um, I mean, but they, they, I thought they are absolutely brilliant. I yeah, thought I, mean, I, I have, I have very mixed feelings about, uh, about Destiny we could get into sometime, but he was certainly on the right side of that, uh, yeah. of, of that debate. Okay. Professor Ben Burgess is the host of Give Them an Argument. Go watch and listen to his show. It's fantastic. Read him over at the Daily Beast. 
and uh, and of course Jacobin, where he writes regularly. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you for coming. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Let's go to uh, California. Sorry to keep you waiting. No, no problem, Dave. No problem. We're uh, we had a guest drop out, and everything got reconnoitered. Email. Yeah, I'm just glad to be here. I'm you know, nice just, just me and my gong listening to uh, the professor listening to, you know, I, I, I wear these uh, this my my John Madden Memorial headset because it's like I life is play by play. And I and you came here uh, by bus. Pardon me. And you came you arrived by bus. You never flew. Yeah, that's right. You know, I met him at a bus station. You yes. know, I, uh, like you a lot of people at, you've met a lot of people at bus stations let's not go there Emil. Uh, let's talk <laughs> about uh Kintanji I'm mispronouncing her name Brown Kintanji, Kintanji Brown Jackson not to be confused with Kintanji Jackson Brown which is the reggae version of uh the guy who sang Dr. My Eyes but uh Kintanji Brown Jack KBJ you might as well just call her KBJ I, I, cause I think she's going to get in after what that woman went through the last, the last, uh, well today, the fourth day, the hearings or Thursday hearing was really just, uh, you know, uh, people talking about her, but day one, which I call the, the purple day. Cause that's what she was wearing. It was all like praise and her friends were there. Day two was the red day. She was wearing a red blazer and she was bloodied by people like Lindsey Graham and Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz. And then the blue day, that's where the bruises set in. That's where Ted Cruz went after her again for all these specious reasons. I mean, the child pornography idea, it was pornographic what they did to Katanji Brown Jackson. I have a clip. Let's watch a clip. Yeah. We'll play a clip of Ted Cruz. And as they say, you'll comment on the other side. Doesn't that oh, sound? Yeah, that, yeah, that's yes. on the other side. Yes. By that, I mean, you're going to be dead yeah. <laughs> and we'll be communicating through a Ouija board. Yeah. I'll get your comment on the other side. Yes, I'll have my I have my medium talk to your medium. images. You come in with 57 Time months. Is Why Senator did you two minutes them over just 57 of months in the Stewart case? Do you want to address that? Because you're claiming it's cherry picking. In fact, you're welcome to explain any of these cases, but let's take the Stewart case. Why Coons, did you sentence him for half the amount? You're not recognized, Senator. Senator if you, Coons. you don't want her to answer that question? You wouldn't allow her in. Mr. Chairman, she may answer the question. I've asked her why she sentenced Stewart. You've gone over the time, Senator, by two minutes. Why she? Because you've interrupted me for two minutes, Mr. Chairman. Will you allow her to answer the question, or do you not want the American people to hear <laughs> why, with someone she described as well, an egregious? Well, there comes a point, Senator, where you get a little bit. Chairman Durbin, hand. will you allow her to answer the question? You won't allow her to answer. I, I, I will happily allow her to. The question is Senator, why you thank you, Senator Stewart, an egregious child pornography possessor. So, to, to half of the amount Please, sir. requested by the prosecutor. Please, Senator. Will you allow her to a answer the question, Chairman Durbin? Senator Coons. Well, why are you not allowing her to answer the question? There's You're not another the senator here that you've not allowed her to answer the question. You're I'm not asking another question, but allow her to answer the question, Chairman Durbin. Thank you, well, Chairman. Why Durbin. do you not want the American people to know what happened in the Stewart case or any of these cases? Chairman Durbin, I've never seen the chairman refuse to allow a witness to answer a question. You can bang it as loud as you want. Well, I can just tell you, at some point, you have to follow the rules. Okay. Will you let her answer the question? You've you've been interrupting. Me? And by the way, with Senator Graham, it went ten minutes over. You've sure taken did. a big chunk of the time. Will you allow her to answer a question? You've given her. Why no are you afraid of her? Answer. She's welcome to answer it right now. Will you let her, Senator Coons? Will you let? So no, you don't want her to answer the question, Senator Coons. Will you let her answer Thank the question, Chairman Durbin? Apparently, Judge we're Judge. very afraid of the American people hearing the answer to that question. We here in the Senate, in this committee today, are in the middle of a policy fight. Yeah, we have a, we have a disagreement over what constitutes sanity. Ted Cruz is losing. He almost got arrested in Bozeman, Montana. He missed his flight. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And he got into an argument with airline staff. Uh, and they had to call the cops and he was pretty much doing what he's doing uh, to Dick Durbin. He is 
losing his mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I think this is standard for um, the GOP now. But I, I also think this the hearings served as a kind of audition to see who would be the next Trump. Right. So you had this was a good uh, thing for, for right. Cruz. And Holly, Josh Holly, was also good in terms of how he went after Katanji Brown Jackson and Tom Cotton. Actually, Tom Cotton was like maybe third. I, it's neck and neck for you know who was better in being egregiously uh, uh, rude and uh, intellectually dishonest uh, between Holly and Cruz. But Cotton, Cotton was 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 down there. He was third. So I. I I was just wondering why we even bothered to have these things. They're, they're just, this is a way that, that the Republicans or people who want a, I guess a Ben Sass, who's also a Republican, he had a word for it yesterday. He called it jackassery. And, you know, when you want to run for president and, you know, everyone who wanted to be president, Lindsey Graham, he had his right. moment. Right. Sass said it should no longer be televised. Right. Well, he said cameras in the courtroom. He was talking about cameras in the courtroom specifically, but uh, it, because people act differently when there's cameras. And I guess you could, you know, make the leap to say, yeah, even cameras in the hearing. Too much sass. There's too much sass. Going on. There's too much playing to the camera. And so, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of exchanges. Though. That, that's why when you were saying debate is entertainment, you know, you watch it for the car crash. But the moments, the real moments where you that you should watch are moments where Dick Durbin asked her to explain her methodology, which she said at the beginning of the hearing and then repeated it. You know, she's impartial. She looks at the facts. She consults the constitution. She writes an extremely long, long opinion because she believes in transparency. She has, um, she has the equanimity of the kind of judge you want. Not one that's not biased, who will give a fair rendering of, uh, you know, a fair verdict uh, based on the facts. I just think that uh, what it, this proves is, you know, Cruz, if you didn't think it before, Cruz is a nutcase. But I like the, 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 the exchange where they're talking about Harvard and gender and race between Cruz and Katanji Brown Jackson, because Cruz is, you know, he is like a year before uh, Katanji Jackson, uh, Brown Jackson in uh, at Harvard Law School. They were there at the same time. But he says, uh, the, our, let's talk about our alma mater and the the affirmative action case that if Katanji Brown Jackson is on the Supreme Court, may or may not be, you know, a party to when she when it comes before the Supreme Court later this year, because uh, she might recuse herself. So he was asking these questions. He was asking questions about standing. And he talked, he said that the if I have an injury, can I sue based on, you know, the injury I have for, you know, affirmative action programs? And I think what, the, what I got from that exchange is that he, who is injured, right? The Asian Americans are claiming injury and they're suing. I, I don't agree with the Asian Americans in that case, but the, the idea is who is injured. And I think Cruz was making a claim for a post-white supremacy world where who will be able to sue for discrimination and it's going to be based on who can declare themselves as an injured party and you have heard people say oh look here's katanji brown jackson you know what's her lsat score she's only there because of affirmative action and they, and they say things and then they go further to say and what's what about those poor qualified white males mm -hmm. and that's what the, the exchange between Cruz and Katanji Brown Jackson about the Harvard affirmative action case. That's what I got out of it, that he is painting the picture for we're going to be in this, you know, when Obama was president, we had a post racial world. We're going to have a post white supremacy world where this will be the way that white men will be able to sue. They can claim they're injured and they'll sue on you know the basis of discrimination. And we're going to see these cases and Ted Cruz, he's going to be the guy who, you know, began this post white supremacy world. And if you go to that little bite where they talk about, you know, Harvard and race, 
he, he does this ridiculous thing about being a woman. If I declare I am a woman and he goes into this thing about, you know, you mean, Judge uh, Jackson, you can't say who is a woman. And he's trying to bring up this idea that there will be people suing on gender discrimination. And there's a difference between race discrimination and gender discrimination. The bar is slightly lower on gender discrimination, higher, you know, strict scrutiny for, for race, lower on gender. But, I, you know, I was surprised that that clip of Ted Cruz saying he was a pretend I'm a woman. Or pretend I'm an Asian man. I want to sue on, you know, be, I want to screw, I want to sue Harvard for discrimination. That clip was viewed three million times uh, apparently on on social media this morning. So, you know, so affirmative. So it's interesting. Let me play you a clip from Lindsey Graham. Yeah, who is against affirmative action? Yeah, wants colorblind admissions, not just to universities but to the Supreme Court. But when it comes to his own picks for the Supreme Court, there was a judge he wanted to sit right. on the Supreme Court because she came from South Carolina. So he was upset that she didn't get picked. And here he spells out his grievances, which are uh, reek of affirmative action. Let me play. Uh, Lindsey Graham. So what happened with Janice Rogers Graham? In 2003, she was an African-American nominee for the DC, DC District Court, uh, 54 years old, a little bit older than you, but pretty close. She was a daughter and granddaughter of sharecroppers, a childhood in Alabama under Jim Crow. She was a uh, single mother, a member of the California Supreme Court, instead of celebrating how far we've come, my Democratic colleagues filibustered her ascension to the D.C. Circuit Court, because it's well known on our side that we were very much considering her to be the first African-American woman on the Supreme Court. So what happened with Janice Rogers Graham? In 2003, she is an African-American nominee for the D.C. District Court, uh, 54 years old, a little bit older than you, but pretty close. All right. So, yeah, she, she Janice Rogers Clark was up for the circuit court and she was from California where she was on the Supreme Court of the state. And I, I just think that when I, I heard that and I was. You know, I was. On the one hand, he has a point about what happens to people. He was trying to make a case that if you are on the right side of where the politics is, you know, the, the, the left has their people like here's here's Ketanji Brown Jackson and the right has their black, their token. And yet I I, I think that 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 was also 2003. That was also 19. What do the math? 19 years ago. And the world was different. The world was slightly more racist. And I think the world is less so. And the, the door is slightly more open. I don't know why didn't, here's what I'd say to Lindsey Graham. You're talking about a case in 2003. Why not instead of Amy Coney Barrett, why wasn't there a black woman put up before the Supreme Court? Why not instead of Gorsuch? Why didn't the Republicans put up a black male or a black woman? Was was Clarence Thomas enough? You know, why if, uh, you know, instead of Brett Kavanaugh, why didn't they have a black woman who was a conservative, a black, you know, uh, you know, right winger? Right. So, I mean, that's, that's really the answer. I mean, but consider this. The Janice Rogers Clark thing was 2003. The door is wide open, more open now. I just think I saw Katanji Brown Jackson. I saw me. I, I, I saw I, I sent Cory Booker. What a what a great. He's the kind of guy who knows how to use these hearings because he didn't go after her. He, he saw how badly bruised she was getting, but she stood up to it. She, she stood up to the attacks, but he gave her a respite. Because he took his 20 minutes and he told her, 
what kind of joy she brings to all people of color. And that's the thing about Katanji Brown. If you are a person of color, she is the black indigenous person of color candidate. Because if you see her where she is, you know exactly what she had to go through to get there. And, you know, she talked a lot about I stand on the shoulders. Well, look, as someone who came 15 years before her in whatever I do, but I came 15 years before I went to Harvard when, when her Harvard roommates talked about how, how there, how she was the person who told her African-American female roommates that if you feel like you don't belong, you belong. She was the one who told them, believe in yourself. You belong. That was 15 years after I, can you imagine what it was like when I was there in the seventies? Uh, you know, and she, she was humble yesterday. She said, I know I come at a time when I am the beneficiary of all who've come before me in the civil rights battle. And she know, and that just got me. I mean, there are moments that in that hearing, which were not BS, like the, the Lindsey Graham moments and the Ted Cruz moments, but those moments where it connected with humanity with her parents, with the love of her parents. Booker said something yesterday. He said, you know, your parents, you, you, they lived through a segregated, a legally segregated Florida. And you know what? They still loved America, even if it didn't love you back. Wow. That, that was like, oh, they got my vote. I mean, just start saying KBJ because she's going to be in there. You, you look at the numbers, you, you look at, first of all, you look at her qualifications. She is more qualified than Gorsuch, than Brett Kavanaugh, than Coney Barrett. She, she is as well qualified. And that's because if you're a person of color, you have to be twice or three times as qualified. She proves that old saw. She is yeah. more than qualified. So I, I just. Right, wait, we have three minutes left. You have some late breaking news about Bruno Mars. Ah, you know, I love the New York Times uh, vows. You know, the way they do the weddings instead of mergers and acquisitions. They do stories about weddings. They had a Filipino guy like me um, marrying a Jewish American woman. Uh, reminds me of my first marriage. I hope that his marriage have, is, is long and fruitful and all that. But they were describing the vows. And he said, I started, he said that he uh, repeated Bruno Mars, a lyric from Bruno Mars song, because Bruno Mars is Filipino and Jewish. Now, I knew that Bruno Mars. Wait, 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 wait. Bruno Mars yes. comes from Hawaii. Well, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. He was. His, yes. his last name is Hernandez, as I understand it. Right. And his real name is, I think, Pete. Peter. And you're saying Bruno Mars is Jewish. Yes. All right. Look, now that does people. explain one thing. The yeah. song locked out of heaven. <laughs> that <does explain. laughs> now I know why he wrote that song. Yeah, but, so here, here's the thing, David, uh, his look, I know, I know how this tribalism works because remember I, my first marriage, but uh, his, his mother is a Filipina, not a Jew. So, you know, he's not, you know, not really officially, you know, but, but his father was Jewish apparently. And, and what is my source? Unimpeachably the New York Jewish forward. So look, if it's in the forward, it's gotta be true. Yes. Right. I mean, you know that you're, you're there in uh, New York, you know, Should the Jewish newspaper be called the forward. I mean, in terms of stereotypes, it's like, it's almost like, have you read did you, did you read the New York push? I, I in the pushy. I, I I don't I don't know that about well, that. I, I just, the accusations against Jews is that we're forward. Yeah, I. Look, I, I, I that's not really a good name for a Jewish <laughs> newspaper, is it? Well, I look. It, it works for me. It were it works for me. Forward, uh, better than the Jewish backward. I think, uh, which is. <laughs> I uh, oh, look, but, I'm, uh, look, can I mention one more thing? One more thing. Yes. Dr. Uh, Hershenfeld has to teach a class at 730. Oh, so we have to okay. uh, yeah, yeah. I'll give you a 
just just one just one more thing, and that that is uh, the PETA podcast. PETA has saved eight hundred cats and dogs from Ukraine. PETA Germany has gone into Lviv, and they've got this underground railroad type of network set up, where dogs are coming in from Kiev, from uh, from all parts of the country to to Lviv, and then the PETA folks come into Ukraine, pick them up, and then bring them into Poland to veterinary care. And they've got something like forty thousand pounds of dog food that they're uh, that they're distributing. So, you know, right. it's tough. We're we're talking about one month after. It's tough for the people, certainly, but it's also been tough for the animals. And yes, and and nothing speaks humanity more than seeing refugees bringing along their cats and their dogs. But you, oh, yeah. you see that, and you say, the you know, oh, these are human beings. Once oh, you see them bringing a cat or a dog, they it becomes for some reason it becomes real to me. Yeah, heartbreaking. But you know what? What the PETA people are finding is that that at the train station, they're being told that their dogs, there's no room for the dog on the train, and they're they're finding dogs tied up to poles at the train stations. And not the poles who are letting them in. Not no, those poles go. They they they're yeah, they're they're treated kinder. Anyway, uh, I not funny. I Not, well, no, it's it's fine. Look, I'd laugh. I laugh at all your jokes. That's why I like to. Pain is I, funny. I call you my friend. Other people, other people's pain. I, is- I've been. Yeah, great. Right, right. Pain is uh, cruelty is you find it. You, you, you find a person in a cruel situation and then you make it worse. That's comedy. Right. You know that. Emil Guillermo. PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Every Wednesday, new episode. Read him over at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Follow him on Twitter at Emil Amuk. For more information, go to amuk.com. That's A M O K dot com. Thank and don't you. Forget, and don't forget the live stream. The live stream on YouTube. Now I have to pee. I was doing so well, and now I have to pee. Thank you, Thank Emil you. Guillermo. Bye, Thank Ethan. You. Bye. Ethan. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst. Eh, is he really, though? I mean, you say that, but... No, I think he is. Okay, go on. Ethan Hershenfeld is not only the son of a Freudian psychoanalyst. He, he is, even during the pandemic, you were on Bull. You were in the movie Red Notice on Netflix. It, uh, special Victims Unit, Law and Order. Right. And you're doing books on tape. It's, it's there's just, there's a lot happening. Um, a but, pandemic. And and despite all of that, he still finds the time and energy to give his old man a hard time. I know. So that anybody who does not believe in the Oedipus complex. Prima facie evidence right here. Talking. I, c- c- plug some gigs. I forgot the book. Hang on for one go, second. Go do what you have to do. Um, I might give you a hard time, but I'm also I'm willing to give you a kidney. So that's a fair trade. It is, but I do not need a kidney. Thank you very much. Well, you can never have too many kidneys. You're just right. going to say no? I'm, I'm just going to say no. That's right. Just that's say right. no. All right. How about a liver? Oh, I'm in. I'm in the laundry room doing a wash, and we have a library. Leave a book, take a book. Look at that. Oh. I'm doing my wash, and I I see a book treating the edible patient in grief psychotherapy. Edited. Who wrote it? Uh, Althea J. Horner. Here's the irony, Dr. Hershenfeld. I'm, I'm washing my mother's bras. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> she doesn't live with me, but every now and then to calm down, I wash my mother's bras. And then this, and then and this, then this book pops up. Magical. See? You, you, uh, you shouldn't use so much starch when you're doing that. <laughs> well, 
Let me ask you a stupid question that was probably most of your. I know. Are stupid. So okay, we're born. And why are you doing this today? You're doing a lot of this. Hey, what is that? I'm done. I'm going That's back. A new move. That's a new move. Yeah. I'm trying to get into the screen. That's what it seems like. Yeah. Put a prayer card into the screen. Let me ask you a stupid question. We're born gay. Correct? We're born what? We're born gay. You're born, yeah. born gay. That, that, that people don't choose their sexuality. It chooses them. It's complicated. Nah. It's yeah. not really complicated. Yeah. No, you're, you, it's nature and nurture. Nurture. Okay. If, what is the, go ahead. Let me give you an example. This is a bona fide study. What is, what are you doing? Why are you going like this to talk? Just relax. I'm doing it too. It's I'm getting, it's making, me, it's making me nervous. With kids. No, it's making me nervous. Just stop it. You never talk to anybody else the way you talk to me or your father. It's just like get this with my kids. This is what they do. I go, what are you going like this? What is he to see you? He's at the edge of his seat. He can't believe he loves you so much. He's at the edge of his seat. Look at me. I'm wearing a dinner. See, I'm wearing a. I'm wearing formal wear for the show tonight. See? All right. Well, I, I, know, I get this from my Dr. Hershenfeld. Why, if you can't fix this, uh, what, 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 is it, what am I going to do? Never hear of patricide. This is an example. <laughs> killing me <sighs> all right go ahead before you got rudely interrupted by Dekinder. here's one example and this is i think bona fide statistics the more he said bona <laughs> okay. the more older brothers a kid has the more likely he is be gay. What's the theory behind this? That the mother develops, and this is this is known. Mother develops antibodies against aspects of the fetus that she carries. So very slowly, she develops antibodies against the male brain that she is carrying. And therefore, it's more likely, not 100%, obviously, but statistically, a little more likely. Wow. That the, that, that what? Finish the thought. Land the plane, for Christ's Are sake. Are you kidding me? This is the most exciting, profound revelation we've had in the history of the show. Teddy what? Kennedy is gay or was gay. No, finish, the, finish this cockamamie theory. Okay, the mother is developing antibodies, and then what? Finish the theory. And then somehow that feminizes the third or the fourth fetus. Not 100% of the time, but statistically a significant amount of the time. That's fascinating. Okay. Wow. I, uh... It leads into a question I was going to have you about the type of Oedipal complex a gay child might experience. Like, what, does it get, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny here. Does, what is the Oedipal complex like? Is it, it, does it, does it matter what your sexuality is? If you're. Everybody, even you, David Feldman, has a positive and a negative Oedipal complex, meaning part you want to bump off your father so you can have your mother all to yourself and in part you want to bump off your mother so you can have your father all to yourself and anybody who doesn't believe this you just have to talk to little three four five year old boys and they will or girls and they will tell you this straight out now, if, you're, if you're if I you're if you bump off my mother and my father and just Play with myself. What does that mean? Go ahead. I was going to say that if you're single 
and and you're an adult, you can't talk to three, four, and five-year-old children. It's you can get arrested for that. <laughs> so there's no way to test your theory. Okay. Ethan? Yes. That's a really interesting uh, study that your father cited that if... if I, I disagree. I disagree. If you're the youngest boy of several older brothers, you have several older brothers. Yeah. You, 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 I'm speechless. Do you have any older brothers? Do I? How many older brothers do you have? I have one, but he counts for about seven because he's a he's a he's a real piece of work. So I'm flaming over here. <laughs> How many older brothers did you have, Doctor Hershenfeld? Zippo. Ah. Yeah, which is why he's the Clint Eastwood of the Psychoanalytic <laughs> Institute. Extremely macho. <laughs> you know, in all this excitement. I forgot how many prescriptions I wrote today. I don't know how many sheets are on my pad. <laughs> no, I listen. I don't. I, I don't. I, I, how can I disagree with with the doctor's theories? He has, you know, sixty or fifty years of experience. He has degrees. <laughs> he has. He has a practice. He has colleagues who respect him. He has a look at all his books. He's not. Uh, he's not farting around. He's. You know, he knows what he's talking about. I, I don't. I don't happen to agree, but I, I. But I don't have a leg to stand on. I don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, I got uh, some complaints coming in on two things I said this week. One is I accused everyone who has a position of power in America of being psychopaths. People said, I don't know the definition of the word psychopath. I shouldn't use the word psychopath, that I am a psychopath. That was one complaint. And now I'm getting complaints uh, that I complained about chocolate Tootsie Pops being redundant because they have chocolate in the middle. And now people are saying, no, it's caramel. No, no. it's not. No, that's caramel. That in the middle of a Tootsie Pop, it is Tootsie roll, and that Tootsie Rolls have caramel, not Well, chocolate. I guess that is what it is. It's very sticky. That's right. right. But I say it's chocolate caramel, which is yes. the, it's the same. It's basically chocolate, right? Wouldn't you? My premise being that chocolate Tootsie Pops are redundant because it's chocolate on the. There's no surprise when you get to the middle. The people are saying caramel is not chocolate, so there is a surprise. I don't like how you pronounce the mel in caramel. It's caramel. Mel. Caramel. Mel. I, I make it too Jewish, mel. Yeah. Caramel. Um, I always found the... Oh, go ahead, doctor. I do not eat sugar at all, so I cannot participate in this conversation. Well, let's then let's we'll, we'll get we'll get your colleagues' position on chocolate caramel, whether or not caramel is in fact chocolate, and then you will talk to us about uh, the term psychopath. I always found the combination if you were, for example, having a grape Tootsie Pop, and then the and then that chocolatey taste. I didn't like that. It was too. It was it was a shocking contrast on the palate. I didn't like that. I I like the. The root beery kind of things in that direction. Oh, but the cherry and then chocolate, that worked for me. In general, I don't like chocolate mixed with fruit. I like fruit and I like chocolate. I just don't like fruit and chocolate. It's similar with horses and movies. I like horses <laughs> and I like movies, but I don't like movies with horses in them. I found that out. I don't like movies with horses in them. I don't mind a, I, I, especially an incidental horse. I don't like an incidental horse, like a Western. It just happens to be a horse. I, 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 I do like movies about horses, like Far Lop or, or you name it. Uh, Sagittarius. Sagittarius. Yeah, any of that stuff. Yeah, if it's about, yeah. yeah if, the, if the movie's about a horse, then I like it. But I don't want to just, oh, there's a horse. I'm not interested. It puts me to sleep. Why is that, doctor? It's psychological. <laughs> 
<laughs> when you were in the womb, your mother was scared by a horse. How about that? Wow, that I like that. That's uh, I do. Girls from troubled marriages become horseback riders. Every girl I know whose parents were divorced ends up falling in love with horses and is out. <clears throat> a different. I don't, it's too. Let's turn to. But that's just a study that I have conducted yeah. among uh, it's one woman. Scientific. It's one woman I know. Uh, parents were divorced and she went to the stables. What is the, what is a, a a psychopath? What is the definition of a psychopath? Let me let's why don't we start by talking about what isn't <laughs> a psychopath. So we can stretch the treatment longer. We can draw a circle around that and then anything within those boundaries. <laughs> So what is not a psychopath? I'll tell you things that aren't a psychopath. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, not a psychopath. John Bon Jovi, not. Mr. Ed is not a psychopath. Mr. Ed. So now we have Mr. Rogers, Mr. Ed, and John Bon Jovi, not. So are you starting to get a, a picture of what hey, is a psychopath? I'm starting to think I'm a psychopath because I'm not... You know, and one of those three. I'm yeah. not falling into the, the circle. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, doctor, would you like to uh, exp expand on that? I think your answer was <laughs> unimpeachable. How's that? That would be a great way to convince somebody <laughs> that they're a psychopath. <laughs> um, <laughs> <With the board. laughs> Everything around this circle. Yeah. And you just keep listing. Everybody who's not, I don't see your name. I, you must be in the circle. What? Because I said that it only a psychopath could be a billionaire. Only a psychopath could be a, a, a general. Uh, well, these, I mean, these generalizations you come up with, they, they don't hold a lot of water. Some billionaires are psychopaths for sure. And, and some bus drivers are psychopaths. A psychopath is someone who either has no conscience or superego or seems to have no conscience or superego. Because one of the theories is that a psychopath is a person, and, and maybe there's different brands, but, but the psychopath is a person who has such a severe conscience, such a severe superego, that he just has to evade the whole thing in some way or another and act as if he has no such thing. Wow. Uh, that that the, the overbearing superego being responsible for is it pronounced psychopathy how do you pronounce yes psychopathy yes um what scares me about what constitutes a psychopath is at the height of my stand-up prowess when when i was a young buck who could do 90 minutes on the road on stage and it was you know I could really do it. I was a psychopath. I uh, I didn't care what the audience thought. I uh, didn't I didn't care if I hurt anybody's feelings when I was on stage. Uh, I objectified everybody in the room and saw them as uh, receptacles of my comedy, and their job was to laugh. That, that is that that's playing at being a psychopath, right? Well, it's not even in the ballpark of being a psychopath. Okay. It's being a miserable person, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's, the, the, the tunnel vision of being a road comic. Yes, you've got a, you've got a lot of um, 
pressures on you of various sorts. And so you do what you have to do to, to make a buck and, and to get a laugh. What percentage of our population is our psychopaths? Get, get the bell ready. Get the bell ready. Yes. Okay. Let me put some money in the kitty. Okay. Seven. Seven percent are psychopaths. Yes. I say lower. I, I, I think it's much, much lower. Who says seven percent? Your son. Oh, I made that up. Oh. I don't Maybe know our chat answer. room. I don't know the answer. But I seven percent sound, sounds a little high. Seven percent right. people may have some of those tendencies. And, and can cheat and, and hurt other people, you know, without feeling too bad about it. But that doesn't raise to the level of a true psychopath. And can it be cured? Um, in Clockwork Orange, they tried. Turns out it didn't work. And uh, I think probably not. So if, I'm going to ask you a serious question. You don't have to answer this. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask it of Ethan, your colleague. But you're, you're, uh, you see a patient who's obviously a psychopath. It, you'd say, you know, go be a corporate attorney. Go, go be an agent. Go work for CAA. What, what adv how do you help a psychopath? I think the, the, the critical thing is whatever you tell them to do, it should include starting a podcast. <laughs> whatever the treatment, one element should involve having your own podcast. Okay, so I come to you and I say, doctor, doctor, help me. My, I think there's something wrong with my dial. With my what? I think there's something wrong with this kid of mine. He's oh. he's killing. He's got a hammer and he, he's like a cat. He's bringing dead birds into the house. Uh, what do you, what do you do? C can that be cured? Um, not by me, because I have no credentials, experience, or ability in this field. But um, I would say. Um, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. What do you say, doctor? I would say, see, I thought David was going to say that he came into the doctor's office and said, I'm a psychopath. Could you right. help? Right. That, that, that never happens. Right. Nobody who is psych people, if they call themselves a psychopath, they're not. Right. But. Yes, it occasionally happens that somebody brings the child in and says, you know, he's torturing, uh, you know, animals and, and stealing and lying. I think if, if the treatment starts early enough and goes on long enough, I think that um, there can be some modification of those tendencies, but cure, I don't know. I had a couple of such experiences. They didn't go very well. So you, you say to the, go be a divorce attorney. I'm being, I, I'm not, I'm being serious. So you, you say you have a, uh, an aptitude. You should be a, a divorce attorney, I think. You would enjoy that, and it would limit the damage that you do to uh, society. You have a very negative opinion <laughs> of certain classes of people, like divorce attorneys or CEOs. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're, you're casting aspersions at entire classes of people. You're, I, I should be more understanding of the scum of the earth, is what you're saying. You should be more specific. You should say, this guy, because of doing A, B, and C, 
To me, he seems like a psychopath. I would go along with that. But not I, everybody who's a divorce attorney, there, there's some ethical people in that business. You're talking about... They're not. With all due respect, doctor, there's not a single divorce attorney who, at least in America, because believe I, me, I went through all of them and I couldn't find... I was like Diogenes. I couldn't find an honest. Okay. Well, I would never argue with experience. Whenever I read that somebody I dislike is going through a divorce, mm -hmm. Schadenfreude. I do, if I dislike this person, I feel bad for the kids. Yeah. But you know, your next two years are going to be. Hell, uh, Ethan, I interrupted you. No, no, I was, I was simply going to say uh, I wanted to uh, reframe or just rephrase what the doctor was saying. Was that you're, you're, uh, you're painting with a broad brush when you talk about the entire profession as psychopathic. I, I think you, there might be a higher percentage in the law than in medicine of people who are self-centered that that there's probably a, that's probably that might be true but you go to work every day in a glass tower and you're moving papers into separate hoppers and you take a, a paper and move it into the cell hopper which means an entire factory of uh children is uh going to be shut down and these kids will be left to starve i feel like you're that's that's out of some movie scenario that doesn't sound like how these jobs really work but i don't know um you have to plug some gigs oh um yeah you know there's this comedian i met through the uh when I was doing some teaching, helping people with joke writing and stuff. She has a very, <laughs> she's very funny. She has a very big following and she has a show on, on Sirius. Her name is Jen Fullweiler. Fullweiler. And she's on the Catholic channel. Cause she has, she's Catholic and she has many kids and she's a comedian. So she just asked me to, op to open for her uh, April 22nd at City Winery here in New York. So I think it's going to be a big show, April 22nd, which I'm looking forward to. That's, uh, there's a plug. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, Did you draw a, a big Catholic audience? I think so, and I think uh, also a family audience and a lot of women because she's, she's a mom and she talks about being a mom to many kids uh, on her show and in her act. Yeah. Finally. That's exciting. Yeah. And, and Dr. Hershenfeld, do you have any gigs you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, I've, I have a number of gigs I, I'd like to plug, but the ethics of my profession does not allow me to plug them. <laughs> oh, oh, I wanted to say one other thing, if I might. Um, on Sunday night, a few nights ago, um, so I've been, uh, there's this guy, uh, um, Ari Kagan. You can look him up. He's a YouTube uh, creator and comedian. Ari Kagan. So he asked me if I would be the warm-up comedian at the live taping of a reality dating show. Oh. So I said, sure. And he said, look, I just want to warn you. Uh, so it's a, it's the crowd's about 150 people. It's a really nice room. He said, last week, the comedian completely bombed the warm-up comedian. So when you come this week, we don't want you to do any material. We just want you to just talk to the audience, rile them up. We want it to be like Jerry Springer. Just... So I was excited about this because I like doing crowd work and, and I, I just saw Friedlander, who's a master of it, so that's why I thought of it. I got up there, <laughs> had one of those experiences, complete bomb. It was, it was pretty, uh, it was incredible. Just a full-on bomb. And uh, I can't say it was enjoyable in any way, but it was interesting. It's an interesting, bizarre, horrible, uh, historic experience. Welcome to my world. Yeah. Did, you learn, did you learn anything from it? Yeah, I learned don't listen when someone says come, but don't bring any material. That's insane. <laughs> or don't bomb. Yeah. Last question. 
Last one. I won't ask this of the oh, day. Um, Ed, yeah. Oh, I wanted to uh, plug that that show because the the guy's show. Um, um, proof proof of love. Look it up. It's called Proof of Love. The the uh, the reality dating game show. Proof of Love. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Lindsey Graham. A lot of older brothers. You think he got a lot of older brothers? Forty six. <laughs> His mother was a mouse. <laughs> he had lemons for six at a time. I think that guy's had a lot of older brothers, if you know what I mean. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ethan. Can I, are you, is, is Friedlander actually next? And can I meet him? Can I say hello? Or is this not appropriate? Of course, Judah. Judah. The world champ, Judah Friedlander, yeah, I might have stepped away. Yeah, it looks like he stepped away. But tell him I'm a big fan and I love him. Everybody's a big fan of yeah. Judah. Yeah, his his crowd work stuff is just incredible, and, and not to higher, mention yeah, his whole oeuvre and his ping pong. Jesus, what's yeah. he world champ of? Everything. Oh, he doesn't fail at anything. Like yeah. he like the the like Ethan's story about bombing. Yeah. That like it, it's you, you might as well be describing uh, something in Chinese. Uh, it's another language. He doesn't. The word bombing is not in his vocabulary. I mean, the man has never failed at any. Oh, oh, there was another another. I had one overlap with him in around two thousand eight. I auditioned for the role of a guy working at a memorabilia uh, fair um, in that movie, The Wrestler, and I didn't get the part. And he, Judah got the part. Of course he's going to get the part. <laughs> if you see Judah auditioning for the same part you're auditioning, you go home. Yeah, go home. Go home. Go yeah. Home. All right. Thank you. Thug, thug, Jew. Go uh, thug, thug, Jew. Thug, thug, Jew. All right. Thug, thug, Jew right now on YouTube. That was great. Thank you so much. Thanks. I can feel it, Hershenfeld. Well, we're going to be joined by Judah Friedlander in just a moment. You're listening to the David Feldman show david feldman show.com we'll be right back it's time right now for the david feldman show he's talking politics and comment too to tell a dirty joke he knows quite a few he's just a lefty from way back he's a union man with an emmy for right some days he's mad and he feels like fighting it's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears all right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Bell Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming away. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Dave, by the way, David, you should get that thing looked at. You, you really what? should get that thing looked at. That thing. I wouldn't wait, David. That's definitely not good. I would go to a dermatologist tomorrow, first thing, David, and get that looked at because that does not look good. What? Really? Where? That what? thing that you have right above your shoulder, David. My neck? No, your face. The whole <laughs> thing. The whole thing, David. You should tear it down and start all over again, like I did with Ivana. That was, that was my in, interview with uh, Donald Trump from 
a, a week ago. So go to my website for that. I believe he's here. This is very exciting. I think our guest is here. Judah Friedlander, are you here, sir? There, David, whenever you need me, I'm here for you. Thank you. Uh, wow. <laughs> I love your backdrop. That, that, is, that is just... What are you talking about, David? What are nothing. you referring to? It's perfect. It is absolutely... Judah Friedlander is a comedian. He hosts live pay what you want stand up shows every week. Shows I don't are host them, David. I, I headline them. David. He, I'm sorry. He headlines pay what you want stand up shows. They are interactive. You can choose to have your camera and mic on so that you can participate in the show and see and hear other audience members. In addition to seeing and hearing the performers for more information. Go to judahfriedlander.com. Please welcome Judah Friedlander. Thank you, David. Thank you. That's right, David. Uh, the shows I do, David, the shows I do are actually interactive. It's not this monarchy that you have where you and your guests get to talk freely while the peons just get to write something in the chat, okay? Well, this is, my shows are about freedom, David. Freedom. Yeah. Well, it makes me rethink. Uh, I, I, I guess this is a form of fascism. Uh, yep. I have to, you yeah. said it, your words, not mine, David. Right, right. So how do you see the situation? How's the I world? think things are a little scary in Ukraine right now because um, the CDC said that war was going to be mild. So, <laughs> um, I... I mean, the CDC said they did their research. They right. listened to the the CDC. They did their research. They said they 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 listened to the airline CEOs, and they said the war in Ukraine was going to be mild. And uh, I think they've been off on this one. So it's time for Fauci to go. It's 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 he got it completely once again. Fauci missed. And is it because they're not wearing masks in Ukraine? Is that the problem? No, I don't think that's it. Well, the war is a whole other thing. Um, I, don't, I tell you, it's awful. And it is really weird. Turning on the television, watching the war and know that we didn't 100 percent fully and directly start it. It's just weird. I mean, how far has America fallen? That we're watching a war on TV. And it's not 100% our own, our war, you know? Dang. So. Can you say that? It's almost unpatriotic to I say. I don't know. That. I don't know what Biden's doing. I mean, he stopped one war in Afghanistan, and now he's not even fully joining this one. I mean, <laughs> what's happened to American foreign policy? I don't know why he's not going in. The CDC said it's a mild war. So <laughs> I don't know what he's waiting on. <laughs> We've lost a step. You're right. This is not my country anymore. I don't recognize. Yeah. Don't, yeah. So, but, you know, it's, I think it's great that the pandemic in this country is over just in time for World War III. Yeah, <laughs> just, the way the CDC followed the science from Delta Airlines uh, <laughs> has just been so good, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, thing that, the, the, the weird part that I think I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on with this country, but it's like with the CDC, they do so many anti-science things, but it's not in the way that the far right says they're doing it, which is that, you know, th there is no pandemic. There's there's no need to do any mitigations. It's like every decision they make is is pro, you know, corporate billionaire donors of the politicians and what they want. So because they've made more money during this pandemic. So. So it's it's never towards uh, health, you know. Right. Um, so, but uh, they're doing a great job. You know, they're really doing a great job. The CDC. Um, over a million deaths yesterday in America. Uh, <laughs> we did it, David. Nobody thought we could do it. I mean, the numbers they put out there, the numbers Fauci and Burks and everyone put out there at the beginning, they were never saying them. They weren't even saying 500,000 and look how much we've done. You, you know, big. they're not, they don't dream big. You know what? Maybe they're just not dreamers. You're right, man. Have you ever had a dream? 
I, 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 I think I'm limited. I don't, th- I didn't think we could get to a million. I, I'm not a big thinker. Yeah, it's okay. I think these Canadian truckers and now the American truckers, I think that is the most successful protest in protest history. Yeah. Because they're protesting to end all the restrictions and there's no fucking restrictions. It's like, call it a victory lap already, you know, but it's like, but I mean, seriously, they, they, they did a, a trucker protest for, for a few weeks in Canada and then America's just like, all right, we'll just end all the restrictions. It's like, I mean, you look at like if Gandhi like had a truck, you know, <laughs> if Gandhi and Martin Luther King had some trucks, think about what they could have accomplished, you know, um, I think it really is the most successful protest in history. Um, It says a lot, you know. So let me think here, because I'm doing the math. Before the Canadian truckers swarmed on Ottawa, Mm -hmm. there were all these anti, there were all these uh, vaccine and mask mandates. It's disappeared. Yep. Yep. Most successful protest in protest history. And Canada beat us to it. Another loss for America. Yeah. Martin so. Luther King, he should have had a 32-wheeler instead of a dream. Or you can still have a dream, but you got to have a truck. You got to yeah. have a truck. <laughs> I mean, if, if you have a dream, but no truck, how is that dream going to get delivered to the people? Oh, I, I hope people are listening. This is great advice. This is great advice. That's what I try to do. That's what I try to do. You know, I'm just trying to help America. Uh, and how about a round of applause for America? Can we get a round of applause for America? <laughs> That's right. USA. I think it's now the 71st week on the front cover of Perfect Country magazine. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm a little worried about us. I think we're starting to slip as a nation. You know, I like if you would have asked me six weeks ago, I would have said the USA is definitely going to win the Nobel War Prize this year. (laughs) And now I'm starting to think we're not going to get the Nobel War Prize. And and we win it every fucking year, Dave. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know what the fuck Congress is doing. Yeah, it's, thank God uh, they ended that pandemic, though. Thank God they ended that pandemic. Um, you can accomplish. They just—they literally just changed the map of transmission in the United States from dark red, and then they just changed it to like soft pastel <laughs> green and, and pink. And they were like, "Hey, see, it's fine now." And, uh, <laughs> you know what CDC stands for, David? Do you know what CDC stands for? I forgot. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Oh, right, right. Yeah. You see, they, they forgot the P. It's, it should be <laughs> CDCP. <laughs> it's the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They don't do the fucking prevention. Right, right. They forgot the P. <clears throat> right. You know, Never you gotta, forget. You got to stick up for the letter P, you know. Never forget your P. Mm-hmm right so you're optimistic about this country even though you see flaws you you love america and this is these are tough times but we're all rallying around the flag and and supporting one another and you see nothing but good right david i don't know what the fuck you're talking about right now (laughs) Um, look david recently i've been having a lot of optimism about my pessimism ah. and i think that's the way to do it i think pessimism is where it's at so you see the glass you're saying oh you see the glass half full or half empty no, you just see the glass it's a beautiful glass who cares if it's half empty or half full mm-hmm. it, it's a glass and you should just celebrate that who cares what's inside the glass that's an interesting way to look at it uh i usually don't even see the glass to be honest with you <laughs> people say do you see the glass is half full or half empty i'm like i i don't see a glass i don't, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck you're talking about <laughs> i think you're 
secretly an optimist. I think you're looking at this country right now, and I think you drop to your knees every day and say, thank you, God, it's the greatest time to be alive. That's what I, that's what I see when I look at you. I see somebody who bounces out of bed and says, good morning, evening, or after, whatever time you wake up, and, and you, you, you go, go to it. Did Sylvester Stallone write that? <laughs> Frank Stallone. Frank Stallone? Yeah, Frank. Are, are you telling me that you've changed? Are, are you, do you see bleakness on the horizon? That's not the Judah I don't see how I don't see how anyone could, to be honest with you. I mean, when you look around at the nation and the world, how could anyone see that, you know? Um, especially the success of those truckers, you know, how can anyone see it? <laughs> The victory of the airline CEOs and public health coming together. You know, it's a lot of, a lot of great, a lot of great things happening right now. You always have solutions. You know, one of the great things. No, about look, I, I feel pretty good. We're seated in the top five for World War Three. So, <laughs> you know, I've been watching the war on TV and they haven't even listed the score yet. You know, it's been a month and it's like. The worst thing about this war is it's 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 uh, taking away all the press from all our other wars we have going on, you know, and uh, kind of feel bad for those wars, you know, getting left out and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, uh, all wars, I love all our wars equally, all of them. I don't pick favorites. See, that's where I disagree with you. That's where I disagree with you. Now, what do you think we should do if um, if the war continues if russia's invasion of ukraine continues and gets even worse what do you think america should do or if china invades taiwan what do you think we should do i think we should debate whether or not it is in fact world war three if we should call it world war three and they've already come up with the name like they didn't have a name for world war one mm. until the war was over and now we're not going to make that mistake again. We've already named it World War Three. We know this is going to be World War. I disagree. III. I think if China invades Taiwan, we should. Um, I think we should invade Vietnam again. I, uh, I think that was our most popular war. I think we we can all agree on that. Warm memories, a lot of great music. You know, look how many great movies we got out of the Vietnam War. You know, I mean, sure we killed hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese and killed uh, many of our own troops, but have you seen Forrest Gump? I, mean, I, I think it was worth it. It was you absolutely. Know. If you do, you remember? Do you remember uh, Willem Dafoe's biceps in that scene in uh, Platoon? I, I think it's cinematically. I think it was worth it. You yeah. know, a victory for Hollywood. Yeah. Have you seen any movies, David? Uh, only on my computer I, I have not ventured that's still a movie i didn't say go to the movie theater but a movie what did you see i watched munich or something about with jeremy irons and i uh, i watched what did i watch uh, cactus flower on turner classic movies i like old movies and you like old movies yeah it's good i do yeah. want to say this david i think you might have and i'm being completely serious here you might have the oldest podcast not longest running but the oldest podcast i mean i turn 75 next week and i feel like the young guy here <laughs> this is the longest for people who don't know david this is the longest podcast and if anyone has had the privilege of texting with david feldman I want to let you know that his texting style is the complete opposite of his podcast style. You do you do a six hour podcast eight days a week, and <laughs> you might text one syllable every four days. <laughs> I'm a, this is in, 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 in right. booking this show, right? Like, like I actually I texted you like, hey, I'm interested in doing the show, and then I think a day later you text back when. And then, and then two more days go by and i'm like i'm available all week and then you go fantastic and i was like wow fantastic now david's getting verbose <laughs> his text style 
that's a lot of syllables for for a Feldman text. <laughs> but literally, like, like, like the first time I texted you, I thought someone stole your phone because <laughs> it was one word every few days. And I've seen your podcast, and I like your podcast. And I'm like, this is not the same fucking person. There's no fucking way this is the same person. Yeah, there's a a problem. Uh, I'm emotionally distant in mm. in in reality, and this show gives off the illusion that I'm a human being. But in real life, yeah, the, 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 I in real in real life. So what? So when you're texting, you just have other stuff going on in your head, or what, what's going on? I'm asocial. I asocial. think I, I'm kind of. Uh, is is the word I, I i fancy myself a loner but most people just don't want to be around me it's I not, yeah i mean uh and you're in you're in the upper east side of new york city is that correct yes and i, I find all pain uh it, it can be sourced to human beings that that if there's short of physical pain um all emotional pain flows from another human being so i limit my exposure and then i do the show so there are witnesses so i can play it back and oh yes i was the asshole here and that's why i like surveillance i i i wish i could get the nsa to play to i'd, I'd in relationships i wish i could just look up and say nsa can you just play this back for us so you, to prove that I'm right and she's wrong. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, I think you bring a good point. I mean, I think uh, humans uh, are the most destructive force the planet has ever seen. Yeah. Not close. Right. Not close. You right. know. Um, so as a species, no one is as dangerous as the humans. It, it's not close. I mean, I think... At, by default, humans are uh, a terrifying species. Um, you know, but many I'm other, other animals, they might kill and stuff like that, but they generally kill what they need for survival. Right. We go way beyond that. Right. So, Cats do the same thing. Cats are similar. To that, that, that Of all the animals, they're probably the most similar to the humans. Right. And that's, that's why I don't like them. Why don't you like and other people? And they're like, oh, that's why I like cats. I'm like, all right, well, now I know someone who to stay away from. Right, right. I don't like cats because I'm not a people person. There's exactly. a, right? They shit in your house and they, they demand that you clean it up. I think like David, you're the kind David, of David, David, we shit in our houses also. I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Well, you're you have a lot of TV residuals, so not all of us a lot of us shit indoors okay. that's that, not all of us yeah when i said we i meant the people well the eh, you you've done pretty you're very successful and the reason you're successful i'm just a role model okay, okay. <laughs> the reason you're successful is when people get to know you they like you I've had managers and agents who said, you know, you should go to this party, let them get to know you. And I said, if they get to know me, they're not going to hire me. Mm. When See, I never got that far in a conversation with a manager or an agent. Um, if I hear a manager or an agent's having a party, I know where not to go. <laughs> that's, that's where you don't go. But I remember so when I was first starting out. I remember when I was first starting out. Because... Uh, you know, most managers and agents, it's like they speak another language, you know, it, it's it's basically the same language as like much of a corporate America speak or like PR speak where no one's being honest. And right. it's all this. I, I, don't, I don't know what the fuck they're saying, but they're they're not being honest. Um, and I used to like when I first started, you know, I'm a kid and I'm thinking, oh, I guess I'm just not grown up enough to. Uh, to understand what they're doing, and I'm like, no, it's it's uh, you understood. It, they were just they were bullshitters, you know, um, for the most part. So, see, you're different from me. You have a life. 
you're out doing things and i've just look at me what the fuck are you talking about that's beautiful you that's a beautiful backdrop i'm in a box <laughs> i'm in a box david I've seen you, you, I've gone down to the clubs and you're happy to be there. And all I'm thinking is what is the shortest distance between where I am right now and my bedroom? How do I get to my bedroom as quickly as possible? See, that That's showing privilege there. That means you have an apartment you want to be in. Oh, that's true. Not right. everyone in New York has that situation. <laughs> Right. Now, are you, you, you didn't grow up in New York, but you love this city. You, you are always, I, whenever I see you, you're always, oh, have you eaten at this place? And you're Broadway. I can't, I'm, I have tickets to see Deborah Messing aging on Broadway. She's going to age a hundred years on Broadway. You're like you, the museums, you, you just, you cannot believe all that this city has to offer, right? You're, you're in love. I just, I just like going to Queens and uh, walking around. That's what I like doing. It is a beautiful. I like, I like going. Well, I don't know if it's beautiful. I wouldn't call it beautiful. Uh, it can be interesting. I wouldn't call it beautiful. I don't understand people when they say New York's beautiful. I'm like, it could be exciting. It could be enraging. It could be very engaging. I, I wouldn't use the word beautiful for New York City. It's a pretty ugly city as far as cities go, but it's uh but it, it's an, it can be an exciting city. It's gotten worse over the years in the sense with how, you know, I'm sure you've talked about how corporate it's gotten, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the corporatization of the city. But um, there's still a lot of great things, and there are, there are some great people in the city. They can be harder and harder to find, and sometimes you have to go uh, as far as you can away from the center of the city to do it. Um, right, right. Yeah. And the subways, when you get on the subways, are you afraid you're going to push somebody into an oncoming car? Are you terrified that you're going to stab somebody? No, I don't do that, David. Oh, I don't, I don't. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to take the subways because, because you're going to commit violence. Well, yes, it's on the rise, so I'm afraid I'll be one of those like oh, or, people that do it. Yeah, no, that like, hasn't occurred to me. That has not occurred like, to me. Like I'm afraid now. I'm going to put all my excrement in a bag and spread it all over uh, somebody. Well, I'll be honest with you, David, that's nothing to fear. That's just something <laughs> you got to do it. You got to do it. <laughs> that, that, you shouldn't be fearing that. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Did you like our poo bandit? I, I don't know what, what, I don't know what that means. What does that well, mean? He's a, he's a hero here. He, I'm out of the loop. Who's the? What's the poo bandit doing? I'm out of the Gentleman loop. Gentleman who shared his poo with a fellow traveler, and I don't mean communist. It was a he got arrested for spreading his poo on on a woman, and literally said to the judge, "And I'm not making this up. Shit happens." And you see, this is what's called. Um, this guy probably has a PR person because. <laughs> Back in the day, that would not have been a newsworthy story. That right. would have just been something that right. happens. Right. I hear you. So before you go, this is please come back. This is this is a, a privilege to have you on the show. And you 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 are amazing. How do people see your show? How do it's pay what you want? I don't I don't know how they do it. That's up to them, David. I don't get involved in their personal business. <laughs> But when is your next show? Oh, Saturday I'm doing a show. I basically do live stream uh, stand-up shows. I haven't done a show at a venue in over two years now because, I mean, a lot of people don't know about it, but there is a pandemic going on out there. A lot of people don't know that. But, like, oh, uh, is this COVID? But, yeah, well, the, the coronavirus is the pandemic that's been going on. You that's not, been. but you, the world champ, not doing stand-up well i'm doing stand-up but only online i'm not doing it at venues currently and that i do is about two or three a week online all the shows are pay what you want and they're about two hours i usually have two or three comics going up before me doing about 10 minutes each and i do about an hour and a half and uh uh yeah the next one is this saturday march 26 9 p.m eastern 6 p.m western and it's uh Infos on my website or Twitter and Instagram have a link. It's uh, at 
Judah World Champ. J U D A H World Champ for Instagram and Twitter. And the website is judahfriedlander.com. Friedlander spelled like Friedlander. <laughs> The the live shows are on Zoom. Yeah, they're on Zoom. Yeah, and it works great. It works. You don't you don't have to buy two drinks, and uh, you don't have to have uh, drunk assholes uh, sitting next to you. And um, yeah, it, it, it's it it works surprisingly and shockingly well. It's pretty much the same as at a venue. Uh, in some ways, it's more personal. Um, because I'm seeing into people's homes as opposed to everyone being at a neutral location together. Right. So in some ways, it's um, it's almost more interesting in some ways. But because of the pandemic, I, I think it's um, unlike the CDC. I think it's a good idea to, um, you know, try to suppress the virus as much as people can <laughs> and not get everyone infected. You know, I mean, the CDC seems to think that getting everyone infected and then saying now you have immunity, uh, they don't mention it's for three months, but only. But um, you know, uh, I, I think it's probably a better idea for people not to keep getting the disease every three or four months. Um, yes, yeah. there's no real herd immunity from it. Uh, so right. That seems pretty obvious. Uh, so yeah, so I'm just doing shows online right now. So, um, uh, so it's interesting. It's been two years since you've been doing these shows online. Over two years now. Yeah. Oh, well, no, the first couple months, like when the lockdown first started, I did. I wasn't doing any shows. I didn't. I didn't know Zoom existed. I didn't know there could be an internet show. You know. And then I learned about it. I think the first one I did, I did a guest set on someone else's show. I think that was May, uh, twenty twenty. And I think the first one I produced was July twenty twenty. So I've been producing my own shows since July 2020. OK, two years ago, the comics were saying it's not the same thing as a live show. It's different. You can't hear everybody laughing at the same time. Yeah, maybe it's because they suck, Dave. Maybe it's because they suck. <laughs> you learned how to do it. I would assume how, how you perform now is exponentially better than how you performed two years ago on zoom what did you learn uh, i mean i guess it's better yeah but it, it, i wouldn't say it's exponentially better it's i think my first shows were very good you know i i i watched a few shows before it was a little similar to like um first starting stand-up you know before oh. i did a show at a club i went and saw shows you know i didn't just have never seen a show before live and then just walk in there so so this is a similar kind of thing because I didn't even I'm like Zoom. I, I'd never heard of Zoom. I, when I think of Zoom, I, I think of a uh, a Super 8 uh, movie uh, camera lens or a kids show from the 1970s. I, I didn't know what uh, Zoom was. And then I watched some shows and I was like, oh, this fucking works. It's the, the same shit, you know. And then I, I talked to some comics and they were saying, oh, you have to wear headphones. You can't do it without headphones. And then I did a show without headphones. So I'm like, that's not fucking true. You can do the show without headphones. And then, um, and then I was, uh, and then they were saying how there's like a bit of a delay on Zoom, and there is, but you, uh, but you get you get used to that because even yeah, when I, doing stand up, when you do stand up at different early, venues, I've I'm played sorry, early, go ahead. What's I know what it, the delay is between the punchline and the audience laughing. <laughs> you know that well. <laughs> You play Arlington, Texas. You're yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, what does it say? So, but it's like it's like there is a little bit of delay on Zoom, but it's it's so normal now. It's like everyone's adapted to it. You know, that would be like saying, like I was talking to some people. It's like um, it's like doing a phoner for a uh, what comics call a phoner for a radio station. Right. That's where instead of having you like in studio you call in and you're you're a guest you know it, it it's 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 like like we're talking on zoom right now people are watching on youtube no one's thinking about what a difficult communication process this is it's it's fucking normal you know that would be like when the phones were first invented and people would be like oh no let's uh i know we're a three-hour drive away but let's uh <laughs> 
let's wait next month to talk in person. This phone stuff is too difficult. Um, you know, it's like it's fucking normal, you know. Right. So um, and then even at venues, every venue is different. You know, some venues are kind of echoey. Some venues are are big and cavernous and it, it takes longer to hear the laughs because they're further away. So it's just it's a minor normal adjustment that no one fucking notices is all I'm saying. So right. and what did take me a while was I, I, I have my own microphone. I've, I'm a comic. I've never owned a microphone before. And, and so I bought a microphone. I had to buy, uh, you know, stuff to all of the recording equipment. I have a, a mic stand. I never had that before. So it's almost like you have to build your own venue at your place and then perform online. So that was kind of like just learning on the fly how to get all this audio equipment and visual equipment and stuff. So that was a learning process. That took a while. But the performing stuff was, thankfully, and, pretty easy. And are you more or as prolific? Obviously, you're as prolific. You're coming well, up. It's, it's interesting. You know, about 20 or so years ago, I lived in L.A. And I remember when I work kind of took me out there for a little bit. And when I was out there, people are always even before I went out there, people were saying, oh, you can't get any stage time. There's no stage time out here. First of all, that's a lie. There's a lot of stage time in L.A. You got to hustle and work harder for it. You got to drive a lot. It's not like New York, where geographically it's a tiny city. L.A. Right. is geographically massive. To get from one place to another can take a while. Um, but but there is, that being said, there is not as much stage time as, as New York. So I wound up doing more work in L.A. off stage than I did in New York off stage. You know, more time working on the material and stuff like that instead of just nonstop performing, coming up with material. So, so now that I'm doing, you know, like in New York City, I'll do, you know, two to five shows a night. Each set is like 15 minutes. Well, now I'm doing, I do my one show a week and I'm doing about 100 minutes on that show. So, and then I'll do 45 minutes on someone else's show. And then sometimes I'll do two of my shows. So I'm, it might be anywhere from two to four hours of sets, uh, stage time a week um so still less than i would like but it's not nothing and for trying out new material zoom is actually quite good yeah uh you have to come back i'm keeping all yeah i know i know you got another guest here i don't want to i'm excited about the idea as we move into the metaverse the idea of comedy clubs where you can be in your underwear and still perform david all this stuff, and you just had to make it creepy. You had to make it creepy, baby. Unbelievable. Now, one of these days, I'll get back to doing shows at venues. One of these days, I'll get back to doing shows at venues. But I will, nevertheless, continue doing shows online because people from all over the world can come and watch and come together. Right. So it's a good thing. Well, everybody should go to judahfriedlander.com and buy tickets. It's pay what you want. Follow Judah at judah world champion and no, judah world champ i'm sorry J judah world champ i apologize yeah. and you can keep your microphone off and your camera off or keep it on during your shows you can lurk or be seen yeah. it's kind of like you can sit in the front row you can sit in the middle or you can sit way in the back where no one will ever see you or hear you but it's kind of like the option i'm going to come Thank you, Judah Friedlander. Please come back. Amazing. Thank you, David. Will do. Much love. Stay safe. Stay sexy, everyone. Winners. Thank you. For me, your brother. Thank you. That was great. That was amazing. He comes uh, loaded for bear. That is amazing. Well, also coming loaded for bear is the Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Sorry to keep you waiting, sir. You are let me just unmute you there here we are here we are so the reverend barry w lynn for nearly a quarter of a century ran americans united for separation church and state because he's a lawyer he's a member of the supreme court bar as well as an ordained minister in the united church of christ i want to get right to it we have hearings for judge jackson 
This is a question I thought of you. This is Senator Lindsey Graham asking Judge Jackson a question, and you tell me what you think of this question. What faith are you, by the way? Senator, I am um, Protestant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Non-denominational. Okay. Could you fairly judge a Catholic? Senator, I have a record of I think the answer would be yes. judging everyone. I believe you can. I'm just <laughs> asking this question because how important is your faith to you? Senator, personally, um, my faith is very important. Um, but as you know, there's no religious test in the Constitution under, under Article 6. Uh, have you ever, Reverend, have you ever seen a question like that asked? I, I'm not a lawyer. Never. Have you ever Never. seen anybody ask a question that? Yeah. So, you know, at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, as with most nonprofits that have an interest in the law, we would be asked by, generally by Democrats on the Judiciary Committee, give us some questions that we can ask the nominee. And we would always give them. And we would never, of course, ask questions like, what is your faith? And then uh, Lindsey Graham went even further by saying a, a little later, uh, well, how many times do you go to church? And then follow Did he really ask that question? Yeah, how many times do you go to church? And then he said, on a scale of one to 10 of religiosity, where do you fit? I mean, it's unbelievable. So we used to say never go into people's religious convictions, but do ask this question. And this question, if it was asked, always got me for good or ill on Bill O'Reilly's show that night. Somebody would say, um, Judge, uh, if you, if you have sincere religious beliefs, can you separate those religious beliefs from your duty as a judge? Just ask that question, and everybody would say, yes, of course. Even Clarence Thomas said that. Of course, uh, he was lying about it, so you don't always get much information. But, but O'Reilly would go ballistic about that. He'd, he'd say, this is not proper. You can't ask people about their religious convictions. Now, Bill O'Reilly, of course, has, has had many troubles. I think he's still on cable, but I don't think I've to my knowledge, ever been invited on. But I'm sure he would listen to that and see nothing wrong with it because he, like virtually everybody on Fox and everybody who's a Republican, is a hypocritical liar. So join the, Lindsey Graham. Did I ever tell you about my one and only appearance on television with Lindsey Graham? No. No. Okay, so one day there had been a decision earlier in the week on a case involving prayer at a high school football game in Texas. And uh, six to three decision, the court said, you can't give students access to the public address system to say a prayer. And the plaintiffs in the case, it was a, a Catholic and a Mormon. And it, so it wasn't even atheists. They just didn't, nobody liked it. Six to three decision. So, uh, What's the all sports channel called? What ESPN. ESPN. ESPN had a show on Sunday mornings about the intersection of sports and religion or sports and culture. So Lindsey Graham and I were on and he tries to explain why it was a terrible decision. And then he goes on to say, I believe, Reverend Lynn, I believe that there're gonna be a lot of people spontaneously standing up in those football stadiums and saying a prayer. And I said, you know, um, he was a Congressman at the time. I said, Congressman, I said, you can do this. You can try to get people to think that there are ways that they can thumb their nose at the Supreme Court decision. But I said, if you're gonna do that, don't be so coy about it. Why don't you just suggest that people train parrots to recite the, word, the Lord's Prayer and then release them over the stadium right. before the game starts. And, and I, you know, he didn't like that, but then again, 
he never liked me much to begin with. Right. But no, it's the hypocrisy, levels of hypocrisy. I got to the point where I couldn't even stand watching the hearings because it was so predictable. Let me play you Lindsey Graham storming out of the hearings, talking about Gitmo and accusing the Democrats of losing wars. It won't bother me one bit if 39 of them die in prison. That's a better outcome than letting them go. And if it costs 500 million to keep them in jail, keep them in jail because they're going to go back to the fight. Look at the friggin' Afghan government. It's made up of former detainees at Gitmo. This whole thing by the left about this war ain't working. Let me also note that Larry Thompson, who served as Deputy Attorney General under President George W. Bush. Where is this left that they speak of? I'd give anything if we had anything resembling a left serving in Washington. Didn't he serve as a jag? Isn't he not a jag? Was he? he he's a, yeah, he was a military lawyer. He's a JAG. Yes. And are they really serving in the military when Bo Biden, God bless him, uh, is an attorney general of Delaware, puts on his flapjack and flies to Iraq to be a, a JAG officer? That's not the same thing as actually going out and getting shot at, right? Well, it depends. It can be dangerous. There are certainly people who serve as lawyers in the military who are in war zones and who uh, are at risk, not necessarily like a frontline infantry person, but um, but but you're right. I mean, he, he, when he talked, he talked about how he served and you would think that the guy was, you know, some Rambo like character who decided he was going to serve. And then he, he makes his stupid statement, forgetting, of course, that when uh, Donald Trump was president, more and more people seem to not want to admit they knew him anymore. But Trump, uh, he was uh, let, negotiating to let the Taliban people out. And they're now in control of most, if not all, of the Afghan government. But Lindsey Graham is so myopic, or he's just a liar, or as many people suggested when he walked out, maybe he was drunk. I mean, I don't know. I can't tell if somebody's drunk if they're sitting in front of me. I don't know if you can tell if somebody's drunk watching them on television. But I mean, it's just, it's the hypocrisy, no, no limits, none during this week, none. Yeah. Well, not according to Mitch McConnell. He said it went great. Mitch McConnell had this to say, about the hearings. The last 48 hours were a dry and friendly legal seminar compared to the circus that Democrats inflicted on the country just a few years back. The American people know it is not asking too much to ask a federal judge legal questions about her record. I just wish the Senate had gotten more answers. Do you, do you see any validity into that, that the Kavanaugh hearings were a circus? He's a rapist. We know he's a rapist. Of course we do. Huh? Yes, of course we know. At least he's a would-be rapist, Kavanaugh, and that he is a drunk. We know that both of those things are true. Right. And it, so much of the drama that was created, because I watched a whole lot of that. It was in, in some s seminar in Boston. But he was, um, he caused the drama. It was, it was Kavanaugh who was weeping. It was Kavanaugh who was making accusations about members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It was he who was screaming about how terrible this was for him. And although I was a little surprised that, uh, that uh, Judge uh, Katani Brown Jackson didn't give some better, clearer, kind of academic answers, at least to the questions being asked by friendly questioners on the Democratic side, that she occasionally would say, well, I'm, I'm not familiar with that case, or I don't remember the details. Most people in prepping for any of these nomination hearings have weeks of preparation with, with uh, actors, you know, people who play uh, various uh, members of the committee, and uh, so I was a 
was a little surprising, but it, did, it didn't matter because, of course, the people asking the questions weren't any more familiar with it. I mean, of all the stupid things that were said, uh, Martha Blackburn, who it literally, I, I think she is literally the dumbest person sitting in the United States Senate. So today, uh, she says, uh, the Constitution grants us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not abortion. That's the Declaration of Independence, I believe. Yes, it is. You know that. Uh, everybody else in that hearing room knew that. She didn't know that. And if her staff wrote that, then that somebody on the staff really ought to go back to elementary school. Did somebody right. correct her? Did somebody correct her? No, to my knowledge, nobody even corrected her. It was so embarrassing. I mean, oh, believe me, on social media, they corrected her instantly. But I don't think any uh, member of the committee, you know, the members of the committee, the Democrats, when, when somebody like Cornyn or Josh Hawley or Ted Cruz would go over their time limit, they would say, your time has expired. And they were just ignored. And um, I mean, this... I, I like Dick Durbin's politics, but I'm not sure that he did a perfect job either uh, serving as the chairman because he didn't shut people up. Well, he you have to be able to say, shut up. Well, let me play you this clip. All right. You tell me whose fault this is, Dick Durbin's or Senator Ted Cruz. You tell me whose fault this is. Just 6,700 images. You come in with 57 Time months. Time has expired. Why Senators did you send two minutes over just the 57 months in the Stewart case? Do you want to address that? Because you're claiming it's cherry picking. In fact, you're welcome to explain any of these cases, but let's take the Stewart case. Why Coons, did you sentence him for half the amount? You're not recognized, Senator, Senator you, Coons. You don't want her to answer that question? You wouldn't allow her any. Mr. Chairman, she may answer the question. I've asked her why she sentenced Stewart. You've gone over the time, Senator, by two minutes. Why she? And a half. Because you've interrupted me for two minutes, Mr. Chairman. Will you allow her to answer the question, or do you not want the American people to hear <laughs> why, with someone she described as well, an egregious? You know, there comes a point, Senator, where you get a little bit. Chairman Durbin, hand. will you allow her to answer the question? You won't allow her to answer. I, the I, I will happily allow her to. The question is Senator, why you think proceed, you sentenced Chairman. Stewart, an egregious child pornography possessor. So, to, to half of the amount Please, Senator. requested by the prosecutor. Please, Senator. Will you allow her to a answer the question, Chairman Durbin? Senator Coons. Well, why are you not allowing her to answer the question? There's You're not another the senator here that you've half. not allowed her to answer the question. You're I'm not asking another question, but allow her to answer the question, Chairman Durbin. Thank you, well, Chairman Durbin. Why do you not want the American people to know what happened in the Stewart case or any of these cases? Chairman Durbin, I've never seen the chairman refuse to allow a witness to answer a question. You can bang it as loud as you want. Well, I can just tell you, at some point, you have to follow the rules. Okay, well, you let her answer the question. You've, you've been uh, interrupting. Me? And by the way, with Senator Graham, it went 10 minutes over. You've sure taken did. a big chunk of the time. Will you allow her to answer a question? You've given her Why no are you afraid of her? Answer. She's welcome to answer it right now. Will you let her? Senator Coons. Will you let, so no, you don't want her to answer the question? Senator Coons. Will you let her answer Thank the question? Chairman Durbin. Apparently, Judge we're Jeff. very afraid of the American people hearing the answer to that question. We here in the Senate, in this committee today, are in the middle of a policy fight. Now, if you're, if you're a woman, you know exactly who Ted Cruz is. If you're a woman, you have been once, and I hope just once, in a relationship with Ted Cruz. You, you know exactly who Ted Cruz is. Every woman in America, I hope once and never knew, and then knew when to meet another guy. No, 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 no. I'm going. Yeah. You know, not only did Ted Cruz, I mean, Ted Cruz is, I don't think he's as dumb as Senator Blackburn, but I do think I mean, he's a, a contemptible human being, and there's no question about him. And him, I, I, I had a debate with him at the press club once. He, did you have dinner with him and Heidi? Yes, I did. And, and how does he treat Heidi? 
His you know, wife. Someone else on a show once asked me that question, saying, uh, I feel sorry for Heidi. And I said to the guy, I, I think it was uh, on Fugelsang's show once, I said, don't be sorry for her because she's as, at least as obnoxious as he is. They sat around at this dinner. It was Joanne and I, Cruz and Heidi, and uh, the guy who set the whole thing up. And they never, you could not say anything where he didn't want to start an argument, where he didn't want to, if you wow. said, he had no interest. He didn't want to talk about his children. He didn't want to talk about the weather. He wouldn't want to talk about sports. All he wanted to do was have an argument with Joanne or I about anything we said. He, right. He's just a jerk and a half. Right. And speaking of, women who know of the Ted Cruz, you do know that Ted Cruz was in Montana over the weekend at a conference and he was late to get on the airplane and they didn't let him on. So he started screaming. And finally he said, don't you know who I am? And I think it, if, I, if you did know who he was, you'd say, not only are we not letting you on the airplane now, we're never letting you on any airplane, and you can stay in Montana for the rest of your life. That's what right. you would have said. Right. United, and they called the cops. They did. They did. They called the cops on him. He's become insufferable. Back to this thing, he's like a cutter, where he only feels alive if he's either cutting himself or cutting somebody the, the idea that he lives for a fight he lives for the argument he does he's not a loving person you know you can feel alive by loving someone or a pet he feels alive by reducing somebody intellectually that's what he learned and he's religious he's part of the religious right ted cruz his yeah, father is a minister his father is still alive and is a, is a minister. I don't know what his religious teachings lead him to do, but I'm not aware of any religion that leads you to be as big of a jerk as Ted Cruz. And maybe, maybe there's a church out there called Church of Jerks, and he's a <laughs> member of it. And, and I, I, I wouldn't, I'd give them the same advice I would give the Church of Feldman, which, it, which you never take, which is, just write a letter to the Internal Revenue Service to declare yourself a church and you will be granted 501c3 tax exempt status. And then I don't have to pay taxes. No, you don't have to pay taxes. And um, he wouldn't have to pay taxes either. He's not in favor of taxes either. I guess he kind of he, he's eliminated that uh, section of the not only of the Christian Bible, but of the Torah itself. Right. It suggests that you ought to be responsible for somebody in the community, not just yourself. Right. He you skipped that. Like if there's a cold snap, you don't hop a plane to Mexico. That's right. That's, yeah. uh, but um, That's not the Christian he, thing to do. No, I don't think so. Uh, unless he was perhaps trying to go, I think it was in Cancun, and I'm sure there were a lot of spring breakers, and maybe he was trying to convert them to the Church of Cruz. Right. And Just speculation on my yeah. part. Does he know he's despicable? What, what is going, is it, how much of it is faith? He, he thinks he's religious, right? He thinks but, he's got... Yes, he thinks he's religious, and if you... If you were watching the hearings on C-SPAN, he as soon as he got done with one of these speeches, he, he pulled out his phone, you know, and he and he he started to look to see see how his reviews were coming in. Wow! <laughs> and so, I mean, there's just nothing about this guy that is anything anything close to human decency. Zero. And of course, you know, he went off on other things. Uh, he um, it, it, it was it was a, a, an S show. I don't want to use that word because it got so much trouble for using the S word once. Say it like it is. That was a shit show. Yeah, that's that's right. That was somebody else saying that. But Damn it was that. This was the worst 
But, but one, there's one good thing that comes out of this. You now look at all these people, several of whom, including Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, who we haven't even talked about yet, who do want to get the nomination. They expect that there will be a, a crashing blow in the support for Donald Trump, and that therefore they're going to be the Republican candidate for president in 2024. And this is tryout time. You know, this is... Uh, <laughs> It's interesting, Mo Brooks, who Mo Brooks, the congressman from Alabama, lawyer, stood on the ellipse uh, on January 6th in a flap jacket. He was wearing a bulletproof vest, and he said, now is the time to start kicking ass and taking names and get in there. He has since said that we should move on past the, the stolen election. Trump rescinded his nomination, accused Mo Brooks of being woke. I know. Yep. And well, if Mo Brooks is woke. Uh, maybe I'm going to rethink being woke because uh, I used to think it was a good thing. If Mo Brooks is woke. There's something wrong with yeah. the ideology. Something like but that. He looks good. It looks like Mo has stopped drinking. He lost a little weight. Do we root for Mo Brooks because he's no longer. No, even no, but he um, he reminds me of certain other candidates who who say and do these stupid things, then they get the nomination, and then by a few percentage points they lose to some Democrat in a kind of unexpected race. I wish Mo Brooks was the Senate candidate from his state because then I think it would be easy for any corporate Democrat, maybe not a Bernie Sanders of the South. I don't know that there is any there, but he, um, yeah, I, I wish Mo Brooks, it's like Greitens, you know, this guy that the legal documents came out, he's, he's from Missouri, he's in this very tight race, he's, he was the forerunner. A couple of days ago, they released parts of the transcripts of a, uh, of a spousal abuse hearing and the guy's a terrible human being. So people go, we let's let's make sure he's not the candidate. I say let's make sure he is the candidate because then any any Democrat with a, a modicum of intelligence and ability to read an audience is going to be able to defeat him and flip Missouri blue. Right. He's been accused. I want, the worst, I want the worst possible Republicans to be nominated by their party. I would think of be, becoming a Republican myself just so I could vote for somebody. But, you know, in this District of Columbia, we don't have any senators, so I can't vote for anybody. I think your wish already came true six years ago. I think that already happened with the. Uh, uh, let me. I have a clip here. Sure. What? I have the Mo Brooks clip. Oh, okay. This was this is what getting into bed with uh, Donald Trump gets you. This is uh, where am I? This is Mo Brooks being a loyal servant to. Uh, let me find it. Hang on, I'm trying to do a professional show here. Hang on. This is what Mo Brooks said on January 6. If I can find it. Oh come on! This is. Damn it, Professor uh, Reverend! Can you say a prayer for my show? I would say a prayer for your show. I would say a prayer. Um, yes, yeah. let, let us let us pray that the gods of electronics. We don't have a prayer here. Faithfully uh, on the David Feldman show and help him do what could be a very difficult, but possibly is and actually fairly easy thing to do find a clip and this play it. So, he's sad. so many of them already tonight it's so sad that i can't i i i just I, this is all right forget it all right you quoted him accurately yeah you quoted him but i want to the show he did. here I we go i want to find okay i found it <laughs> no, what? Hang on. <laughs> and kicking ass! 
Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. All right. Just wanted the show to seem somewhat professional there. Now I feel better. Wait, has he been talking to the truckers? I'm now? sorry? Has Bo Brooks been talking to the truckers? I, uh, I drove into Washington uh, this week, and this was the first week when the truckers actually tried to not just circle the beltway and cause problems, but actually come into the District of Columbia and they, they have their air horns on all the time. And it's, it's the same thing they did uh, for the Black Lives Matter and the, and the Women's March uh, last summer. They come in, they block traffic, they make a huge amount of noise. And then when they're questioned about why they're there, they don't really know. They, they originally were gonna come to end the mandate for masks of course uh, virtually are no mandates for masks anymore around here so uh, then they decided they were going to worry about what's being taught in schools and then when they didn't understand what was being taught in schools then they said well we're actually coming to take back black lives matter plaza down in the center of washington dc but they didn't get in very far into because the police to their credit uh, didn't let them come in. So if they think this is the way you, you gain a cause, this is the way you block traffic, this is what Bob Dole thought he was going to do once when he in, encouraged farmers to drive their tractors from outside of Washington into downtown Washington one morning, and it was a, a total disaster. I mean, it, then they parked on the grassy areas around the Lincoln Memorial and dug up the grass, causing tens of thousands, maybe hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. This was not a very good way for him to start his campaign for the White House. This so was what not. What do people do? I don't. What do they do? Who tells people the best thing you can do? Go in there. Don't don't explain what you're protesting, but just disrupt traffic. Now that. That's a great recipe for disaster. You're right, because I've been saying that if the left could get the Teamsters on their side, we could just shut down commerce until Wall Street bended to our will. You're suggesting that it would backfire. Yeah, I have a feeling it would uh, backfire. I mean, this is a good city it's such a democratic city and relatively speaking, a progressive city. And um, so th there's a kind of built in animosity to people who are going to make life more difficult, make right. it more difficult for you to go to your, to your kid's school to pick her up or pick him up at the end of the day. We don't like this stuff. The, the traffic's terrible enough in the Washington DC area. You know, I missed my radio show at KP in LA at KPFK. I, I was four hours late for my radio show KPFK in Los Angeles about eight years ago because President Obama was in town doing a fundraiser at David Geffen's house. And they literally shut down all of Los Angeles so President Obama could raise money. And I'm thinking, this is a blue state because I was, you know, you know, we, in New York, they shut everything down when Obama, when the president is speaking at the UN, everything comes to a halt. But for a fundraiser? Are you kidding me? They shut it down here too. I'm sorry? When you're talking about a blue state, was this some kind of reference to the fact that you had a red face sitting in the car for four hours? Yes, so you're going to play on red and blue. Very good. I'm just, yeah, I mean, they uh, Geffen and Obama should have been red faced, but they just they take the Democratic vote for granted. They assume California's blue no matter who. So guess what, folks? You're going to sit in traffic for five hours so we can have a party at David Geffen's. The arrogance on their part. But you know the Democrats 
if you're going to run for president, if you're a governor somewhere, they ask you what kind of context you have in California and New York, because that's where all the money is. There is no money to speak of in Iowa or North Dakota for anybody, and certainly not for Democrats in the last decade. Which is why I support the Electoral College. I know its roots are in racism, segregation, and slavery. But you get rid of the Electoral College, the candidates are going to sit in New York and California, maybe Chicago and Florida, and raise money and then take out ads, and they will be more out of touch than they already are. At least there's a filtration process where they have to go to Iowa, and well, unless you're Hillary, uh, in which case you don't, but where you have to go to the, the Rust Belt and actually meet these people. You get rid of the Electoral College, they're not stepping foot in yeah. Montana. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think the the better solution is just to uh, cut a lot of states out of having two senators. I mean, there's no reason in God's green earth or the green earth, if you're not a theist, there's no reason to have two senators in a state like Wyoming. There is no reason to have two senators in a place like North or South Dakota. As yes, we said right. a few weeks ago, uh, it used to be that you could get elected in though. You could get a Democrat. You could, we had Jim Averesk and George McGovern at the same time in the Senate from the state of South Dakota. Tom Daschle, who worked for both of those people, later was elected a senator, became uh, you know, the ma majority leader of the Senate then. I mean- A bad one. Yeah, but he, well- yeah. Bad. Bad. He's now a lobbyist. He could have well, yeah. stopped. He could have stopped Iraq from happening. Yes, there are many bad things about it. But trust me, the senators from the state of South Dakota sitting there right now are worse than Tom Daschle ever could have been or was. Yes, because the senators from New York and California are so bad. That's why the senators from North Dakota and South Dakota are so bad. You need senators in North Dakota and South Dakota to protect North Dakota and South Dakota from senators like Chuck Schumer, who would let Wall Street ravage those states, just mine it and drill it. You, you know. Yeah, I, well, we're getting a little off tangent here, but I, I, no, I obviously know where you're going with this, but but the, the the financial dealings of these Republicans from the upper Midwest are themselves horrendous. They they never saw a tax they didn't want to cut. They never saw a social program they didn't want to cut. And uh, for all of and I I certainly hope Schumer is primary, but because he's he's just useless. And as you saw, Nancy Pelosi, of course, just 24 hours ago, announced that she was going to support all incumbents, including that character, the only House member who is a Democrat who is anti-choice when it comes to abortion. She's taking his side in his primary uh, election against a, a genuinely progressive woman candidate. Can I just go back? Can I go back? to the Electoral College yep. and each state getting two senators. Sure. And then we'll move on. America is a colonizing state. We, we spread from the 13 colonies on the East Coast and just go West, young man, manifest destiny, white man's burden. We're going to take over the entire continent. We're moving. Well, there were people who settled these territories. They had a vote to join the United States. There were not the indigenous peoples. They didn't really have much to say. But the people 
de decided whether or not to become part of the union. And we made promises to people in North Dakota. We made promises to people in Wisconsin, to these settlers, that if you join, if you vote to join, if you don't vote to join, we're going to just invade you and <laughs> you're going to you're going to be a state. That's but but we're going to have an election. And here's why you should join. You will have two votes in the Senate. And you will be somewhat represented in the Electoral College. We would be going back on the promises that we made to these states. That's why they joined. They wouldn't have joined the union if if they were going to be subject to majoritarian rule. Um, why? Let me ask you this. But I mean, it is fair. It is fair. That's a fair comment. But I think that when you, it's subsumed by the damage that the Electoral College does to the idea of one person, one vote, which is also a central promise made, at least since the Civil War, to everybody who lives here. So you see Hillary Clinton lose, Al Gore lose, just because they, although they got the majority of votes, they had to go through the filter of the Electoral College. And that filter turns out to be a really, really ultra conservative one. Why is Texas so conservative? It used to be blue. Why is it gone conservative? Is that because of systemic blocks that prevent Democrats from winning? Or is there a problem with the Democratic Party in Texas? Is there a problem with the Democratic Party in Michigan and Wisconsin? I think the problem is the Democrats, not the game. The, the, the game was set up, the rules were set up, all these hyper-educated graduates of Harvard and Yale who rule the Democratic Party. They know the rules of the game. That's why they got into Harvard and Yale and Stanford. And when it comes to winning in North Dakota, South Dakota, I, we, it's not fair. Where's my trophy? How about you move to South Dakota? How about you live in South Dakota? How about Bill and Hillary stay in Arkansas and keep that state blue? No, they had to move to New York. They had to stay in New York. They, they abandoned the, I'll never leave you. I'm your governor. I'll never leave there. They were out the door. Why should the people of Arkansas trust a Democrat when the gut, I, I believe Bill Clinton was the most reelected governor of Arkansas in Arkansas history, I think. I believe that's true. And he hightailed it out of there and he never came back. And Al Gore couldn't win in Tennessee. Mr. Harvard couldn't even win his home state in Tennessee. The problem, dear Brutus, is not within the system. It's within ourselves. I spoke in a couple places in Tennessee right shortly after the, the election. Every progressive democratic activist that I talked to, everyone who had a comment on it said, if Al Gore hadn't told Bill Clinton to stay out of Tennessee, the Democrats would have won Tennessee. So, I mean, I, Bill Clinton, just, just hearing him opine about Madeleine Albright over the last 48 hours on every network was horrifying enough. But, um, and God's joke is Bill Clinton still married, Al Gore's divorced. Yeah, yeah. Well, a, a, a Tipper, um, you know, Tipper was, she was very upset. She was very much a, a, a figure in something called the Parents Music Resource Center. Right. And she was upset because she, she claimed that the, the turning point in her musical career was when she heard a, a, a song I think it was a Prince song about masturbation. And she was very upset. I would like to think that she was more upset when she found out that Al was having an affair. 
But who knows? Who am I to judge? She went after Frank Zappa, I believe. Oh, yes, yes, yes. She, she went after she went after everybody. You know, when they had hearings on that subject, then we'll get back to something contemporary, but when they had hearings on that, they had John Denver testify. And I knew John Denver, and he was a he was a very troubled man. A lot but of guns. A lot of guns. He he was a he had a lot of guns, he had a lot of women, he had a lot of alcohol, but a lot of weapons. They they asked him, why why have you been censored? And he said, because people thought Rocky Mountain High was a drug song. <laughs> That's how much people in the Senate know about music. And we right. know what they know about the internet, which is nothing. So yeah, we need a whole new Senate. We need big decisions. Somebody in the chat room, I know I'm not supposed to be looking at it, but said one of the things when we were talking about the making, uh, creating traffic conflict. What about a general strike? You know, that's a good idea because it, it shows a solidarity between people who work in any area that is or should be unionized. And I think, I, I think it's going to be a long time coming, but I think that would send a positive message, not a bad one. Yeah. Although I'm old enough to remember New York City, which when I was a kid was riddled with strikes mm. and it turned a lot of people off to the union movement when garbage wasn't getting collected yeah. and the trains weren't running and people, oh, these unions, these unions. Uh, I'm all for general strike. I'm all for unions, but we don't have enough people in unions to bring about the solidarity, the sacrifice that comes with a strike. Well, that's, that's right. you might be able to do a three day general strike and might send a, a message like, think your garbage could smell worse on day four, five, or six. Maybe you ought to think about doing something for us. You know, nurses um, should go on strike. Well, the nurses well, in America should go on strike. Well, well so, some nurses did. But I so, mean, like, a day without nurses. Yeah, that would be. Unless I get sick. Unless I get sick. You know, I, I, there'd be a lot. It'd be a, a footnote unless Feldman gets I sick. get a carve out. Feld, the Feldman carve out. No, but the rest of you. No, no, let me see. Let me see how electronically savvy you are. I okay. sent to you. Yes. This afternoon, a picture. And I would like you to show it because to me, this is the most disgusting attempt at humor that I have ever seen. Then you don't watch my show. I mean, you I, just I, I, go I, in I, here. I just, I, I go on YouTube and watch your old stand-up days. I, I watch your appearances on Letterman. You, this, this, hang on for one second. Hang on. All right, so I, I think I have it. I'm trying to make this show really professional. I know. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, here we go. I'm going to drag this into the camera. Let's see if it works. Oh, it worked. Yeah. yeah. So what is this? That is a, a, a meme that someone created on Twitter, widely distributed. And when I saw it, I thought, this is such an insult to women. And because it, it indicates that if you happen to be a woman who is not conventionally beautiful, then you can be ridiculed. And someone responded and said, well, it's really an insult to Russian women because there are, the, the very phrase mail order brides bothers me, but there are people who do in fact get wives, I don't think they're husbands, well, maybe there's transporting husbands too, from other countries. And that can be beneficial to everyone. And then whatever this says, and I'm not sure what it says about the transgender community, I think it's not good. 
I think this is insulting. This is not, these are not drag queens. That's what they're probably supposed to be. But I know drag queens, and I'm sure you do, and many listeners do. They chose to do that as an entertainment form, a form of art. These people, whoever made this, just wanted to ridicule these four guys. And there are plenty of things that they do and say that are ridiculous. But this picture really offends me. Okay. May I disagree with you, sir? Of course you can. Okay. So for our listeners, it says Russian male, male order brides, Russian male order brides. And it's Lindsey Graham, Bill Barr, Mitch McConnell, and Donald Trump. And their faces have been plastered over the bodies of women. And they have female, you know, hair that, you know, uh, you know. Um, I think you're wrong because all four of them don't approve of drag queens. They don't approve of cross-dressing. They ridicule the transgender community. So to dress them up as women is uh, cruel to their belief system. That's the first thing. Men dressing up as women has been funny since the ancient Greeks. Uh, now I, I I'm, who, who is it? Who are they funny for? In the ancient Greeks, do you think that men and women equally thought it was funny to have men dress up like women? Just a question. Do you think women were offended by seeing men dressed up like women? Well, right I, now, I mean, you have drag queens who are celebrated in our culture for being men who dress up like women. Yes. They compete. The LGBTQ community to do that. They don't they don't have their pictures plastered here in this way, which I still maintain is incredibly insulting. So it's saying Not these four nitwits, but to the who whoever thought this was whoever created this. You're probably right. Because what you're saying is if you're a woman, you're less than. And they, and they make, as you say, they're conventionally unattractive women. So, uh, you know. Judge, go ahead. No, no, I, 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 I hear you. I think, I think we're all, I think culture is a work in progress. And it's worth discussing that a lot of things that we thought were funny 20 years ago are now abhorrent. Uh, so I get what you're saying, but it's an ongoing uh, discussion. And, and pe- what I think that we shouldn't hold people in, accountable for things that were funny 20 years ago, but are no longer considered funny. So, uh, and that's why protest is so important. Uh, Jay Leno used to do horrible jokes about Asians, about them eating cats and dogs. And I knew it was wrong when I was writing for Late Night 25, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, he was doing them. We all knew it was wrong. He, but nobody, he didn't care. Uh, But there were some jokes that people did 20 years ago that the the protests weren't loud enough for comedians to know uh, it was wrong. For example, I used to make jokes about Ann Coulter being a man. That was considered, this was 10 years ago. I was wrong. I didn't know it was wrong. And then somebody explained to me by saying Ann Coulter is a man, you're denigrating um, uh, 
women and and transgender people so i oh okay but i didn't know i should have known but i didn't okay so i'm writing those jokes now well i'm sorry you're not writing those jokes now you're not writing jokes Kim Davis, remember her? She was in the news uh, back in 2016 when, as a clerk, Kim Davis. Oh, she, she wouldn't married. certify gay marriages. Yeah, and there's, there's a lawsuit recently. Um, you're, you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Um, Can you talk louder? Yeah, she was. Um, she's been ordered to pay damages to the couples that she refused to marry. This was just a few days ago. And Kim Davis, again, is not a conventionally attractive person, and she has a troubled marital history. And I spoke at the NOW Convention, the National Organization for Women's Convention in 2016, and Kim Davis was in the news, and she was the butt of a lot of jokes because of her appearance or her multiple marriages. And I said to the crowd of women there, mostly women there, this is beneath us. We should never ever criticize someone. There she is, uh, Kim Davis, because of her appearance or because of the number of marriages she had. And of course, it, it got a lot of applause as it should have. But I think now I wouldn't be surprised if late night, some late night, particularly Fox late night, although she's so conservative, maybe they wouldn't insult her. Uh, don't go again trying to make uh, distinctions. Uh, before we wrap this I address up. that for a second? Yeah, oh, we're out of time. Uh, I worked on a show and we savaged Kim Davis. And the thinking was, this is a woman who refuses to allow same sex couples to marry. All gloves are off. You by any means necessary, you hurt these people comedically. That's but that's my opinion that if if these people I hear you, but I just think, let me make one other observation. Go back think, to where I we think started. This, Reverend? Yeah. I think you're getting high on your own stuff. No. no. Listen, I think you're beginning I, to, I think you've listen, read the scriptures, and I think it's getting to your head. Let's go back to the hearings. The one area you didn't talk about okay. was uh, Marsha Blackburn's question to Judge Jackson, can you define a woman? And most people just thought that's a, a stupid question because what, what did she expect the answer to be? But it's not. It's based on the idea, she, she, these judges, including Cruz and Marsha Blackburn, have claimed to be originalists. In the original constitution, it doesn't mention the word woman. And when the 14th Amendment was adopted, it also doesn't mention the word woman. So if you're truly an originalist, what you want to believe is that women are the same as men. A married woman has no independent existence because that's what the common law was back in the 1800s, even in the United States. So it was a malicious question. It was a stupid question. And I'm glad that uh, Judge Jackson didn't answer it. Great. Now, somebody wrote me and said that, I, that you wanted me to do a religious right person of the week every week. And I yeah. have one. I'm going to do this quick. Well, we had Ted Cruz. Now, uh, Lindsey Graham, I told you the story about the parrots. No, this is more significant. A guy died recently named Gary North. He was one of the two most important creators of something called Christian Reconstructionism. Christian Reconstructionism isn't just being a conservative. It's believing that literally all of the laws in the Bible should be the laws followed in the United States. So that means uh, you should be executed for fornication. You should be executed for blasphemy. And... There are circumstances under which you should be executed by the community through the act of stoning. And I am not making this up. Gary North wrote in one of his books that there are five reasons why you should use stoning to kill these recalcitrant people. Stones are plentiful. 
so everyone can take part since there are lots of stones that ought to be thrown. Nice communal event. Communal Good. event. The death cannot be traced to a single person. This, of course, was also the justification for using firing squads because no right. one could be personally responsible. Right. It promotes a collective response to crime prevention. That gets back Sounds to the community thing. I don't like that. It sounds like socialism. Yeah, it does. And finally, stoning is symbolic of God crushing the head of Satan. I rest my case. Well, I is the religious right not of the weak. Well, wait a second. Are you, are you against stoning? Yeah, I am. Not being stoned necessarily, although I rarely do that. But yeah, when you when you when you look at our criminal justice system. And, and the current state of our prisons, don't you think stoning would be more, ben or maybe pebbling? But how about pebbling? pebbling. Yeah. But the other possibility would be to have people walk in their bare feet over pebbles. That's annoying. To get a pebble in your shoe, it's so annoying. So maybe we should just put pebbles into the feet of low level drug dealers instead of putting them in jail. Uh, they should have to walk on pebbles. I agree with you on that point. And I if always they, love to end on a, a point of agreement. Yeah. I got to tell you, if they bring back stoning, within a week, I'll need Tommy John surgery. <laughs> I will be out there every day. Every day. And uh, unlike Sandy Koufax, Yom Kippur, I'm throwing on Yom Kippur. Believe me, there's some people, Reverend, who need to, who need a nice stoning. They're, uh, they're, I'm, I'm taking notes about this, and I, I, I'll discuss it next week. Let's bring back stoning. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn is a member of the Supreme Court Bar. He is an attorney. He's also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. And that's why, for nearly a quarter of a century, he ran Americans united for separation of church and state which like uh, the life the uh, pursuit of uh, happiness what is it what did she say life, liberty, and the pursuit. what it life liberty and the pursuit of happiness separation of church and state is not in the constitution it's the first amendment but it's not the term separation of church and state no, that's, that's, you know a fair trial isn't there either a fair trial no, so, so fair trial, no separation of church and state, no life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, uh, men should be, uh, married women shouldn't have any rights at all. No, you're right. That's in but, the Constitution. That's what the Constitution says. And you're a strict contextualist, I believe? Strict textualist. It's more complex than that, but we don't have any more time. Goodbye. Sometime okay. I'll explain how I would interpret the Constitution. Okay. Okay. The same way you interpret the Bible, pretty much. It's a little easier to do the Constitution than the Bible. The Bible was written for so many people, and it has so many inconsistencies. And then, as I once said on the show, the two worst ways you can make policy in the United States is originalism and Bible literalism, because they're both faulty ways to explore the text. Okay. Thank you, Reverend Barry Thank W. Lynn. Go to barrywlynn.com for a treasure trove of the Reverend's appearances on Firing Line, Crossfire, Crossfire Hurricane, this show, John Fugel sang, sermons, writings. There's a book coming out, barrywlynn.com. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you very much. Stay out of trouble. Only good trouble. Before we go to the professors and Marianne, we have Joe in Norway who's making nookie. I, I hate to be spicy and irreverent but usually he's cooking something uh, uh on his cabbage cam but i got a note that he's going to treat us 
to him making Rookie. So you want to turn on? I mean, it, if there are any, it's late here on the East Coast. So if there are any kids around, I don't think it would be appropriate to watch Joe in Norway making Nookie. But uh, so are you going to do be making Nookie all by yourself? How are you going to do this? Uh, I'm going to try. We'll see. I'm a little bit under the weather, so we'll see how far I get along. Oh, okay. So who are you going to be making Nookie with? Uh, uh, with the professors and Marianne. Okay. We'll be making, I'll be I, making. I see a lot of toys. Get... I see a lot of toys. What are you? <clears throat> this is exciting. We've got, we've got p- potatoes and gnocchi <laughs> with, with, with flour. So we switch from cabbage to potatoes finally. So we're off the cabbage for a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's one of the quickest pastas to make. It's potato and gnocchi without any egg. This is one kilo of potatoes with um, 200, 250 grams of flour. And then I'm going to make a cilantro or coriander pesto with um, cashew. And I found we had some wonderful baby asparagus. So I'll make that. With okay, I stand corrected. I, I, it was a misprint. It's gnocchi you're making. Gnocchi, gnocchi. Gnocchi with pesto and asparagus. And this is, everybody's so happy. Well, okay. And he does it in, in an hour. It's pretty amazing. So thank you, Joe, in Norway. Do we have uh, any openings for office hours tomorrow night? People should sign up, right? If they have something. Uh, there's, there's just a few in Saturday afternoon. Saturday afternoon, there's a few. Well, otherwise, we're all booked. Great. We have a special guest here on The Professors and Mary Ann. Rachel Ventura has been here before. She's running for office. And Mary Ann Cummings, Professor Mary Ann Cummings, why don't you introduce her? And, and I look forward to a, a new uh, iteration of The Professors and Mary Ann. This is exciting. Yeah, uh, great to see you, Rachel. Um, I've known Rachel for several years. She's been part of the Bernie Bro Network that came out of Bernie Sanders' campaign. You were a delegate, I think, to the uh, 2016 convention. I think that's where I might have met you. Um, but like a lot of us, uh, you know, we didn't hang around and mope. Well, some of us moped a little, but. A lot, of, a lot of others got back to work and um, started running for office ourselves. And Rachel took on establishment Democrat on the Will County Board and won. Um, on this, as elected board member, she took on all the interests that uh, you know, funded both Democrats and Republicans. She helped to secure clean water for uh, 800 families, I think, living around Fairmont. Um, she, I think um, Will County uh, got the greenest region compact, became the second county in Illinois to, to develop that. Maybe you can like explain uh, what that is a little later. In 2020, she decided because of our shared you know, commitment to the, to the environment, to tackling uh, the greenhouse gas situation and a whole slew of other social inequities, um, she decided to take on Bill Foster in the then 11th uh, Congressional District of Aurora. Bill Foster, uh, old friend of mine actually, I've known him since the 1980s, uh, but you know, unfortunately, and I, he, is part of the problem. He effectively bought his seat and won spending $2 million outspending us uh, uh, something like 12 to one or 15 to one, barely won that race by less than 400 votes against John Lash, somebody else, someone else you've had on your show. So yes, we're talking about, you know, really steep hills to climb and Rachel got 42% of that vote. And that was a very, that was very encouraging working on that campaign because there were so many people just, you know, wanting desperately a change and just enthusiastic as hell when they found out about her. Unfortunately, it's a big district. I mean, they do not make it easy to run against incumbents, but uh, 
Rachel decided to do it again this year. She's running for state Senate. And, and that's particularly good because uh, what seemed to be like an uh, indomitable fortress of democratic uh, machinery and corruption seems to have come crumbling down in the last couple of, uh, last few months, really, but in the last year. So, you You're know, you all. So uh, Rachel is, we are, are sure she is going to make it to the state Senate and she will be a leader there. So um, anyway, with that intro and my feelings about her, she's only, she and Bernie would be about the only two people on this planet I would go out in like five degree weather knocking on doors for signatures, you know. How about Nina Turner? You did it for Nina Turner. I did it, I, I did it in really pleasant weather. <laughs> Anyway, you I, I, but I'll do it for Nina Turner too, I guess. Um, but I'll tell you, it was brutal, you know, because we our, our, our primaries are in June, it was pushed back. You usually are out there in the months of October and November getting signatures, which are, you know, pleasant actually. So, right. Anyway, without further ado, Rachel, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David, for having me on. Thank you, Marianne, for that great introduction. And yes, Marianne is quite the trooper coming out, uh, constantly going back to her walk list until she had everybody covered. So not many of our volunteers are that dedicated, but um, thank you so much, Marianne. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that last part you said um, about the democratic machinery, uh, at least having cracks in it. I don't know that it faltered yet, but I will say that nature abhors a vacuum and that's exactly what's happening in Illinois. There is uh, some very serious power plays happening. Um, the seats at the top, all the way down to seats at the bottom. Uh, one really amazing thing that came out of my 2020 run against Bill Foster was how many volunteers had come onto that race who are now running for office themselves. So that's super exciting. Uh, I am running in the Illinois 43rd district. It is an open seat currently. So what should have been uh, you know, an easy seat to walk into. You know, I went to the party. I asked them for their support. I asked to help us in a tough election year, bring together moderates and progressives uh, for the seat. So many people wanted to see me in it. And of course, the party decided to run someone against me, someone who has never run for office before. Now they asked over a dozen people to run against me and they finally found someone to say yes. Many people said no, um, you know, that they, they would be supporting me. So instead of taking this opportunity, to um, you know, bring a party together to actually do something for the people. Uh, it's the same old, same old. Uh, but what's cool about this is all those volunteers who uh, worked my race before are now running. So just about every county board seat in my district, um, in the 43rd district, they all had primaries with the establishment as well. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna rock this, not just at the state level, but the county level. And this is how you implement the movement of change. And I really do want to see the Democratic Party be the party of the people, not that of the bought and paid for uh, politicians that we've had. And I think this is the year with Michael Madigan being indicted in the trials and several other elected officials having their own legal problems. It is so important that we put ethical people in office honest people who are going to use our tax dollars to actually serve the people. And yes, that sounds like socialism because that is the best parts of our government are the socialistic parts of it. Right. I have a very important question to ask you, and then I'll open it up to our panel of brilliant professors. But this is very important. What is your middle name? Faith. <laughs> Faith. And that's why everybody should go to Rachel fventura.com her website is rachel f ventura the f is for faith rachel f ventura.com r-a-c-h-e-l f for faith ventura v-e-n-t-u-r-a.com and donate what is the limit on state senate five thousand and so give five thousand dollars right now <laughs> or five dollars and you will feel good i promise yes. you give her five dollars you are investing in our future you cannot change the world until you change our government rachel ventura is endorsed by professor marianne cummings and that's all you need to know go to rachel <laughs> 
fventura.com. I believe you're endorsed by Howie Klein from Blue America, at least when you were running for Congress, you were. Yes, I am endorsed uh, this time around by uh, Howie Klein with Blue America. I'm in, endorsed by Catch Fire, which is a group of in, in progressives. I'm endorsed by Kane County progressives as well as uh, Schomburg progressives. Um, Congresswoman Marie Newman has endorsed me uh, as well as a number of organizations here locally, but they are all people and organizations who want to make sure our government is working for the people. So your $5 will be a part of all of their $5 and this is how we do it. And again, here's my promise to you. Go to Rachel fventura.com her name is rachel faith ventura i promise you if you give her five dollars there'll be a spring in your step you you watch television and you feel powerless you want to you can't change the channel because no matter what you're looking at you see the same thing it's climate catastrophe war evictions people in government not paying attention to the people in need. You can change what you see on television for $5. Go to rachelfventura.com. That's how you change the world. That's how you change the world by donating to people like Rachel F. Ventura. Let's start uh, with our panel of professors. Professor Ann Lee, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Hi, hi, Rachel. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Oh. Uh, I'm very excited to take it, drill down and, and take a look at your website. I, I found, I, I'm not sure who, who you're running against because uh, for some reason I thought you're, you're going to be the Terminator against John Connor, but is that the person you're running against? Oh, darn, so I had <laughs> that whole bit worked out. Anyway, <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate all, all of your issues. I think that, uh, you know, they're all the, the ones that are incredibly important, ones that are family issues um, and uh, environmental issues. And uh, there's an interesting one on development, I think that you have, but uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, a Kansas City warehousing company that's, uh, that's trying to move into your area. How do you think that's going to, to work in your campaign? Yeah, so before I do that, I think I missed the opportunity to say, I'll be back. <laughs> Oh, there we go. <laughs> but uh, John Connor is the current senator. He is running for judge. And so he ah. will not be rerunning for the Senate seat. Um, okay. And so uh, that's why it's an open seat. But yeah, so the, the development you're speaking about is called, it's North Point. And the company has changed its name multiple times. I think currently it's called Eastgate um, Logistics Park. Before that it was called, um, uh, uh, they had another compass name. But basically they keep changing their names in hopes that the, the voters don't recognize what's happening. But the North Point uh, project is about uh six acres large, so about three times the size of O'Hare. It is warehousing. Now, Joliet, where I live currently and that's in the district, is already the largest, uh, the home to the largest inland port, which means we have ample warehousing here. Um, we also have a lot of truck traffic that comes here to bring goods to and from the warehousing. We have rails, we have waterways, uh, you name it. And so what has happened is these companies who've gotten tax incentives have gotten huge tax breaks to make more profit. Companies like Amazon, um, they're in enterprise zones, so they have other tax breaks there. But then the, the locals here have to deal with the air pollution, the, the constant truck traffic and deaths as a result of the traffic, as well as the potholes, the fixing of our road, roads. As soon as you get into Joliet, you know you're in Joliet because all of our roads are tore up. Um, and we don't have the budget to replace it because the tax dollars are not going back into that. They're going into these corporations who continue to make profits. Um, and then, of course, the environmental uh, aspects of this. So now they want to have, there's a competitor, North Point wants to come and be the competitor with Center Point which is, that's the inland port that's already here. Um, this is only gonna make things so much worse. Um, they wanna destroy our longleaf pine forest. It's right next to our national Medewen uh, Park, uh, national long, long grass, or tall grass prairie. They wanna bring in more trucks. They wanna, we already have water issues here. They've got a billion dollar pipeline that the city is trying to build to Lake Michigan in order to provide water because in 2050, our aquifer will have gone dry. 
our warehousing uses about 30% of our water to date, as well as all the leaks that haven't been repaired that we just lose water back into the ground. Uh, all of these things are exasperated by this project coming here. Now, if this project had living wage jobs and was improving our economy, I might be able to see some type of way to mitigate the environmental factors and the, the infrastructure repairs that are needed. But the reality is we have a, over 100 temp agencies in Will County. These companies are using uh, low wages, they're using temp agencies, they're not paying benefits. And so on top of that, we have a housing crisis now. We have multiple people who are struggling to pay their bills because they make $11 an hour. And it's just, and many of them are also dealing with wage theft. We have uh, companies exploiting undocumented citizens as well as ex-felons, knowing that they're they're taking benefits or uh, uh, pay from them, forcing them to work overtime, that those individuals can't fight back. I mean, it has really become quite a, a problem down here already. So to try and double that, we are just, we can't have it. I mean, we, we already have these issues now that are not being addressed. We cannot make this 10 times worse. So how would you, how would you address someone who would say, well, the, it could be made up because it's going to improve, you know, it's a development project. So it, it's going to improve business, you know, and, and. Because it, it hasn't. And, and that the people who live here I mean, we, we see it. You can't pull the wool over our eyes anymore. And the reality is we had 2000 people come out and speak. So this is in the crux of Elwood and Joliet where those two areas come together. So it's unincorporated land. It's in the Jackson Township with, which has the citizens of Elwood. So this small town had 2000 residents show up including Joliet residents to speak out against this. This project has been going for four years. We've all been fighting it. Nobody goes to the city council and said, you know what, we wanna support this project. Everybody goes there and says no. And yet our elected officials have continued to pass it. So in Elwood, they got voted out. Um, they brought the project into Joliet. Joliet has approved it. We have been in court for the last two years fighting this in court, trying to stop this project because elect officials who should be doing what they need to be doing and that's listening to the people have failed to do that. So even during COVID, we had over 24 hours of public hearings about this case and they still passed it. So this is a perfect example of companies putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into elect officials pockets and them looking the other way as voters say, enough is enough. We cannot have these projects in our backyard. Sounds good. Uh, Professor, I'm sorry, do you have a follow up? No, no, I'll pass the torch. Thank you. Uh, Thank Professor Hussein had a question, I think, uh, a while back. Well, uh, thank, thanks so much, Rachel, for coming on. It's really heartening to see um, you running for local office after Congress. You know, a lot of times um, it seems that progressives have been enchanted by national politics, but have ceded the territory at the local, the municipal, the county and the state levels. So I wanted to ask you about what you think are the particular uh, opportunities um, for a progressive in the state house in a place like Illinois, and also what kinds of issues have you uh, emphasized? Maybe in contrast, although you know maybe you have a general policy set, but what kinds of things have you emphasized for this race that are different from you know a national uh, level race? Yeah, I'm going to start that last question and work my way backwards. Um, I'm hoping that this next issue I talk about becomes a national issue. It should be a local issue, a state issue, and a national issue, and that is public broadband. So that is the wave of the next utility. It is internet access. And if we did not learn that during COVID, I don't know what else is going to smack us upside the head and say how important access to good internet is. And just like the post office, look, I'm not anti-FedEx or anti, uh, you know, um, uh, what's the brown one, UPS, but I still go to the post office, right? I can use those other ones and I can still use the post office. That creates healthy competition. And that is what we need to do with broadband. You can have your Comcast, you can have your at t or whatever, you know, one that you have in your backyard, but we need a government option that will ensure that you can afford it, 
right? So they don't, they don't have to pay their shareholders so they can have the lowest price, but uh, the competition then is in the service, right? at t can maybe have a fast one or Comcast can have better customer service or whatever. But what it does is it creates healthy competition. It ensures that every aspect of um, our area is covered. So right now we have these gentleman agreements where Comcast doesn't want to cross this line you know, on the map because because t is over here. And as long as they have this agreement, they're not breaking monopoly rules, right? But they understand they can increase the price as much as they want because that is your only option to buy internet in that area. And so the minute you have a public option in both of those areas, you will see everyone will be everywhere all of a sudden and you will have real competition. And so this is an issue. I started it at the local level. I serve on the county board now. When we got our ARPA dollars, this has been my biggest push that I am so sick of us using our tax dollars to lay the infrastructure only to give that over to private companies who then give profits to their shareholders. And then you pay for it a second time. We do this for the pharmaceutical industry and now we're doing it with the broadband industry and enough is enough. So at the local level, I am encouraged Encouraging um, our county, we're starting a, a study to try and say what are the, the realities of what our county can do to provide a public broadband, even if it's just at maybe a government level, library, schools, uh, government buildings. But let's start laying those lines, at least laying the conduit when we're tearing up our roads. We should be laying our electric lines underground anyway because of climate. And we definitely should be laying our, our fiber to connect um, different cities and townships, and then eventually houses can connect in too. Uh, but at the state level, they already they also have a lot of money for broadband. The uh, uh, infrastructure bill that just passed has more money in there for broadband. So instead of just giving this money away to private companies, our government should be running our own IT, our own cable industries, and making sure that people, it, so this isn't free, you would pay for it, right? But I want to be clear, instead of sending $100 uh, for my cable bill or my internet bill, I can only I might only spend 30 or 40 because I don't have to pay that overhead for shareholders. So I hope that this catches fire and every progressive out there is pushing this at every level of government um, because there's definitely ways to work together. So everyone's using their ARPA dollars or whatever, if they have extra carriage dollars or infrastructure dollars to make this a reality. Then going back to your other questions about some of the things that, um, you know, at the state level that we can work on. Illinois last year passed historic legislation in the CJA bill, and that stands for Clean Energy Jobs Act. And it is a, a ver what I like to call the mini version of the Green New Deal. It prioritizes jobs that are coming away from fossil fuel into renewable energy, especially not just uh, unions and prevailing wage jobs, but uh, BIPOC jobs, uh, Black and Indonesian people of color jobs, making sure that we are leveling that playing field so that that people who historically have not been given the, the training opportunities or the job opportunities are given those uh, opportunities, as well as people coming straight out of fossil fuel. So we had a number of coal plants that closed this year or in the last few years in the state, and those people lost their jobs. This puts tax dollars directly into those cities in order to stabilize their economy so that we could get those people trained and back to work. This is an example of things that states all across the United States should be doing. That being said, it was very difficult to get CJ passed in the state. It, it came with an 800 million, it'll probably be close to a billion when it said bailout for the new plants. Not because the new plants were really threatening to, they were threatening to close, but they weren't at, they weren't really gonna close because they were still paying out huge dividends to their shareholders. So it's kind of a joke on us that if we're gonna keep spending a billion dollars on nuclear plants, then that's again, something that needs to be uh, in the public hands. The state should have bought those power plants. If they really were gonna close, let them close, let us buy them up. If we can run a better job than they can't, then let's do it. Cause these are services to our, our constituents. And I'd rather it be that than money going to shareholders while we're still then having to pay we're paying the, the bailout and we're paying the cost of the energy. Enough's enough. So those are some things. Um, the last thing I'll say about CJA is we have still one of the dirtiest coal plants that are still open in the state. It's called Prairie State. It was a sticking point to this bill because the people who fund those are mis mis municipalities who signed up for 99 year contracts and now are stuck stuck in this situation and they need an answer too. So I would have rather have given 
the $800 million in new bailouts, I would have rather have given that to the municipalities to break their contracts and get out of this dirty coal plant industry, move them towards renewable energy um, and buy the, the power plants. And then we could run the power plants. So energy moving forward is definitely something that states need to heavily be looking at and how they move those, um, those jobs over into renewable energy, make sure that they're um, still prevailing wage jobs, that they are the living wage jobs for people. This is what our, I think our state governments need to be looking at. And so we have some work to do still here and implementing it is going to be key to making it a success. That's great. Um, I wonder if also some other national issues um, like health care. I know, you know, there's been so much controversy recently about California failing more than once now to implement a universal health care program at the state level. And since, you know, states can be the laboratories of democracy, as they say, you can, you know, build up momentum for a national level program um, if uh, progressive states lead the charge by implementing this at the state level. I'm wondering if that's something that you have uh, thoughts on or a plan for. Do you see that there might be an emerging coalition in Illinois to try uh, to do what, um, you know, California has failed to do? By the way, I yeah. should mention Texas is a bio lab for democracy, but go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, two thoughts on that, one from a financial aspect and one from uh, what's happening right now. So I'll start there. The thing that's happening right now is uh, Illinois single payer and the individuals who are um, behind Medicare for All are currently looking at the state to try and move forward with that. My fear is what's happened with a few other states, I think Vermont was one of them, that if you don't have everyone in that paying into there and you only have sick people paying in, then it is just gonna be a huge tax burden on everyone. The way insurance really works is everybody pays in and then when you have to pay out when someone is sick, you have that cushion of money that's in there. So for all of the, the issues with uh, Obamacare, care, him trying to force people to pay in was to solve that problem, is that if you don't have healthy individuals in, then, and you only have sick people in, then it becomes um, very financially expensive very quickly. So for a state to, to mandate that, it's very difficult. However, working with some of our unions in this state would be wise because so many of our unions have private insurance now and they're paying upwards of $25,000 a year for that. So that would be the area I think that um, they could even just start working between unions to organize the, its own thing and then have uh, em government employees pay into that as well. And there, there you have it, the beginnings of uh, Medicare for all with people who are healthy, who are already paying for insurance, but you move it over to a state program. And that will bring me back to my other point, which is finance. So right now, I think yesterday or today, our state treasurer has introduced um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to get the title right, but basically a pension program for government employees and others to pick buy in so that if they wanted to, to invest their Roth IRA or their, you know, in retirement, they can do it as a, as a state option. So this could be the beginning legislation, then they could then copy over for healthcare, right? If you're investing into a plan that's run by the state, and then, um, then you can use that same type of logic over on the, the healthcare side. So I'm following that very closely because healthcare is definitely one of the benefits that we've lost as employers or employees. Employers have stopped giving some of those, but, but pensions have been gone for a long time. Uh, so that's something else that my generation is very worried about. If you are lucky enough to invest in 401k, when you're in your 20s, then you might have a little bit of a, a leg up, but let's be realistic. There's been so, so many recessions in, in my working years that even if you invested, your 401k is nowhere near where it needs to be. So that clearly is a failed experiment in America. And we have to acknowledge that and say, it's great to invest in the stock market, but first of all, not everyone is. And second of all, if it doesn't increase in my 30 years of working, then I have no retirement. So we have to get back to pensions. We have to get back to businesses, putting back into the community. I actually don't think healthcare should be tied to an employer. Uh, I would like the state or the federal government to offer that. Uh, I was a military spouse for 10 years and TRICARE is a, a system that military spouses and families have. And I could take my kids to the doctor. Everybody paid in in the military. And so that, that healthy cushion of people paying in was there. And when sick people needed it, they could go, they could get the, the care they needed. The government 
uh, negotiated all those contracts at low rates. And so this is the, the exact platform of what Medicare should be uh, for everybody. And I'm going to keep pushing it for it to be a federal issue. Uh, if we, of course, if we can expand Medicaid at the state, um, if we can find a way uh, to utilize some of the, the language that they're using for the pension stuff for healthcare, I'm going to be all over it. But I'm not going to stop knocking on that federal door and say, look, we really do need health care for everyone. Could you circle back to TRICARE? How does that work if you're a military spouse, your parents are in the military, and you're under, I would assume, 20... I think it's 24 now. Maybe 24. it's 26. Um, yeah, so if you are married to an active duty, if the active duty served for 20 years and retired, or if you're under the age... 24 to 26, uh, and you're a dependent of military, then you pay the active duty member pays into TRICARE. So much like insurance or a payroll tax, you know, that amount goes uh, into the system. And then you can go see a doctor. Now there are, there's in network as well. So if you're by a medical base, then you need to go to the hospital or the clinic that is provided there. If you are outside, I think it's like 10 mile radius, then you get to see any doctor that takes TRICARE. So my kids are still on the TRICARE system and uh, we're nowhere near a base. So we just call around and find a, a doctor that takes TRICARE and they basically go and we have no out-of-pocket costs. We go and they see the doctor. If they need specialty care, then there may be an out-of-pocket cost on some specialty care, but I guarantee you it's better than any insurance out there. We might pay 20 bucks. So when I had my kids, I was, I have twins. I'm, just, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is basically government-run healthcare. Yes. Government-run, but you see private uh, uh, doctors, right? So they're not government doctors. They are, you can see, even on the medical base, there are private doctors who are working on the, the government uh, hospitals and stuff. So you're not payer, seeing, right? Say that again? It's a single payer. System. Yes, this is this is a single payer system, right? All of these military active duty members are paying in, and then they are all receiving the care they need. And it's run, I mean, you, I've gone to doctors all across the United States. And just to give an idea of the type of savings we're talking about from an individual basis. When my twins were born 13 years ago, I was a high risk pregnancy. I went to specialists probably on a weekly basis. And at the end of my pregnancy, I ended up spending only $36. I paid $18 for a, an optional blood test after my kids were born. Everything else was covered by TRICARE. Everything, the four days in the hospital, the, the multiple ultrasounds, everything was covered. So this is an example of how healthcare should be working, where it's not profit driven, but it's care driven. I, I, I had an experience yesterday taking somebody for an MRI. Uh, his sinuses were clogged and he's older and um, it's a, a MRI, a radiology uh, mill. And there's a copay and I look at the bill and it's $1,400. And I said, why is this $1,400? Well, that's what we charge. And I had just done the Ralph Nader show. It's not a good time. I shouldn't go outside after I do the Ralph Nader sh show because I'm looking for a fight. And, uh, and I just said, I I'm not trying to be a jerk. Just explain to me how long is the MRI? And the woman said, it's three minutes. And I said, you're charging three minutes for, for a photograph? Well, that's what we charge. I said, can you just double check? And she said to me, literally, what do you care? His insurance is going to pay for it. And I said, just curious, you know, I, I'm just curious. She says, what do you care? It's, it's all covered by insurance. I said, you know what? I'd like to know why this costs close to $1,400. The manager comes in and I'm the jerk. I'm, you know, I'm a jerk just for asking. And they look at it and they go, that's what we charge. So I take my friend to the MRI and I make him laugh, you know, by being a jerk. And I say to the technician, I swear to God, this is true. I said, look at this bill. This is I said, I said, how long is this going to take? He says, three minutes. You'll be done. I go, why are you charging $1,400? He says, let me look at that. 
He looks at it and goes, oh, well, we're, we're only doing this procedure. They should only be charging you $600. <laughs> and I thought, but I'm the jerk. I'm the jerk for asking the question. So I go back and I speak to the manager and they said, oh, we would have caught that. We would have caught huh. that. I said, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. No, and that's the thing too. When the when the government's negotiating, they're not they're fraud. not paying fourteen hundred dollars. Okay, excuse me for they're one not. second. It's fraud. They yeah. they know that this guy is scared. He's and he's getting an MRI, and he's not going to look at the bill. So they double charge him. They double charge whatever insurance right. he's got. Nobody's going to question it because they're dealing with. Please God, let this be okay. Let this be uh, and and they rip him off and. And I kept that. I'm, I'm so Sorry. relieved that you saved the insurance company all that money, David. <laughs> well, explain that. Why well, I'm making this about me. I well, apologize. No, but that, but that is the problem because it's not the people who have insurance, right? It, those aren't the people who we're worried about. It's the people who either don't have insurance or their insurance co doesn't cover all of those things. Those are the people who are, are really having a hard time. And it's not even the people on Medicaid, right? It's not the poorest among us and it's not the richest among us. It is that middle area that it's like, for example, on TRICARE, my daughter doesn't have eye coverage, right? This is a problem with Medicare currently. They don't have eye and ear. Somehow these parts of our body don't exist in the rest of our healthcare industry. But so her glasses were $400. And I thought, well, don't we pay for uh, uh, eye care? And I think we do, but they're like, oh yes, but it's only for the appointment or something. So only the appointment is covered, but the, if she can't see, then I guess if I have no money, my daughter is just as blind and walks around the world blind. But uh -huh. it's like the person who is really poor, they're on the Medicaid system. Someone's paying for glasses for them. But instead here I am shelling out $400 in glasses. So that makes no sense. This is something she has to have to live her life. But yet, if you don't have money, oh, well. I, I want Professor Bick to ask, uh, ask a question. But I apologize. Professor Hussein said, well, thank you for saving the insurance company money. Because the woman who runs the radiology lab kept saying, what do you care? It's the insurance company. I said, I care. I want to find. What is the morality of, what's the difference in morality between a doctor doing insurance fraud versus a doctor ripping off TRICARE. Why are you going to be less likely to see doctors uh, ripping off TRICARE? What's the moral component here? I don't want to see any doctors ripping anyone off. <laughs> well, right. But to rip off TRICARE, to, rip, to, to steal tax dollars, is an abomination that the, the, in, built into single payer is to, to steal from the government. It's one thing to steal, as Professor Hussein said, who cares about Anthem? Who cares if they get rid of it? But to steal from our government, you're, you, there's going to be less fraud. Just what, le what, what little decency is left in the medical profession uh, says you're more likely to rip off an insurance company than our government. Professor Bick. Uh, yeah, hello, Rachel. Um, very impressed by your answers so far. Great. Um, we haven't asked the tough ones yet. <laughs> well, I, I would, wanted to ask about uh, one of the, um, the biggest and, and most destructive uh, national policies in this country, um, which is uh, the uh, war on drugs. And uh, how would you approach that as a state senator in Illinois? Uh, what is the legal status of uh, street drugs in Illinois, and how would you fight to change those laws if you, if you would? Yeah, so again, we had some historic legislation a few years back when we um, legalized marijuana and decriminalized it. So there are some additional steps that need to be taken, but there were some interesting aspects to that bill, which I'd like to see in other states as well. And that was the creation of the R3 uh, districts. And you're gonna have to forgive me. I know it's like restore, reinvest, 
I cannot remember the last R for the life of me, but the idea was that the areas that were hit hardest by the war on drugs, so individuals uh, in poverty, high incarceration rates, you know, high drug arrests, they were given, I mean, there was a multitude of factors of ranking areas in Illinois. Then those areas that had those high rates were considered R3 districts. So a portion of cannabis sales, the tax on it goes into a fund for R3 grants. And then those areas are allowed to apply for the dollar. So that is at the state level. Um, there's several buckets of cannabis dollars that happen. So our area is, Juliet is considered an R3 district. So our county worked with several collaborative groups, um, community, local community groups and neighborhoods to apply for these dollars to run things, um, you know, mental health care, immigration lawyers. Um, these are some things that we're bringing back to the district as well as um, beautification projects. Um, and each community had their own little pet peeve of projects, I would say, and they're going to work at those. So as a whole, though, we applied for dollars, um, got about a million dollars in grant dollars to come back to our area for those entities to use. And then every, you know, every month that uh, cannabis, dollar, uh, cannabis is sold in the state, more dollars go into that pot and other areas in the state can apply for the dollars. So the idea of that is some of those dollars are mandated back into areas that were hit hardest by the war on drugs. So that's one pot of money. Second pot of money became a lot more uh, contentious on the county board. So each county and city was allowed to pass its own taxes. So you have pot number two is county, pot number three is city. So the city passed a 3% tax on cannabis and the county passed a 3% tax on cannabis. And they had the, the right to do whatever they wanted with the money. Now our city basically just put it in its coffers. It spends it on everything else, you know, trying to repair the roads that have been torn up by these warehouses that they're uh, in debt over. But uh, our, the county argued, myself and a few other progressives on the board, argued to put those dollars aside in its own account to be spent to repair the damage of the war on drugs. Um, I put forth a resolution that actually would have created an advisory board of community members. So not elected officials, it'd be only one county board member who sat on it. Uh, the other eight members would be someone who was appointed from the community to tell us how to use those dollars. And we specifically started the, the board to be all African American. And then I was told that it was unconstitutional to do that. So we added in things like you had to um, be within uh, four times the poverty level, you had to have been there was like two out of three of these uh, lists of stuff, incarcerated, uh, poverty, you had to work or volunteer on a board that helped with social justice. So we had a list of criteria and said, basically, if you have been impacted in, in these regards, white, black, Hispanic, Native American or other, then you could apply to be on this board. The county board refused to call the bill. Um, and it is still, we have $1.8 million still sitting in an account at our county. And because our Republicans and our Democrats felt that the bill was too racially charged, they didn't want to move forth the legislation. And I mean, we pushed for six, seven months at this. And finally, I said, okay, then you tell me how you're going to spend the money. And we haven't done anything with it since. So now there's beginning talks again of how would we like to see this money spent? And I went back to him and said, I'd like us to create an advisory board. Even at this point, if it's just an ad hoc of our own committees where the community can come and present their ideas, I really feel that this has to be driven by those who have been impacted by this. Um, and I don't know why that is so scary, but giving power to the people is something that is so scary in our government today that politicians, they don't wanna go anywhere near it. And, but I think that is the, the answer to a lot of the wrongs of the past is, uh, you know, the people who have always had money and power continue to make the decisions in this country. And that is a, a thing that we're seeing right now that is playing out that those who haven't had money and power in this country are finally raising up and organizing and saying, you know what, we not only want a seat at the table, we are demanding a seat at the table. So my answer to them is great give them a seat at the table, right? This doesn't need to be an all out war. This needs to be us listening and having compassion and understanding and trying to find a solution that where our tax dollars do actually help everybody um, and shrink that wealth gap here in America. But uh, there, there's a famous quote and I apologize, I don't remember who it's from, but it's never be uh, naive enough to think that those with money and power will let you vote away their money and power. 
And I, I think that's really what we're looking at. And so as states continue to pass uh, different uh, legislation for um, legalizing different drugs, whether it's cannabis, or now they're looking at possible mushrooms here in, um, in Illinois, that the, the dollars that are brought on by the taxes are actually put back into communities that need it the most. I, I want to uh, turn to Professor Ann Lee in a second. Very quickly, is critical race theory a real issue in Illinois? Is it being taught anywhere? No. Mm -hmm. No, but that's the boogeyman for the Republicans. <laughs> is it being discussed? The Republicans discuss it in length. Oh, yeah. They, they want us to all know how bad we want to make white people feel and um, the Democrats are got this scary legislation, but no, there is no bill out there for critical race theory. It's not being discussed. There's no politician who's brought forth this. Uh, my understanding is it's a, a legal discussion that was taught in law school. So it's not even something taught at the lower levels. Um, it truly is just the next boogeyman. Defunding the police. Has any city uh, in Illinois or in your district defunded the police? Is there? No. There have been legislation that has been brought forth or ideas brought forth of different degrees. Um, and some people have implemented uh, different review boards, but the problem in Illinois, and we can change it at the state level, but you can't have subpoena power, you can't have individual investigative power, and you don't get final say over any of those um, advice that might come out of these review boards. And so in order to do something serious about abuse of police, you need to have those things. Uh, at this point, even our attorney general doesn't have investigative powers. So the FBI has to be the one who comes in and investigates. And then the FBI has to tell the attorney general what they found for them to actually charge any of uh, the police on some of these abuse of power or the local state's attorney could do the same thing. So there's a, in, the, in terms of funding the police, right? nobody's saying cut the funding for the police. There have been people who have come forth in cities to say that, but has the city council done that? No. And I think, I think that's a bad term, right? I do think that we need to reform some of our police. And that's why I talk about the abuses because what people don't want to see is they don't want to see their tax dollars going to people who are abusing them, right? It's not that we don't want police officers. It's that we don't want police officers looking for things to put people away in jail. Compliance, yes, we understand that. People breaking crimes, yes. But when we are policing our streets, when we're doing uh, video surveillance on every uh, license plate that goes by, I mean, this, that's a police state. And I think those are the things that people are afraid of. And then, of course, if you get pulled over and you're treated inhumanely or treated differently than every other taxpayer, then that's a problem, too. So these things do need to be addressed. I don't think you address it by necessarily defunding. However, uh, I think each city uh, and county needs to look at their budget and say, what are we spending the money on? You know, is it, I know we bought extra surveillance. And, the, the defunding of the, there's a crime is, you do believe crime has gone up. I'm not so sure crime has gone up, but uh, there, you cannot, there's no link between defunding the police Correct. And, and the rise of crime because the police have not been defunded. Right. Uh, no, the, the issue with the, the rise in crime is, is economic. Uh, most crimes are a necessity to be made. Um, so now when we talk about violent crimes, it's a little different, but we're talking about uh, theft and, and people breaking in and, and property issues. A lot of that has to do with the need. So those are more tied to economic uh, factors, not police factors. So if uh, anything... I would say quite the opposite has happened is that we've put more money into police because of camera footage and some of these other concerns about abuse of police that most counties and cities have actually given more money to police departments, not the opposite. Are the gun laws strict enough? They say Illinois is an example of very strict gun laws that don't prevent violent crimes. Chicago, for example. Right. So Chicago itself has a has a ban on guns. Uh, that's not true of the whole state. But uh, we do have a FOID card in our state where you have to, uh, it's a firearm ID card that you have to apply for. Um, I think this does help um, protect some of the loophole stuff. But the problem they found out in Aurora is there was a gentleman whose FOID card had expired 
and nobody went and got those guns. So last year they did try to pass legislation saying that um, the state police had to go get guns that for people whose FOID cards were expired. The state police fought it and said the sheriff should do it. Well, then the sheriffs came forward and they, they didn't want to do it either. And the bill died. So the question is, if you want to go get someone's guns, who's going to go get them? They're afraid of getting shot. Exactly. Hmm. So you would think the police would be for gun control. When you, I, I think it seems to me, uh, uh, Professor Marianne, you, you wanted to say something up. Oh, oh no, it was just uh, I, I was uh, I had thought that um, last year that the Senate that there were three pieces of legislation going through uh, the Illinois legislature for dealing with police reform, and one of them was this qualified immunity. Uh, yeah. uh, dealing with qualified immunity. Has, has that been tabled? Has that not gone anywhere? Or? Yeah, qualified immunity has not gone through. It needs to, uh, because that is how you're going to hold police officers accountable who actually abuse the law. But it has uh, do not you gone think through. you could make a difference uh, on that? I think that the, uh, that the power structure is going to be changing in the legislature. And do you think people like you could, you know, maybe change some of these attitudes and get legislation passed? Yeah, I, I definitely hope so. And and for anyone who is in law enforcement who's listening, you know, I think this is for their safety as well. Because when you have bad cops doing things, it makes it dangerous for every mm -hmm. other police officer out there. And the the qualified immunity, I mean, basically allows you to do whatever you want and get away with it. Who wants that? Why would you want, you know, a, a guy in your squat car who might shoot you if you say something? I mean, that's just like general common sense to me like i don't like working in an office with a jerk i definitely don't want to be in a squad card with right. a jerk with a gun i right. mean why is that hard right. to believe so hopefully other legislators will understand the common sense of that that if you are not someone who's going to follow the rules then why are you the person trying to enforce the rules that doesn't make any sense to me and if you're breaking the rules you need to be held accountable like every other citizen out there badge or no badge Let's do a quick speed round, uh, Professor Ann Lee. Yeah, it's made me think about whether there are, the police should be, uh, you know, looking out for those rogue pot potholes. Uh, <laughs> if we criminalize the potholes, maybe no, no. If my, my serious question is, the only criminals will have potholes. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I mean, pot. I mean, there must be THC at the bottom of the. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and, and the, there must be progressive uh, coalitions and alliances in the legislature. Do you, is there a significant number of them that you see yourself allying with? Is, there, is it a significant power once you get to the legislature? Well, something I've learned is you really only need half a quorum um, to push your caucus. So I don't think we're there yet. After this election, we will be a lot closer. Like I said, there are a lot of power struggles that are happening, even on just the Democratic side. Uh, we're hoping to win some of those and move the caucus further to the left, or what I like to consider common sense. So uh, I will be aligning with those people, but I'll tell you as an elected official, I have had some strange bedfellows, let's call it that, that I've well, had to align with Republicans or moderates or progressives on different issues. And I think that's the importance of being an independent voice that not, not bought and paid for by corporations is that on any given issue, I might find myself aligning with a group of people that don't normally get along, but on that issue, we'll get it done. I, I, I understand that because uh, I, I lived in uh, Illinois for a while, and, and it is a real difference between uh, Cook County or Chicago and every other place in the state. Thank you. Professor Bick, and then we'll go to Professor Hussein, and we'll um yeah i i um i think uh, you know most of these positions are, are, are excellent and um you know very articulate and uh well informed about them so i i strongly encourage everyone to support you and uh wish you the best that's not a question though no it's not but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do that by going to rachel f .com. the f is for faith rachel <laughs> fventura.com five dollars five thousand dollars professor adnan hussein well um 
I just want to echo what uh, Prof. John said, and maybe since I need to ask a question. Um, we need it in the form of a question, please. Yes, in the form <laughs> of a question. How can people follow um, your campaign besides uh, logging into rachelfventura.com? Are there other ways that they can support and follow uh, your work? Yes, I'm on every social media platform under Elect Ventura. You can find me under YouTube under Elect Ventura. And we do also have a web name under Elect Ventura, which forwards to rachelfventura.com. Rachel, great. And, and finally, Professor Marianne. First of all, I just want to thank Rachel for being here. Second, I want to make a comment. So many things that she brought up about these stupid hundred from these stupid hundred year leases that your that your governments and your cities get you into to taxes that are just being misappropriated on every level just one person in the room when these decisions are being made going what the hell are we doing here can stop those decisions i'm not the lowly park district level but i've stopped those decisions from happening and that's how you do it i know people are kind of uh, you know putting your eyes on the stars so that the Congress, Senate, or even the White House, when it's right here where you live, where you could have the most effect. But uh, just, just for the next month or so, Rachel, what, um, what do you need most in volunteers or uh, other support? I mean, right. what, is the, what is the single biggest thing that we need to do? Right now. Yeah, it's knocking doors and talking to voters. So if you don't live in my district, find a candidate you believe in in your district and call them up, send them a, a Facebook message or an email and say, how can I help knock doors and talk to voters? Uh, you can phone bank, you can jump on social media threads with people to help further their organic reach. But really the best thing to do is talk to a voter one-on-one. -on -one. And the more voters you talk to, the more people power we bring together. It's so crucial. I know you've heard it from Bernie and Nina Turner and probably AOC and all the other, the big names, but really at the end of the day, a grassroots campaign that is run by people only works if you talk to people. And the best way to do that is where they're at, at their door, knock on the door, tell them, hi, you know, I'm a volunteer for X candidate, hopefully Rachel Ventura. You can go to rachelfventura.com to sign up to volunteer for a shift and, uh, and get out there and talk to people and tell them to vote. Professor Harvey J.K., author of FDR and Democracy, take hold of our history. Your question for Rachel. I have a question. I, I assume everyone else has probably already asked you this question. What's your favorite movie? Uh, Goodwill Hunting. And nobody else asked me that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. What's your favorite movie? Casablanca. After which is like probably, after which after which is and this is why I was actually interested in asking you is Blues Brothers. Okay. Well, you. my second is Dead Poet Society. It's it's not necessarily an upbeat movie, but uh, it really spoke. Not to necessarily me an upbeat movie. It. Now, there's a there's a, that's the funniest thing I can imagine. Not an upbeat movie. That's and your right. favorite comedian was is Robin Williams. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> I'm more of a Lewis Black type person. <laughs> to Robert. Alan Minsky, Executive Director of Progressive Democrats of America. What is your question for Rachel? Oh, I just had an answer, which is duck soup. Um, yeah. um, boy, um, I don't know. Remember, remember when Guido started? I asked one of Lindsey Graham's questions. Asked him what his favorite animal was. So what's your favorite animal? Uh, probably a wolf or an eagle, which I guess the eagle's a bird, but I used to train wolves for movies a long time ago. <laughs> wow. Wow. You Good answer. You should train wow. wolves for movies? Yeah, the wolves from the Narnia movie, they've all passed away since then, but uh, I trained those wolves. Uh, it, we actually did it for a lot of different uh, TV series and stuff they would need animals for and I had volunteered to do that that I lived in California this was about 2002 to 2005 I trained wolves and worked with large cats like servals and tigers and my all my kids would go grow, we, when we were raising them in Los Angeles he would go down and pet wolves where where did you do this I worked at the wildlife way station, but through that, I worked then for a man named Tim Williams, who was, you know, privately rented out his animals for movies. But where they were petty wolves might have been the wildlife way station. And these are actual wolves that can be trained? Yes. Yeah, so he had hybrids. Um, 
so German Shepherd mixed with wolves, and those were the ones that we used. But wolves are incredibly intelligent, and uh, yeah, they're very trainable. Like a a, a real wolf, pure wolf. <laughs> Yes, yeah, a real wolf. You can't Gosh, have can I one. find a photo? I don't know if I can find a photo quick enough. Like I can't. They were Hollywood wolves, a totally different. Uh... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know a lot of people in Hollywood named Wolf, but I never actually. So you can't train a real wolf to like if you get a, a puppy wolf. What are they called? A wolf a, a cub. A cub. You you can't train them to sit and come and fetch yeah. and oh you totally can yeah you know, totally like can. the wolf that, you, that like who ate yes. little red robin yes <laughs> no you're that's yes. not <laughs> yes you can a wolf okay so you have an alpha right if your alpha is a human it could be another dog it could be a wolf that wolf will follow the alpha what is one of the main ways that dictate the alpha those who provide food. This is why when we train animals, a lot of times we train them with food because it's that natural instinct that the alpha provides the food. And if I'm guarding the food, giving the food, I naturally become alpha. Send this woman to Springfield. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what about wolves and coyotes? Have you seen these coyotes on the East Coast who are mating with wolves? Yeah, we've got some here. Am I allowed to share this photo? It says my thing's disabled. Are, are, they, are the wolves dressed? <laughs> yes, the wolves. <laughs> no, they're naked. I mean, they're dressed in their are fur, they but they're, 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 they're not wearing clothes. <laughs> is, is it a lot of fur? I hope it's a lot of fur in case kids are watching. <laughs> There's no sensitive part. <laughs> from, the, from the waist up, please. <sighs> are you going to share the photo? I'm trying. It says the host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, OK. Uh, I, l l let's let's uh, <laughs> give it given your the district. Marianne, did you bring Rachel to mm -hmm. David? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, go to Rachel F. Ventura dot com. Fantastic. Please come back. Give her money and tell all your friends. What is the district you're running in? Illinois State Senate 43rd District. The 43rd district tell all your friends who live in illinois in the 43rd district that's the joliet area yeah joliet bolingbrook lyle mm -hmm. prisoners are not allowed to vote uh, they if you're in jail you're allowed to vote if you're incarcerated you're not but you re in illinois you do get your voting rights back when you have served your time right but not the ability to run for office, I'm beginning to understand, right? Not at the local level. You can't. No, if you want to be a state senator, you can be a felon all day long, but you can't oh, serve on your I township. Mean, it's not a requirement <laughs> in the old days, right? Uh, <laughs> all right. Please come back, Rachel. Great. All right. I'm dropping the link to the wolf photo in the chat if you want to see it. Thank oh. you so much for having me on. I really Thank appreciate you, it. Thank you, Rachel. You, you are great. You really are. And right. have a good one. And, and if you want to feel good, go to rachelfventura.com. $5,000, $5. There'll be a spring in your step. You can change what you see on television by giving her five. If you don't like the news, send Rachel $5 and you'll see different news. That's the only way to, ch the only way to change what you see. Well, thank you. Uh, Professor Marianne Cummings, brilliant Professor Marianne Cummings, opinionated, puts her uh, feet where her mouth is. That's what I say about you. you. You knock on doors, you run for office, and you are fearless. You, 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 don't, you don't only have a critique of uh, America, you're actually doing something about it. So I'm very grateful that Professor Marianne Cummings is here. Professor Jonathan Bick will be here tomorrow night with his lecture on the Twilight Zone. Professor Adnan Hussein, who's on the mudge list? Is it Juan Cole, right? Dr. Yes, Juan? That's Cole. right. Check out the latest episode, uh, Juan Cole and his new edited collection on peace movements in Islam. It's a really interesting conversation. Great topic. And you also host Guerrilla History 
with our friend Henry, who, uh, where's he off to? Is he okay? Uh, Henry is off to Georgia for nuptials. So, what? Very exciting. His yes. own? He's getting married. Oh. In Georgia. The, the country? I didn't know. The country, Saturday. yeah. The country, right? Yeah. The country, yes. Yes. Because he's in Russia, so yeah. Bachelor party. Totally. We're gonna do the <laughs> bachelor <Office> party. <laughs> we do the night. bachelor party. I think it is happening on you know Saturday or Sunday, so Friday night would be perfect. Let's do a bachelor party for Henry. That would be so great. I'll strip. That's great. <laughs> By the way, I want to warn everyone: the picture like that Rachel dropped is actually three young women making out with three wolves. Oh, well, hang on then. Uh, <laughs> oh, we, we got to do, somebody said Caucasian wedding, Dave and PA. All right. Uh, and Professor Ann Lee, thank you all. Uh, Professor Ann Lee, read Professor Ann Lee over at the Daily Co's. It's must reading. She's absolutely brilliant. Annie Lee over at Daily Co's. Thank you. And let us now, before we bring, the, here's the really special stuff. The Noki Cam, uh, show in Norway, amazing, amazing. So you and can you make your own pasta in, in under an hour. You bring it in on time. It's amazing. <laughs> Cilantro pesto with cashew and uh, baby asparagus. Oh. oh, my God. Professor K. Professor Minsky, your comments on the presentation. Oh, it just looks like fluffy, fluffy little pillows. Oh, that is beautiful. As somebody who spends a lot of time in Northern Italy, a great region for gnocchi, that looks like a just a sublimely produced and scrumptious dish. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it'll help. It'll help Alan remember that Italy got beaten by North Macedonia today. Yes. Yes. One of the great global soccer powers, <laughs> utterly disgraced. Unbelievable. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we play our theme song, thank you, Joe in Norway. Let's go to Dave in PA. And Chad, his trusty assistant, Chad. <laughs> Dave in PA will be taking over the ASMR for the eyes. What are we doing today, Dave in PA? Uh, I thought that uh, Chad and I, I just found this piece of walnut in my rack and, and I thought I'd knock out just a bowl, simple bowl out of it. You're going to make a bowl um, to eat pesto. Noki. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Damn right. So you're going that, to encourage Joe. Go ahead. That's a piece of walnut wood. Yes. And you're going to make like what kind of bowl? Uh, one that's for like cornflakes or something. That kind of bowl. Just a simple wow. bowl. This is going to be fascinating. This is fantastic. All right. It, it Chad, may go really bad. <laughs> well, good luck, Chad. He's wearing his safety. What is Chad wearing? His Nothing Lucha Libre mask. And that will keep oh, him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Lucha Libre. Right? That'll no, keep that's, just, that's, that, that's just to threaten Davy Mammal. <laughs> it's not about safety. It's about a threat. Okay. Good luck, Chad. Good luck. Well, before we play our theme song, I have to ask Alan Minsky, what are you eating? Um, it was leftover, hopefully not uh, rancid, but it was very yummy shaved ice from a, the Taiwanese uh, restaurant around the corner from me called Joy. Um, it's very good. It has a condensed milk, custard, shaved ice, and fresh fruit. Well, when it was originally purchased a couple days ago. Okay. Well, hit it, Professor Mike Steinell. Misky and K, they go together like PB and J. Like Thelma and Louise, like mac and cheese, like Sacco and Benzetti, like meatballs and spaghetti. I 
showing videos of screwing in the uh <laughs> the david feldman show there that is the voice of professor harvey jk <laughs> author of fdr on democracy as well as take hold of our history and the fight for the four freedoms and in a few months his very first book will be reissued the history of british marxists and also joining us is alan minsky executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. Welcome, gentlemen, and Dave and PA. Uh, well, I guess we have to talk about our Supreme Court, our new Supreme Court justice, right? Looks like a good one to me in a whole I, host of ways. There's no I way. Just, I just can't get over it. I mean, I, I can't get over the, I didn't watch it, but I was reading commentary on the questioning you know, the Republicans are, ne they just never cease to amaze me. And I, I just, it's astonishing the kind of fascist, reactionary, white supremacist party that they've become. Well, you are the leading expert on FDR. Ben Sass, one of the good ones, they say, Republican, he suggested that they take the TV cameras out of the Senate because everybody's showboating for sound bites. Had there been cameras inside the, the Senate, inside the House of Representatives, when FDR was... We would have said similar kinds of things. They, the, those Southern Democrats were unreservedly racist and more than capable of saying the most vile and crude kinds of things in the course of any number of, of political and governmental occasions. Yeah. King George used but that's, to that's 90 years ago, 80 years ago. Don't let the sunlight in. That's what King George said. I don't want to make any speeches on the radio. They shouldn't hear my voice. Don't let the sunlight in. They, they will disrespect the institution. So are we seeing too much of our politicians or too little? C-SPAN is what, 40 years old? How old is C-SPAN? Well, that's a good question. Is it 40 now? Maybe. It may yeah. Be. I don't I, I, so Trump just sued Hillary Clinton? <laughs> he did. <didn't> he? <laughs> I'm looking at this. Wow, that's amazing. Today, just now? Yeah. For what? For um, so Trump sues Hill. I mean, I, I don't think this is the Onion. It looks like the Guardian. The Trump sues Hillary Clinton, alleging plot to rig 2016 election against him. Wow, that's amazing. Here we go. I'll put it in the link. 
That's beautiful. And then, and then, well, I, I like the, the other news that came out earlier today, although somebody said it was already old news, that uh, Virginia, Ginny uh, Thomas was yeah. lobbying hard for them to, you know, overturn and hold on to power. They found texts between Ginny Thomas and Mark Meadows and the chief right. of staff, Mark Meadows. And maybe that's what sent Clarence to the hospital. Yeah. You were married to that train wreck. You'd find any excuse to get a break from her. Well, in the in the purely ironic sense, was there who was this guy who had been as is Braun the name of the, a senator from Indiana or a former senator from Indiana? Which is it? He was making who was it that was making who was commenting that states should should have the 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 right to uh to block interracial marriages oh loving he wants to overturn loving but i thought that was he was a i think he's a state oh a senator state senator America. okay yeah, he well, wants to reverse loving i get i you know i thought it was just so ironic that in the week when the when the thomases are are in the news some right-wing republican starts basically you know right. denigrating their marriage so what what's going on it, it, it can't be as bad as it feels right i mean well it 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 isn't as bad as it feels but it's as bad as it will it it's it's gonna get bad if the democrats don't embrace our economic bill of rights <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i don't disagree i mean i you know i said that to get to get Alan to laugh, but I, but I, I really do mean it. I mean, that, that's the truth, honest truth. No, it's, it's, it's tough. And, you know, I definitely think, I think Harvey and I have hit on something and we see from the response we're getting to this. It's very. Tell uh, everybody, crazy. remind everybody what your economic bill of rights is. Well, we expand it to 10, uh, though, again, it's a work in progress. And we say in the article we publish in common dreams that we respect the other proposals then put out there. And we do feel that it's a work in progress. Uh, we would, of course, love for it to be adopted as, you know, a, a, a new 10 amendments to the Constitution. After all, the original Bill of Rights were the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. That's what they were. They were so they were, um, um, you know, the, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninth and 10th amendments to the U.S. Constitution. So we'd like to add on 10 more, but we're not presenting this as a constitutional, um, you know, Pro, uh, project to change the U.S. Constitution by their addition. Well, and let's put it this way: I wouldn't say no to the possibility. No, I know, but but right now, what we're doing is we're laying out a template for we, we feel the the Democratic Party needs to uh, run on, and progressives in the Democratic Party specifically, and as progressives try to um, take over the Democratic Party to use it to create social democracy in the United States of America. Um, they, if they're going to have any hope of succeeding, they have to foreground their economic message. I mean, simply put, um, if you look at the opinion polling, say over the last five decades or something, there's one subject that comes out on top, lapping all subjects many times, which is the state of the economy. And, um, and yet the Democratic Party and progressives in the Democratic Party are just not active enough in negating the characterizations of them that occur. I mean, I was, uh, I was watching a panel with Ro Khanna. Uh, I was hosting because of uh, some associate of ours and the project PDA supports. There was testimony being given about it, which is the call for um, indigenous communities to uh, basically apply indigenous land stewardship, especially in you know, specifically the, this was lifted up out of the P Paradise in Chico, California area, where the management of the forest has just been completely messed up by colonial the colonial settlers and their uh descendants and uh, you know they can help mitigate these horrible wildfires so in the course of the testimony and the questioning it gets back to a republican and he just has the prelude it's atrocious what president biden is doing turning this country into a socialist and communist state <laughs> he just, right. he just hit where, are they? where are they <laughs> yeah, where are they i'd love it if i could name one I know, but right. but but anyway, that's actually what seemed to be uh, defining the Democratic Party economically. But the Democrats don't do it, and yet you look at their work on Capitol Hill and the good work that did get done around Build Back Better and it being more promising than maybe we would have expected from these Democratic caucuses. And the progressives, 
their work was concentrated on making these better economic packages. That's what their work was. They need to go out to the American public and say, this is what we're trying to do. This, this, this. We're trying to change the economic social contract away from neoliberalism. Look, if, if economics and politics, politics, broader than economics, but certainly political economy is the question of what a society does with its produced surplus, right? And certainly in the modern era, that's the question, almost a central question of domestic political organization. What do we do with the economic surplus that we produce? Because we produce, obviously, a whole load of surplus beyond just needing to eat. Very few people today are directly involved in garnering their food, right? So we're living on account of surplus. Well, right now we have an economic organization whereby all that surplus goes to the investor class for their personal benefit. And it's just basically debt peonage, keeping your head barely above water, living life on an economic hamster wheel that the rest of the population has to live with. It's a failed economic model. And progressives in this economic bill of rights, we are just trying to put a razor sharp focus on the message that we and nobody else in the, in the political spectrum are proposing a different social economic order in the United States. And it's exactly what the American people want. And that's why you should vote for us. What are the 10 amendments? Oh, I'll put them in the chat because no, uh, I'm going to read it with no editorial comment. We have time. OK, um, number yeah. one, the right to a useful job that pays a living wage Two, the right to a voice in the workplace through a union and collective bargaining. Three, the right to comprehensive quality health care. Four, the right to a complete cost-free public education and access to broadband internet. Five, the right to decent, safe, affordable housing. Six, the right to a clean environment and a healthy planet. Seven, the right to a meaningful endowment of resources at birth and a secure retirement. Eight, the right to sound banking and financial services. Nine, the right to an equitable and economically fair justice system. And last, but by no means least, number 10, the right to recreation and participation in civic and democratic life. Now, anyone who, who would say they are against any one of these should be run out of DC. That's beautiful. It, it's yeah, really it thoughtful too. It, 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 you could tell that we've discussed this and l there are little touches that you've added, like safe housing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The word safe. Yeah. Yeah. You got to learn from these past 80 years since Roosevelt spoke. And, and I think we have. And also from these last uh, 50 years, you know, since the, well, it's 70 years now since the, no, 50 years, right? 60 years since the 1960s. And we've learned, and these are the kinds of things that need to be, to be stated. And we're still amending it or revising it a bit to make sure that it captures all of the things we think are important, but without getting into the, a long-winded sentence in any one of them. Did Fair you, enough, Alan? Did yeah. you take out education or did I? No, no, you, you missed that. It's the right, the right to a complete cost-free public education and access to broadband internet. And scalp massages are out? I guess. Hmm. Free scalp massage. Start from the beginning again. From the beginning again? Let's peel, but let's go slowly here and discuss. Okay. okay. Yeah. And Alan, jump in any point, okay? The right to a useful job that pays a living wage. We, are, we put this number one, and it is one with uh, bells and whistles, because this is the anchor of the whole idea, that if you work a full-time job, 35 to 40 hours a week, you know, 40 hours a week, an hour off for lunch, 35 hours a week. Um, and you do that in a full-time capacity, um, you should earn, you should have from your economic compensation, a uh, stable and, and basically a stable, prosperous economic life for yourself. It right. should be at a living wage. Right. And if you do not have a job, you have a right to a job. OK, which would imply not, as Alan and I, I'm sure we agree, not that we're going to lower taxes on corporations to provide jobs. It's that federal government 
We have more than enough needs for people who wish to work and do useful, productive, Mm -hmm. community-oriented or nationally-oriented kinds of labor at a living wage. You know, I want to say something too about this too, and because I might say this on the we're on the a show, uh, the Ben Dixon show. We've been on a couple. We've been with Ben twice already uh, since this is, and we the the question of the relationship of this to American structural racism has come up. And if you look at contemporary economics, economics really um, since it developed in the post-war era in American universities, you have the idea of. Um, the sort of target unemployment rate and the natural rate of unemployment. It's something like three and you know, above five, you start to yeah. get not so bad, but above seven, it's but really bad. But three is optimal or between three and five is optimal. So they're gonna be, there's always gonna be this sort of um, a pool of reserve, uh, pool of the reserve army of labor, right? That can be uh, made available. And as we all know, in the way America counts its uh, statistics, we have people who don't count on unemployment because they've stopped looking for a job. They've just given up on it. And one way you can sort of look at that in the context of the American economy, and this is different in in other countries because America has this deep historical problem with uh, ongoing problem, defined definitional problem for our society of of structural racism. If you take about the 5% of the population that's just fallen off the unemployment ranks, uh, the, the, the unemployment rolls, and you say 5% is the natural rate of unemployment, and you're up to 10%, what's the population in the United States, what's the, Af- the, the Black or African American population in the United States? It's roughly 12, 13, 14%. And you can begin to see that you have like a white population that continues to reproduce um, and sort of con- reconfirm this economic order. And with this segment of the population extremely impoverished, because you look at the people who suffer poverty in the United States and suffer unemployment and live in, you know, sort of economic deserts and they're disproportionately African-American. And so we say zero unemployment. Everyone who wants a job, everyone who's looking for a job is guaranteed a job. Half of female people of color, women of color, earn below $15 an hour. It's outrageous. Yes. It's outrageous, even if you're white. Yeah. I mean, so uh, what was Humphrey Hawkins? That was passed, right? It was 68. That was not. No, it, it wasn't was passed. If it was that ever passed, was it was in a very weakened form. Yeah. I think it was passed, but they stripped it. That's yeah. my, that's yeah. my, recall. okay. That, yeah. Well, th- so yeah. was the full employment act at the end of world war two, but they stripped that pretty effectively too. And why would people be against that? Because if the government is demanding that everybody work, corporations are not going to provide those jobs. Government will end up giving those jobs. There'll be highway, there'll, there'll be union or, you know, livable wage jobs. If you're running a corporation, you don't, you want prison labor. How do you find it's going to steal the labor force from corporate America, right? Well, um, in the 70s, which is Humphrey Hawkins was what, 78, I think. I don't know. Yeah, 78. Right, Carter, 76 to 80, 78, yeah. Um, the, the, the stagflation of the day, okay, which favored folks with uh, investment accounts. But it's the case that there was high unemployment, which the, which capitalists love because it basically made workers, you know, seemingly more subservient. Although in fact, workers in the seventies still had the spirit of workers from the thirties and the forties. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, they wanted to lower labor costs. I think I've mentioned this before. One of the things that economists noted in the early seventies, or at least looking back, is that there was a profit squeeze on American capital. And the profit squeeze in good part had to do with the fact that German and Japanese industries had come back from the war, you might, you might say. And as a consequence, automobile manufacturing and other things were truly competitive, becoming competitive with American industry and, you know, German steel and Japanese, whatever, uh, you know, um, uh, consumer appliances, those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, American companies, you know, just had not innovated effectively and they saw profit squeeze. And what they did is they sought to lower the cost of labor. 
as as best they could. And so you're going to get pushback from Joe Manchin, anybody who's a corporate tool who's promoting cheap labor. If the government starts hiring people, that's not good for corporate America, is it? It's good for America. Or good for America. to say that someone who works a full-time job does not deserve a living uh, income. Force them to say it. And then I'm say, force, force them to say that they believe that someone who works a full-time job does not deserve a living income. You know, uh, be careful what you wish for, because when they were getting rid of the $600 a week in unemployment, the Republicans said it. They said they will. they will, but here's the thing. They'll also say that this is what has sparked American ingenuity, is that people recognize that they're crap jobs and they're going to suffer poverty when they're in crap jobs and the society is going to demand of them that they become entrepreneurs and they pull themselves up by their bootstraps and all this kind of crap. Well, there's no social mobility along those lines in the United States almost at all anymore. I mean, right. there are, of course, I mean, there's a society of 350 million people. There are a handful of cases you can point to at this point. It's, it's, it's stalled to a degree, by the way, and I don't know if people know this, the social mobility in the Western European countries which don't have such entrenched poverty and have much more stable middle-class societies is now much greater. So people are actually moving up the economic ladder in those countries more than the United States, which actually has a much larger pool of people that desperately would, would of course, through, out of self-interest, want to move up the economic ladder. And so, th that's the, 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 the concept of this country, that we were a porous, the classes were porous. You could seep through with just a little hard work. That's that's the concept of this country. It's a lie. It's been proven, or it used to be yeah. true, but it's, right. yeah. it's a thing uh, but right now. The other thing, too, about the United States, and of course this did only pertain to white Americans for large, uh, the largest, still the balance of our history, was the it was understood that we didn't have elites. Look, the uh, social arrangements in other countries have been, you know, they had aristocrats and they had peasants on the land and they worked the land as peasants, uh, basically in the kind of fully subservient role to their uh, masters. And um, and therefore, the all the surplus was given over to the aristocrats, right, in the feudal arrangement. The United States doesn't have that. We were supposed to be a country of homesteaders. Okay, yes, yes, on stolen indigenous land. Yes, but for the American social contract, we did not have our betters. We were not a society that was supposed to give our surplus over to our elite masters. We were supposed to have that to benefit our own families and have healthy and free lives because we weren't living under those obligations. That is lost in this society. This Mark Green, one of the original Nader's Raiders, uh, has been on this show, and he worked in the David Dinkins administration. David Dinkins was the first African-American right. mayor of New York City, and uh, Mark and the mayor instituted a ban on Joe Camel. No advertising to kids in magazines or billboards for Joe Camel or any cigarette company. And Camel, I, I must have been Altria. I think Altria makes Camel cigarettes. They said, if you put this ban in New York City, we are moving our headquarters to New Jersey. And David Dinkins reached into his pocket and said, I'll pay for the bus fare. So is not that a great story? I'll pay for it. Very and good. Paid. Very good. So the, 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 the threat is, well, if you raise our taxes, we're going to take our ball and go away. You know, like, is it the Fountainhead where she writes about Gary Cooper? I saw the movie uh, where you know, they threaten to go up. The rich people go on strike. Two thirds of our economy is what Americans buy. If, if a president came along, if a party came along and said to the plutocrats, to the oligarchs, to the multimillionaires and the billionaires, 
take your effing family and your money get the f out of this country we don't that's, need that's a few years after the american revolution the french did that and it was it was it was fun for a while it sure was it worked out pretty every man's a king <laughs> um hey um harvey someone named liam put into the chat this minsky forgets that america was founded by rich white male educated landowners who figured that only rich white male landowners would run the country in perpetuity now my understanding is america became a country That's pretty true. quickly pretty quickly there you're saying it is true no I it's not true they country. they in the constitution already in the constitution they they wrote in getting rid of the slave trade in well, i think just 20... that, that, not just that but the small towns were the vast majority of the population plus homesteads plus small farms and um i think it would have been surprising very quickly after the revolution if not immediately after the revolution to that population that america was as the as liam is characterizing it but harvey you know this better than me i mean certainly within a few decades this became for again white americans a country where the social compact increasingly included uh not getting a plot of land out in ohio where you were living under the thumb of an elite virginian uh landowner but were in fact uh, as such, uh, in a democratic project with the other homesteading landowners in Ohio. Uh, that's just one example. But Harvey, your take on what? Well, the other thing, the, the, look, I mean, for all the faults of the Constitution, and there were many, um, there were no uh, there were no property requirements requirements in the Constitution for anyone of, for holding public office. There were no religious tests specified. I mean. I mean, no offense, Liam, but that's that's one of those statements that people like to throw out because they because they, they bought into ha Howard Zinn or somebody else too readily, I think. Yeah, no, and I, I want to just emphasize, look, I consider, I frankly, and I'm, I'll go toe to toe with anybody, I don't think anybody's to the left of me. I think when people who think they're radical to the left put out statements like that that are that are objectively false as to what I mean, look, we, we all hate Andrew Jackson. But what was who wrote the Age of Jackson? You know, go read that book. Schlesinger, Schlesinger. Arthur Schlesinger. Yeah, go read that book. And it is not an America that is dominated by you know only this very small clique of Virginian and Massachusetts elites. In fact, Massachusetts already doesn't really even fit the model that Liam's describing. Right. You know? And um, uh, and and that's so you know one of the things Harvey and I talk a lot about the the post-war social compact. Well, that's in the industrial era. And I think one of the reasons that Roosevelt resonated so much once the New Deal hit was because of the resonance uh, in the majority of the population of this idea, this was a society of no masters where each household had the opportunity for, um, and, and that this wasn't just an aspirational fiction, but it was really defined before you had the large European immigration waves into the cities by the nature of what was a predominantly small town in rural America. In um, you know, obviously we're talking civil war, civil war area before and after before the onset of heavy industrialization, and uh, and it's that era and the prevailing social myth of that era that I think is part of the back which comes out of Thomas Paine and then becomes part of the backbone for why something like FDR is so resonant with the American public. So I do think America as a country that had and this is this is relative to European societies. Um, until you develop the socialist left in Europe, until the French Revolution, certainly, um, a much more um, e economically equitable vision of society, albeit racist to its core. Yeah. Women, I believe in New Jersey, uh, lost the vote eventually. Yeah, New Jersey was the one state where women had the right to vote and then lost it. Right. Right. And so to discount... Uh, the, the progressive roots of America is to discount the abolitionists. We, we right? W weren't some of our founding fathers? Yes. Abolitionists? Yes. Yes. Well, the, the, the term generally, it, it's true, but it, the term generally refers to uh, a group Late. of, of uh, in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s, mainly 30s, 40s, and 50s, 60s. And not... They were by the way, by the way, I do want to, if I come back to the Economic Bill of Rights for a second, did yeah. I mention last Thursday, so stop me before I go on, 
that the 1960 Democratic Party platform included was laid out according to the Economic Bill of Rights that FDR had laid out? No. Yeah. Um, and this is the, I have two volumes, every party platform since the founding of the, of the, of the United States. Really? So in 1960, the Democratic Party, this is this is notable. This is 1960. They opened up and they said, in 1796, in America's first contested national election, our party, under the leadership of Thomas Jefferson, campaigned on the principles of the rights of man. And they go on and they say, in 1960, the rights of man are still the issue. It is our continuing responsibility to provide an effective instrument of political action for every American who seeks to strengthen these rights. And that's how they open. And then, after a whole series of sort of general statements, they say... A new democratic administration, 1960, will undertake to meet the needs that they've laid out. They laid out a whole series of economic needs. It will reaffirm the Economic Bill of Rights, which Franklin Roosevelt wrote into our national conscience 16 years ago. It will reaffirm these rights for all Americans of whatever race, place of resident, or station in life. And they then proceed to lay out, to lay out the party platform in terms of each one of the stated initiatives, uh, well, the, the stated uh, rights that FDR proclaimed, and it includes full employment, full employment, okay? And they actually say the Democratic Party reaffirms its support of full employment as a paramount objective of national policy. For nearly 30 years, the rate of employment has been between five and seven and a half of the labor force, a pool of three to four million citizens able and willing to work but unable to find jobs, and they're looking to make it full employment. And they go on from there, collective bargaining, okay, minimum wages, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, as FDR said. Recreation. Boom, boom, boom. So here we are today. Ask, I want to know how many Democrats are ready to sign on to the 1960 platform. That's, how's that? Right. By the way, we, we do have to wrap it up. Paul Prescott yeah. is a history teacher. I know Paul, not, not well, but I know him. Yeah, he's running for uh, state senate in Pennsylvania. Oh, is he coming on right now? No, no, he was on, and he taught me since he's near in Philadelphia. What it's what's great. the on the Liberty Bell? It's, uh, this is what it says on our Liberty Bell: Procre proclaim liberty throughout all the land until all the inhabitants thereof. And this is a reference to the Jubilee in uh the bible right the jubilee instructing the israelites to return property free the slaves every 50 years that's what liberty meant to our founding fathers it wasn't just freedom uh from monarchy it was freedom from uh, slaveholders and debt jubilee i didn't know that Hmm. That uh, then you won't have to pay off your student debt, David. That's right. That's right. Uh, Professor Harvey J.K. is the author of many books, including Take Hold of Our History. Go buy that book. Go buy FDR and Democracy. Buy The Fight for the Four Freedoms, his book on Thomas Paine, and follow him on Twitter at Harvey J.K. By the way, Barack Obama was just reading your book on Thomas Paine. Indeed. Yes, Indeed. He Indeed. And and now, he, now he's finally realized what radicalism is about. Yes. Wait a second. Wait a second. What are you guys talking about? Barack Obama reading Harvey? Yep. Barack Ob okay. This goes back a couple of years or so. He, he was no longer president, and he was doing a sort of video interview with, with Australia and then he did a podcast or something like that with some of his former team. They launched some kind of podcast. And on he's sitting there and on his, on his shelf over his right or left shoulder is, my, is this. Not is this. Yep. Which is the spine of my book. Yes. Oh. Pretty impressive. But we should get it on the Oprah's book show. And we should get the 21st. We should get Obama. Let's write Barack. Get him. In. Oh, he'll never. Have. Why do we want to do that? That, that, would be, that actually would be tactically stupid because then everybody would know it's just that hollow words. That's, That's right. right.
this is how it would work. Barack Obama would say he's going to do the show, and then he'd disappoint us. By no, not he'd he'd agree to the 21st century bill of economic bill of rights, and then everybody would know that they're meaningless. Oh, right. Yes. Uh-oh. Or he'd triangulate. Yeah. But before we go to Liam, let's go to Dave in PA and Chad. That bowl looks great, Dave. By the way, if you're looking for a vacation spot, Dave in PA runs a beautiful bed and breakfast. Thank you. And you can meet Chad, his trusty helper. Well, Chad's always there. That yes. bowl looked great. Thank you. Thank you. I just flipped it over. I did the, the underside and then I flip it over and now I'm going to do the interior. And, uh, and I, I decided it's not for cereal. It's a bowl for D's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'm going to say good night. But what does Professor Bick have for a question? Oh. Oh, yeah. Professor Bick. Thank you for catching that. Oh, hello. <clears throat> hello, Professor K and Alan Minsky. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Um, what are you eating? Uh, <laughs> you caught me. Yeah, that's why I didn't turn my video on. I figured. Some pistachios. Um, <laughs> these nuts. He's eating these nuts. I'm eating these nuts. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, your criticism of what um, uh, Liam had to say. Um, but in fact, the United States, particularly the national government, has been dominated by white men of property for its entire existence. Sure. So it's not, you know, what, what he said was not really off base, I don't think. Um, you know, there, sure, there were progressives oh, okay. who wanted that. Right. Who wanted that not to be the case, but that has been the case. You're right. You're right. I misinterpreted what he wrote. I'm very tired, everybody. I'm but, you know, the other thing is the music. No, he, you're right. He said he said run the country, and I actually interpreted it that was for only rich white property owners, and it didn't become a country of more dispersed wealth. I mean, I'd be interested to see. Of course, of course, we're not talking about the in in the process of being genocided, the indigenous population and, and the black population of the country. But if you look at what's called the Gini coefficient in modern um, modern economies, I'd be interested to apply that to the United States. And the Gini economy. coefficient is inequality comparing, it's the ratio of people living in the bottle like Gini versus the people who get to be. Right. Right. And it's yeah. my understanding that the slave states would have a significant of just bracketing the white population the white population would have a significant Gini coefficient and much less so in the Northern states. And it would probably be bad in Philadelphia and New York, but that was a very small percentage of the population back then. But to say the country was run by rich property owning white men, uh, I was gonna say the music industry uh, in the 60s and the 70s was run by rich white men but the people making the music were people of color. So just because the people in charge, just because there are people in charge, it doesn't mean uh, that people below aren't shaping the country, making the nation. Oh, yeah, but well, or at least trying to. I mean, how many of those people of color were uh, just ripped off entirely by those controlling the music industry. Right, but you're applying your values. I agree with you 100%. They were all ripped off, but they still made the music. The You know, jazz, comedy, uh, the yeah, art. They, they, made, they did the work, and the other people collected the, uh, the fruits of their labor. But that doesn't discount what they... They're the ones who made America. I once I remember Warren Thomas, great comedian, African American, and we were driving to a gig one night. I said, I said, how can you stand this country? You're you're African American. How could you stand this place? And he said, We built it. I never forgot that. He said, We built this place. It's ours. 
Has my segment started yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, th- uh, thank, you all. thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Professor Harvey J.K. Allen Minsky and Professor Jonathan Bick. And Dave and PA, let's plug your bed and breakfast where Liam and I are going to come visit. Yeah, Liam, we'd love to have you. You two guys. I mean, there's you can share the room. There's a queen, there's two beds, two queen uh, beds in each room. No, sorry, there's two rooms, you each have a queen bed, full bath. You're all by yourself out in the country. You see hundreds of acres and nobody else but my house. Basically. Dave, where are you located? Um, if you know where Elmira, New York is, yes, and just inside the key below Elmira. So if you're you what? Visit the famous prison up there, um, just inside of Pennsylvania, south of Elmira, New York. Okay, because I'm going to be, I think, performing in the Poconos this summer. But uh, well, you know what? I can get your contact from Dave, and maybe I can, maybe I'll swing through and stay a night or something. Wow, that'd be that righteous, man. Great. That would yeah, be good. Milk a cow, man. I, I like a bed and breakfast, so uh, I'm about it. Uh, and yeah, what's right. the what's the website, Dave? Bertie's Country Cottage, and that's a tiny URL. dot cc Bertie's Country Cottage, as in B E R T I E Country Cottage. And you can find it on Airbnb, right? Yeah, you could you could use a tiny URL. Or just go to Airbnb, and I think it's. Uh, Small Farm Retreat uh, wow. in Millerton, Pennsylvania. Fantastic. Well, we'll keep bedrooms my... all to yourself. A tank Great. of gas from the city. Uh, we'll keep uh, watching you make the bowl, which uh, kind of looks like the one your mother used to cut Pete Rose's hair, right? Liam, <laughs> your mother used to cut Pete Rose's hair with a bowl, or am I thinking somebody else? David, you must be tired because you've forgotten to play the 14 minute uh, Mursky and K theme song between segments. Well, this is this warms my heart because Liam uh, was the original host of Office Hours. And it, this is and, and so was Professor Harvey J.K. And it's great to see the brilliant Liam McEnany, host of Tell your friends the world's greatest podcast, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't. I, I ended it three years ago, but it is on SoundCloud, and I will actually be launching the reruns sometime when I have spare time this summer. And you're a college boy. I am. First of all, can I can I say uh, thank no, you? Hang on for one second. One of the, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Yes. Okay, it's been a long show, and I'm really glad to see you. But you got to take it easy on it. Don't flatter me. I'm begging you. You come on this show, and you start flattering all my guests and the people in the chat room. And but Dave, Dave, this is a this is a compliment. Um, I don't nothing, want, oh, there you go again. It's too much. It's too much. Listen, nothing tees me up for big laughs like getting to follow uh, Minsky and Kay. So thank you. <laughs> uh, just nothing nothing gets the audience going like 30 minutes on fdr it's uh like watching mitchell and petrillo in their prime it's wonderful mitch uh, and Petrillo. you're talking about sammy petrillo sammy petrillo and duke mitchell duke mitchell a brooklyn gorilla what is it what was that a <laughs> brooklyn i forget boris <laughs> carmel and lugosi meets a brooklyn gorilla yeah they were they were uh, they were a comedy team for venues that couldn't afford uh, Lewis and Lewis Martin and Martin. Lewis. Martin and Lewis. My friend John Satterfield, uh, twenty years ago, discovered Boris Karloff meets a Brooklyn Gorilla, and Sammy Petrello is doing Jerry Lewis in this movie and Duke Mitchell is doing Dean Martin pretending they're not it is they're you know a poor man's Martin Lewis and they had a movie deal well they were they were a nightclub act and they were literally like if you couldn't afford to go to the Copa or you couldn't get into the Copa to see Martin and Lewis 
you would go to um, Sammy's Bowery Follies and watch uh, Petrillo and, and Mitchell. And they got a movie deal and they were being, they filmed uh, Bela Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla, I believe at Desilu Studios. Correct. And it was so bad. And it was such a ripoff of Martin Lewis that Desi Arnaz, who owned Desi Lou, called everybody to come down and watch. Like Jack <laughs> Benny. Supposedly, Jack Benny would go down and watch, <laughs> and they would, they loved it. It was just, you know, it was a horror show. It was a train wreck. And I saw Dennis Miller is from Pittsburgh, as is Sammy Petrillo. Right. And he had never seen. Bela Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla. He, I've never seen him so happy because he knew who Sammy Petrillo was. He had no idea that he was a, a, a Jerry Lewis knockoff. All he remembered was that Sammy used to host the open mics and hated Jerry Lewis and accused Jerry Lewis of stealing Martin and Lewis from him. The insanity of it. The well, insanity. the thing was... Petrillo, like, uh, so they, Louis and Petrillo had a love hate relationship, as you would if someone started hosting an eight hour uh, political podcast that nobody liked. Right. Yeah. Um, that's my gig. Right. That's your gig. You wouldn't want, so he would alternately threaten to sue him, but then also he had him on the Colgate Comedy Hour when Martin. Really? Cooper, yeah. He played like a, he played Jerry Lewis's baby in a crib. In a <laughs> Which I mean had to have been a huge, like humiliating fuck you, but of course, you know, Petrillo would have been thrilled to do it because he idolized Lewis on some level, because he basically ripped off his act wholesale. Right. And developed his own act around it. But like Lewis Jerry, was such a malignant narcissist, he if he couldn't help himself, he he hated and loved Petrillo at the same time. That's exactly it. Um, and I think I think like uh, there was some story where Petrillo showed up to a Lewis event and Jerry Lewis saw him there and just got like red with rage. I wish I could remember the details of the story right now, but it's one of those great like stories where Petrillo says he stood up and Jerry Lewis saw him and had him kicked out. And it was just one of those like wonderful Jerry Lewis is an asshole. Like Jerry Lewis is such a genius and, you know, a groundbreaker. And really, like, honestly, he's his reputation is dog shit now. And it's mostly because he's such a terrible person to everybody that, like, people were happy to pile on him when he when his like style of comedy went out of favor. But the truth is, like, the movies that he made, especially with Frank Tashlin, you know, uh, were just wildly inventive, like insane, like beautiful to look at some of them, you know, and and uh and he, of course, he was a technical technical innovator as a director. I mean, people the don't video remember. assist. Yeah, I mean, he he invented one of the single most helpful things in the in the history of, of filmmaking. Um, and you know, like people make fun of the French for being Jerry Lewis fans, but they got that reputation because uh, Francois Truffaut and um, I think Godard would write these articles about how amazing these Frank Tashlin, Jerry Lewis movies were because they were, they looked beautiful and like literally anything could happen. And in the 1950s when they were being made, like, you know, American movies, just comedies were just kind of boring and stayed, you know, a lot of them. Yeah. I found his movies depressing. Really? I, yeah. I just, as a kid, I just remember watching this and going, this is, this is just sad. It's not funny. I don't See, know why. As a kid, they were all just like lights and noise to me. Right. Like, HBO used to play Smorgas me. Right. Like, HBO used to play Smorgas board all the time, which is the one of the worst comedies ever made. But all I remember is Jerry Lewis dropping a bunch of M&Ms on the floor right. and then being unable to walk across the floor without tripping on them. Right. I always wanted to hang out with, I never met Jerry Lewis, thought it would have been a thrill. Right. I had this fantasy to go to Vegas and have him drive me around because he was living in Vegas. Right. I pictured, I just had this fantasy of 
him picking me up in a white Bronco in tight shorts, because he used to wear those tight shorts, right. reeking of Aramis, and just driving me around Las Vegas and pointing out where everything happened. Uh, and Max Alexander uh, was great friends with Jerry, and I just... I, I wanted to open for Max in Vegas for that to happen. You Just, know, I would sit at Jerry's feet if I, it, he's gone, but if I had an opportunity to meet Jerry Lewis, I would have been so respectful and sat at his feet and listened to every story. I love Jerry Lewis, the man, not the artist. I think fascinating. There's a great Jerry Lewis biography called The King of Comedy by a man named Sean Levy, who's not the director, but he spells yeah, Sean the same right. way. I read it, yeah. Wonderful. Like, honestly, I read it when I, I was in my early 20s just to goof on it. And by the end of the book, I, I was completely turned around on Jerry Lewis as a personality and an artist, like genuinely. And he's not painted as a good dude in that book at all. Like, in fact, quite the opposite. He's like, it's a very much a warts and all book, but it's so like, it's great. Like, it, it really like kind of makes you want to, like you said, meet the guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know who had, you know, who really portrayed him perfectly, actually, and I'm not kidding, is a kid's show called Animaniacs. Where he was a recurring character on the show and it was just like. His, all the big joke of his character would he he would alternate between these really pompous things about filmmaking, and then just go hey nurse hi ah, ah. well, and was it really Jerry Lewis? I mean, they never called him Jerry Lewis, but if you if you ever look it up, it's completely obvious it couldn't be anyone but Jerry Lewis. Right now we had Marty Short on this show, and he did Jerry Lewis. You had Martin the, Short on the show. Yep. When. I was back in LA and he did Jerry Lewis. We had sketches where he had to do Jerry Lewis. It was amazing. It was like, it was incredible. By the way, Jerry Lewis has been me too in death. Posthumously <laughs> me too. Did you read about that? No, no but you see the non, non look of shock on my face. I know. The, the one thing, it, it's, it's very sad what he did to these women made them watch the day the clown cried right uh but anyway I won't it's I think it's in Vanity Fair it's uh it it reminds me why Hollywood is why would you wish Hollywood on anybody why would you wish if you find out your kid or a loved one is moving to Hollywood. I think even now it's it's still horrible. Even you now, know, my I have a thirteen year old nephew, and he's turning out to be actually pretty funny. Right, and it's like all I can do to not actively discourage him from following that. Like it's all I can do to not like sit him down and say like, yeah, it's fun to get laughs, but do not try to enter the business because it's it's just no good for anybody the the <clears throat> people who are stupid enough to ask me for advice like i right. know uh, you know what do you know about comedy the well, best to me winning writer the best advice i ever you succeeded heard. in this business for decades yes, oh, someone i would ask for advice the best advice that I ever heard was from Steve Martin. Uh -huh. He said, whenever anybody asks me uh, a question about comedy, they always ask, how do you get an agent? How do you get famous? They never ask, how do you get good? He said, he says, I've never been asked, how do you get good at comedy? Everybody wants to know how you make it in comedy. He said, the secret is to get irrefutably great so that you can stay home and not have to go to these cocktail parties that your reputation speaks for itself I always thought that was the best piece of advice just get good at what you do uh there's such a dearth of people who are good at what they do you will be noticed yeah 
it may be unfair. This is he didn't say this. It may be unfair that you don't get noticed immediately. But eventually, if you if you have the staying power, you will eventually get noticed unless you're African-American or a woman or, right. uh, you well, know, I just learned that that uh, America is a meritocracy from your last segment. So. In fact, I think I learned from you that the music business is. I can't believe, David, that you used the music business as your example of how black people are able to find equality. Well, hang on. They, 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 no, what I said is they were artists. They, they were artists. There's no music, there's no American music without black people. Absolutely. So just because rich white men were in charge of the music business, who remembers any of those guys? But here's the great thing. Eventually, in, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you have Motown, which is run by Barry Gordy and Stax Records. And uh, then black businessmen were able to rip off black artists. Right. So that is the beauty of America in a nutshell. Right. The, the, my advice uh -huh. is that people say, I want to go into comedy. And I always say, everybody's funny. Everybody is funny. Look at any kid. They're uh -huh. funny. How sick are you? Are you sick enough to do this? Because only a truly mentally ill pe person uh, will keep going. You have to be really damaged and if you and don't get healthy, because once you get healthy, you're going to stop doing it. How do you get to be a billionaire? You have to be really sick to be a billionaire because you may because you get you get, you know, a million dollars and and that might solve some of your problems and you can afford a shrink and you get healthy. You're not getting to a billion. The only way to get to a billion, you, you rise to your highest level of mental illness. Don't you agree? I would say that, and I'm not kidding, that would be the great, a great foundation for a book, like a book on how to succeed, mm -hmm. rise to your highest level of mental illness. And, and have a shrink help you get sicker so that you're driven. Are you driven? Are you driven? You don't have a driver's license in LA, do you? I do have a driver. I own a car, David. When did that happen? Uh, uh, two and a half years ago. You seem very uh, happy. I would say I'm tired. Um, I would say- you, you were listening to the show. <laughs> constant exposure to sun well i'm being very but i won't talk about the segment before i've been listening for a while uh constant exposure to sunshine helps a lot um but also just you know what's funny is uh comedy is for mentally ill people right and part of that is you have to have one of two things to really be able to succeed in the business one is just being completely blind to failure and lack of success mm -hmm. and just having that ability to push through all those walls right to the next thing, despite the fact that nobody wants you to. Right. And I could name off the top of my head, probably 10 people I know personally mm -hmm. that have done that. But then the second way, and this is the thing that I've started to do since I moved here is to recognize that something's not working and then to pivot and try something different and at least learn something new while you're working on the thing that's not working. Like right. for me, I moved out to LA with the idea that like, I would kind of relaunch my stand-up career and meet a bunch of new people and maybe get exposed to some new industry. And no, none of that happened. Like just absolutely none of that happened. Like just completely failed. But what I discovered is like, oh, I like doing other things. Like when I actually sit down and write, I'm good at it and I enjoy doing it. And like I'm learning filmmaking and I feel like I have the potential to be good at that too. 
Yeah. You know, uh, I'm reaching the end of this community college experiment. And, uh, and in fact, after this, after my co- podcast parents, I have three and a half hours of math homework to do. Really? <laughs> I do. What, what kind of math? Uh, the course is called Math for Liberal Arts Majors. Right. It, it is a lot of like just real world, like basically calculus and statistics applied to real world situations. Um, I am, you know what? I, I am in awe of you. I am in awe of Leah McEnany. You know, they, that is. I have my pants on, David. Imagine. That is so impressive. Right. To, to be studying math. Right. And, and 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 to dedicate three that is effing incredible that well, I, I that is just fantastic, fantastic. Well, i have to do it well, here's the thing right so i want to i want to learn filmmaking uh, i want to continue learning so i've applied to these four-year schools i got into uh cal state northridge that's great for film and animation great filmmaking school uh, really great. Uh, very happy to get in. Um, I'm waiting to hear from USC and UCLA. Uh, the Go to Cal is, State. Go to Cal State Northridge. Here's the deal. If USC comes forth with like an offer for a competitive financial aid package, I'd consider Go to Cal it. State. Go to Cal State Northridge. But Northridge Trust is great. Comments. I'm not poo-pooing Northridge. I'm just saying I'm keeping my... Also, I want to just... I just want to be able to say I got into everything. So no, but Cal, you'll get a great, the best education you're going to get yeah. is Cal State Northridge. There's the Disney pipeline there, and it's you're dealing with people. Go to Cal, Cal State Northridge. And Lee, you're absolutely right. The the team mascot is the Matadors, uh, which I'm not a thousand percent thrilled with, but you know uh i can live with it I the mike curb school of the, the arts the record producer mike is curb. not mike curb of the mike curb congregation i wish it was no, but mike no no there was mike curb who was a was right. he a lieutenant governor yes that's the mike curb you're talking about and he was a record producer no two different people no 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 professor ann lee back me up on this professor ann lee mike curb used to try to take over the government <laughs> well i believe that uh, I, I curb the record producer. Whenever he was the the same guy who was the lieutenant governor. He uh, any time Jerry Brown left the state, Mike Curb tried to do some kind of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it's really it's really funny. And he was a Republican, Mike Curb, right? Right, right. Yeah, same Mike Curb. Same Mike Curb. Curb, <laughs> curb your curb your curb. Uh, so uh I mean, listen i've already accepted their offer uh I'm, I'm making appointments i i have to sit through hours and hours of like sexual harassment training to get really good at it racist <laughs> training to get really good at it like they're really gonna even before i enter school i'm gonna be really good at, at all that stuff. but the thing is this math shit is one of my prerequisites like if i don't if i don't pass it i don't graduate from community college I don't get to go to the school so it's not like, what what are these what are these so what what's I I would love to take that math class because I am I'm, I'm watching Dave and PA and spatial design and you know that, that's all geometry and being able to see think ahead huh the reason it's called community college is it's open to the community yeah There's a bunch of great ones in new york but math math calculus is hard at a community college it's it's the same class that you learn there's no difference between the calculus being taught at mit or a community college a fact is a fact well i'll tell you what i was supposed to take intermediate algebra just to catch me up to speed and the guy threw in a lot of calculus <laughs> Like advanced what? calculus, I was so mad. Could you follow it? No, it's like learning a language. You yeah, know? I'm taking Spanish again. Uh, it's like all like stuff I should have done thirty years ago. 
Oh, hang on. Uh, oh, 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 I have a, you're taking Spanish? I am. You're taking Spanish? I am taking Spanish. Come on. I'm taking, are you taking Spanish? Oh, C. C. And, and what's the name of your professor? Sue. And I understand she harassed you. C. What are you going to do? Sue. Who? Sue. You're going to sue Sue? C. Sue Sue. And I understand uh, you're going to take her to the International Criminal Court. C. The ICC. C. Mel Blank. And now, just, now ask me who I'm joining. Who are you joining? ISIS. I, I, okay. Uh, everybody should look up Mel Blank and Jack Benny. Right. The classic routines. That is problematic, I guess. Is that problematic? I would say probably racist is the word for it. Well, why? He's just going, see, you're just. Well, he's doing his lazy Mexican voice which is, you know, I, I would say, I know Mexican people who are not, although I know a lot of Mexican people who are fans of Speedy Gonzalez. So what the fuck do I know? Yeah. I would say white people I know have a problem with it. I don't know. I don't know. I can't speak on the Latino population. And you were opposed to Pepe Le Pew because he smelled bad. Right. He was bad he was representative French. of- It was offensive to the French. It was a but skunk. Then it was, then it was offensive bad. to rapists. Well, that, yes, but that's the thing that somebody said. I remember somebody said to me on the show, they're canceling Pepe Le Pew. It's offensive. I said, I know. It's, it reinforces to have a French person smell like a skunk. <laughs> that's horrible. And they go, no, he's a rapist. I go, yeah, that, that too. <laughs> I figured the, the big thing was that French people stink. That was the, uh, uh, well, good. You know, that to, to, to be resilient, to be flexible in life. Uh, I was watching the Andy Warhol diaries on Netflix. Uh -huh. and Andy Warhol said, fantasy creates misery, that we have this idea. We fantasize about how life should be. And the fantasy it's the fantasy that creates all the disappointment and i have this fantasy of how my life should have been and so i'm disappointed and well what's the fantasy dude because you that i would be i would be i'd be hosting a uh, eight-hour podcast <laughs> that nobody listened to and this is a six hour podcast that some people listen to. <laughs> Actually, we're the numbers we're, we're doing uh, anyway. Well, like, I mean, I caught you guesting on one of the big podcasts to promote it. So Which I, one? I don't want to say his name. I don't want to start goofing on a guy who's not here to defend himself. Right. That's not I was texting you about. Yeah. Hey, I want to read you the funniest. I sent this to Michael Komen because it's a, a series of words that, do you know Michael Komen? Uh, wait, he wrote a book, right? No, he, he's, a, he's one of the great, great comedy writers. Just, he's just brilliant. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm reading uh, Tova Borgnine passed away, right? <laughs> And I'm reading her obituary. And as I'm reading Tova Borgnine's obituary, these words. Is this what you texted me just kind of randomly? And I sent that to you. Yes. And I want you, I'm going to put them up on the screen because this is the greatest sequence of words ever. And that this should be said all the time. Uh, this is from Tova Borgnine's obituary. Can I read it in my Ernest Borgnine impression? Re read it seriously. Treat it with respect. Okay. <clears throat> well, we have to start again now. Hang on. I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll read it. I, I will try no, because I, I put it up as a scroll. So it's it's on oh, the I screen. Can't. Oh, hold on. I have to. 
I didn't These know. The greatest words. You were going to share your screen. Hold on one second. These okay. are the greatest words ever strung together. And it's from Tova Borgnine's obituary. And I read it. And for some reason, Michael Komen popped into my mind. Just the, the sight of, the, of Michael Komen reading this and just rubbing his eyes. Uh, let me read this. It is a hell of a thing to read first thing in the morning. It was literally the first thing I, I read when I woke up was your text. Okay. This is from Tova Borgnine's obituary in the New York Times. These, th this is the greatest sequence of words ever put to print. Ms. Borgnine was a redheaded beauty with a makeup boutique that catered to Las Vegas showgirls in 1971 when she was introduced to Mr. Borgnine by Marty Allen, the bushy-haired comedian. Though the Hello much, there. Though the much show a little respect. Though the much married Mr. Borgnine was wary. Quote, forget it, I'm through with women, he recalled telling Mr. Allen. His third marriage, Borgnine's third marriage, to Ethel Merman, whom he wooed with $10,000 worth of flowers, lasted but five weeks. Ms. Borgnine was thrice married when they met. That is just a great series of words about you Ernest. How hard it is in this town to find a to find a woman who's on exactly the same page as you in life. Like Tova Borgnine. Like Tova and Ernest Borgnine. Yeah. Both of them divorced three times. Both of them probably through with love. And then they found each other. Through Marty Allen. Through Marty when was Ernest Carol? When was Ernest Borgnine married to Ethel Merman? He was married to Ethel Merman for five weeks. Well, well, when? Like, do you know what year? I would assume it was with the Marty money. Okay, so probably past her prime then. Past. <laughs> Careful. I'm just saying he didn't get her when it counted. Nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless. That's Kate Smith, but it, <laughs> you know that joke. Which one? The Kate Smith joke. Well, which one? I, ladies and gentlemen, this is at Yankee Stadium. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem to be sung this afternoon by Kate Smith. And somebody screams, Kate Smith is a no talent twat. She she's ugly. She can't sing. She was born ugly. She was never pretty. She's always been a horrible no talent twat. Nevertheless, please welcome <laughs> Kate Smith. Uh, that's just not funny. It's, it's the that. title of Alec Baldwin. I'm serious. Alec Baldwin. <laughs> his autobiography is called nevertheless right based on that joke it's one of the great jokes of all time because it's just it's show business it is in a nutshell <laughs> like the k smith is waiting to go on and the guy announcing won't even protect her from the heckler <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> John Ross was the first person to tell me that joke. Well, here's the thing about my my little education adventure so far, <laughs> especially as I'm preparing to go on to get a bachelor's degree. Yeah, so I have completely reversed my opinion on student loan forgiveness. Ah, I am 100 percent for it now. Really? So when it affects you, it's right. different. Here's the thing. I used to say people who were for it were a bunch of deadbeats who signed a legally binding contract and then wanted to back out because life is too hard. Mm -hmm. But now I think I see some real rational arguments on that side. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to believe that I, I could really get behind a student forgiveness program. Yeah.
Just for you, though. <laughs> no, I mean, just for me and, uh, yeah, for me. Yeah. For, I would say for anyone entering CSUN, CSUN between the years 2022 and 2024. Right. Because we're doing the hard work. Yeah. Hey, let me read this. Let's go back to the way we used to do this. We used to do listener questions, but we uh, have a chat room. Let's go to YouTube and, and I'll read YouTube. some of the, the chat and then I'll read in the Zoom room and you can ask Liam questions. I'm going to uh, guess this is not going to go as well as it did with Judah earlier in the show. With Judah? Didn't you have like listener questions for Judah scheduled on this? I read this whole schedule. Yeah, but my... My chat room was too big. The, the, the Zoom chat room is a entity all to itself. There's a snake pit. I wouldn't go in there. They, they talk to one another and conspire they do. Uh, to, to undermine my authority. They try to unionize. The chat room try to unionize on me. By the way, I want to go back while you're doing that and respond to something Marianne Cummings said. Yes. The elite chat room that David has set up for the chosen few. Yes. Uh, I don't mean the Jews. That's the secret chat room you guys aren't privy to. Right. Uh, but, you know, she said uh, anyone who has to ask how to get funny, ask Steve Martin how to get funny, will never be able to do it. And I think if you have to ask how to be funny, yeah, it's like you're going to have trouble because you're either funny or you're not. But if you're ever presented with someone like Steve Martin and he's willing to like sit down and actually entertain something you're going to ask, he's one of the number one guys I would ask because he can't teach you how to be funny, but he can teach you how to do funny. If that makes sense. Like he can teach you, like he probably has forgotten more things about getting up in front of an audience than uh, David has ever learned. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and I'm sure even I could pick up one or two tips from him. The best advice I was ever given before I started doing stand-up, there was a, a radio comedian named Henry Morgan. Oh, yeah, of course. Not yeah. Harry Morgan. Not Harry Moore, Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan. Legend uh, in the radio comedy world. Yes, yeah. Uh, renegade, took on, you know, made fun of his sponsors. Mort Saul loved him. Best advice he ever gave me, he said, if you're going to do stand-up, if you're killing, pick up the pace. If you're bombing, slow down. Interesting. And that turned out to be the best advice ever given to me. If you're bombing, in, like, you know, when I'm playing, when I was playing Arlington, Texas, where they hated me, it's like serving uh, stale French fries to them. Mm -hmm. They want fewer, like they don't like your French fries. So serve, serve them less. F find a French fry that is tasty. And then when they get hungry for you, then speed it up a little, give them more. But when you've lost them, yeah. slow it down to a crawl because they're not listening. The funniest is I've done shows at comedy clubs where just, I have eaten shit and literally nothing I say or do will make this group of people happy for whatever reason. Right. And then I make them really mad because I will always recognize how weird the situation is, how weird the job I'm trying to do is and how just futile the whole thing is and how I have to still be up there for 15 or 20 minutes. And I just start laughing like crazy. Cause to me, it's really funny. Like to me, the whole, situation is really funny that a whole group of people together once decided they hate a stranger and they don't want to hear anything he has to say but he's getting paid to fucking do it so he has to he has to do it and i mean i have died on the vine for 20 minutes laughing and then throwing out jokes that don't work and it doesn't make them any happier when i explain it to them like just nothing you know the best advice i got was uh, I middled for a weekend in Roswell, Georgia for Ron Schock. And do you know who that guy is? Yeah, great storyteller. Great storyteller, one of the original Texas Outlaws of Comedy with Bill Hicks and Sam Kinison. Uh, 
And this is only applicable, applicable to performing in the South, but it just, cause he was like backstage laughing at all my jokes and the audience was just staring at me. And after the show, he said, Liam, you're very funny, which always gets my attention. And he said, but you're talking, but, but. But you're talking too fast. You got to slow down. He said, the people in the South aren't dumb, but they talk slower and they listen slower. Right. And he said, so the next night I slowed it down and I had a great weekend as a, like, it just like fucking, it was, it was just that, it was that little tweak. And it's something, and just like, it was, he was very kind. Like a lot of comics won't even go that far to listen to your act or to like give you advice like that. But that's just something that I've always remembered. It's just like how kind Ron Shock was to me that weekend. Yeah. And you know, how just like, how he helped and just like very and also you know it was my first real road weekend and it just was a good reminder that i have to really be aware of who my audience is in the moment because it's not always going to be new yorkers or los angelinos or you know whoever it is you know whoever it is i i like to perform to like sometimes it's just fucking dummies from sweden and you gotta dummies from what sweden yeah that's not that's not kind. We have people who listen to us in Sweden. Listen, some of the best kissers I've ever met have been women from Sweden. So I'm not saying no. Right. But I'm saying I once did a show for at the Broadway Comedy Club that seemed to be mostly dumb people from Sweden. And I really had to figure out how to communicate with them because they weren't great English speakers and they weren't great thinkers. Now, that's interesting that you the term and I apologize for this, dumb Swede. If you if you go to Minnesota, right? The the rap against Swede, like you know how in in New York, Polish jokes, like they decided Polish right. people were going to be the stupid ones. If you go to Minnesota, there's a term called a dumb Swede. Oh, I forgot about that. That that, that they decided Swedes were stupid. Right. which is cruel because it's a nation of stewardesses. <laughs> the whole, everybody from Sweden is a stewardess, as I, under, as I understand. By Listen, the way, speaking of Sweden, yeah. which remained neutral during World War II. Right. I, you know, know what, David? I have to be honest. I looked at what the <laughs> Allies had to say. I had to look at what the Nazis had to say. I still can't make up my mind. I get it. <laughs> I get it. It was a tough one. It was a tough one. Hard to pick a side hand, in that one. On one hand, conquer the known world and exterminate large populations. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know. Liberal <laughs> democracy. Right. Liberal democracy. It's Rock. tough. It's, you know, I mean, the, the Andrews sisters weren't any great shakes. You don't want that. <laughs> I learned a lot. I'm being serious. Watching. Oh. Hitler's rallies, his Nuremberg rallies, right. being serious. Because I played a lot of people think I'm joking, but if you have a YouTube, uh, go watch a, a Hitler rally from the beginning. And he had because I used to play tough, you know, for eight years. I do these one nighters that it was you, you know it was a place that served onion rings. And they, what you know, once a month they would have a stand-up show, and you were competing with the, the onion ring. So, they'd all be talking, and Hitler's rallies. You watch him, especially in his early years. He would get up, stand in front of the microphone, and not say a word. And you'd hear ruba 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 ruba. Everybody's talking, and he's just standing there like this. And he doesn't say a word. And gradually, the din dies down. It gets quiet. There's this crazy guy standing in front of a microphone. And he whispers. He's in front of a mob of people. Right. He doesn't try to talk over them. He whispers. And, and that draws them towards him. It's really genius. You're going to think I'm kidding. The other person I've seen do that extremely well is Todd Barry. Who shares 
practically everything that Hitler, they have like everything in common. No, no, I mean, I've seen Todd just quiet down a rowdy bar just by standing there quietly and then just doing his regular whisper material. And he, I mean, he has great material on top of it, as Mm -hmm. Hitler did as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think Todd was better on TV than Hitler. Here's the thing about Hitler, right? People talk about what a great public speaker he is. He wasn't. And, and then you watch those rallies and he's just literally like, like people are like, oh my God, the most charismatic man since right. Putin. And then you watch me, he's like, why? 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 Yeah. Why? He looks like a fucking crazy person up there. Yeah. He, uh, Marshall McLuhan would say he, uh, it's a cold medium, uh-huh. radio, television. And by the way, Hitler invented TV. The right. first televised program was out of Nazi Germany. Well, that makes sense because uh, definitely it feels like he invented the pitch meeting. <laughs> very inside baseball, sorry. Oh, oh, we should baseball. do sketches. That would be such a great sketch. Just going, just, oh, God, that would be so much fun to write. Just a series of sketches about the Third Reich Broadcasting Network and all the shows. Like, concent- well, I did the joke about concentration, the game show Concentrate. Right. But uh, what were some of the shows that uh, Joseph Goebbels produced? For, uh... Oh, let's check the chat room for that. <laughs> What would be some of the television shows that were on? uh... You know what's interesting, David, is, uh, yes, Putin is a bad guy for invading Ukraine, right? What he's doing is terrible for the people of Ukraine. I dream of it. I don't think anyone can deny that what he's doing is the worst thing you could do to the people of Ukraine right now. But it is a great time to be a celebrity who wants to commit crimes. Sudan land sweeps. I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat room. All right. Lost in Europe. The Great Third Reich Baking Show. Lost in Europe. Uh. <laughs> uh. There we go, John Hayes. Third Reich from the Sun. Third Reich from the Sun. There we there go. There you go. Hang on. That's it. Hang on. He gets a. Uh... You know John Hayes. Of course. <laughs> he came to see you right before the pandemic, right? He did. Last Crystal Knock Tonight with John Oliver. Uh, I love Le- Liebensron. Uh, well, that's in your brainwash. The Reich stuff. Reich stuff. That's okay. That's okay. Good. Uh, I mean, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I know. But let's see what's in the YouTube. We should have a competition between the Zoom room and the YouTube room. That is gold teeth. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. What were you uh, no, we saying? No, it's all right. All right. I'm meeting a uh, a uh, <laughs> oh, this is what somebody Gerbil's Island. That's pretty good. What? Gerbil's Island, like Gilligan's Island. Right. Everybody loves Himmler. Hogan's traitors. What? Hogan John Hayes came up with one. Hogan's traitors. Somebody said Sect writes, Feldo is enjoying that lollipop like a fourth born male. Did you know about homosexuality? What's that? That we have a a psychiatrist who came on the show and they said some studies indicate that if you're the youngest male in a family with a lot of sons, you, you, they often discover you're gay. That the mother creates antibodies to protect. This is it's interesting, isn't it? 
That's and, how I know that you have a lot of older brothers. I am just distracted trying to think of a single good. Here's one. Here's one. Here's a good uh, Nazi broadcasting network. Uh, the Jersey Showa. The, Jer the Jersey Showa. That's great. Jersey Showa. That is a good one. That's perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Keeping up with the concentration cart. What? Nothing. Um, uh, this is was, this the after show? Have we slid into the after this, show? This is actually the pre show for the after, the after show. Is this a uh, talking Feld? Uh, so, uh, what are you reading? What do you, what movies are you seeing? Um, well, I actually, what am I reading? I bought the Mel Brooks autobiography and mm -hmm. I just started that. That guy is a hero. Of course. Um, he wanted to do the show. This show he wanted yeah, to do? I, I, I said, no. I think this yellow star search. You need to shut. I'm, I'm sure. Yellow up. star search is great. I'm, I'm shutting. Who came up. up with that? Uh, Dave, I am. Hill Street Bund and Lee. He wanted to do the show. Uh huh. I said, I already got Dave Cyrus and Liam Mackin anywhere. Your boy Dave Cyrus, who's in the middle of a rap beef right now. <laughs> it's such a nightmare. That was a really dumb thing he did. I what would did he do? Him. What's that? What did he do? He inserted himself directly between Pete Davidson and Kanye West on Twitter. No, Pete Davidson uses his Twitter account because right. Pete doesn't tweet. Right. So, so, so Dave posts screenshots of, of Pete Davidson's uh, texts to him to post on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And... Like, I really thought for a couple of days one of Kanye's fans might track Dave down and, and kill him. But now, isn't this just all... I, I've asked Dave, I said, come on, nobody knows how to create something out of nothing better than the brilliant Kim Kardashian. And I do mean she, she's, she's a genius. Right. She yes, she took nothing and turned it into a billion dollars. And right. that she is a great American. She really is. And and so this stuff with Kanye. He took the blood money that her father earned defending OJ Simpson and turned a small fortune into a larger fortune. So all this, I said, I said to Cyrus, come on, this is just all, he goes, no, it's real. I said, well, it's method acting real. They, 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 they're, they're pushing it, but it's not real. I think uh, I think it might be real for Kanye, and I'll tell you why is because that guy has demonstrated an inability to tell the difference between truth and fiction in a very public way. I think he might be the guy at the wrestling match who's jumping up and down and actually expects The Rock to knock Triple H to the ground and snap his neck. Or is that part of? The product. By the way, Ann Lee, Kanye knew it was Dave Cyrus because he actually broadcast his real name on his Instagram. Cyrus is not his last name, and uh, Kanye posted uh, his real last name and a general general vicinity of where he lived. Yeah, I, I you know I Dave is a I I have very few friends. Dave Cyrus is one of them, so I don't want to. Hey, look, I'm not bagging on Dave Cyrus because he could help my career one day. Uh -huh. I learned you never punch up. Yeah. When it comes to oh, comedy, yeah. you only punch down. Punch down. Nothing funnier than punching down. Especially on people less successful or people whose careers are worse than yours. Yeah, I mean, when you watch... Again, why it was hilarious when I saw you on that podcast. Was I funny? I would say... You were put in a very awkward situation, and watching you diplomatically handle something like that was very funny to me. 
because I've only ever seen you do the opposite. Like right. I've only ever seen you just kind of like steamroll over people like that. So to watch you actually be very kind. Oh, this was a person yeah. who was challenging me over he didn't like somebody I knew. He didn't he does he hates he hates uh Smigel. No, no, no. Don't bring up that. That uh, yeah, he was being a jerk about Smigel. He was being a jerk and, about Smigel, and then he asked then in the same thing. He asked why you weren't working for him for free. Right. He wanted this guy wanted me to to hire me for free. Right. And I said, who do you think I am? And how much for free? You said you have an for obligation to your ex wife That was very funny. Huh? You said you have an obligation to your ex wives Yes. I, I want to play something uh -huh. that that I did for you. Right uh through cameo do you know that rudy giuliani does cameo so let's set it up i am um, i my friend caleb and i used to uh send each other cameos all the time and i when giuliani first started doing cameos he was doing them actually pretty cheap and i immediately like as soon as cameo sent me the email that he was on cameo I hired him to uh, send a message to my friend Caleb saying that, uh, and you can look it up and maybe while you play that, I'll, I'll find the, the link to the original one and post it in the chat. Yeah. But uh, just like letting him know that uh, even though he and the Republican party tried to thwart democracy, it would be okay. I said, Caleb was very sad about the way that January 6th turned out essentially. So ju just so you know, uh, Liam McEnany is a good friend of mine. And I, I saw that uh, Rudy Giuliani would record a cameo. It was five, I think it was $5. He'll do right. a cameo. I hired Rudy Giuliani. Uh, and he, here he is. Hang on. It's muted, David. David told me about how you thought you. Hang on. Hey, Liam McEnany, your friend David told me about how you thought you had to pass gas on the number four bus, but it turned out to be more than gas. Man, Liam McEnany, that has to be tough. Wearing white shorts on a Manhattan scorcher smack dab in the middle of rush hour with your girlfriend standing right next to you. I feel you, Liam McEnany. I really do. But it's a reminder of how precarious life is. One moment you think you're taking your lady downtown to your favorite Korean barbecue, and suddenly one blast out of your leaky balloon knot and poof, everything changes in a second. Poof, it's all over. Poof, runny bilge, <laughs> dripping down your legs, Liam McEnany. You look for your girlfriend, poof, she's gone. In the blink of a balloon knot, won't even return your phone calls. I feel for you, Liam McEnany. Reminds me of 9-11. Beautiful fall day. <laughs> I was planning a walk in the park with my second wife, Judith Nathan, who turned out to be a voracious harpy. And the next thing you know, well, I don't have to tell you what happened that day. It's all in my book, Leadership. <laughs> I guess the point is, Liam McEnany, never take anything for granted. Cherish each moment. You never know. You just never know. One day you're with a woman who you can't figure out where you end and she begins. And then poof, intestinal air completely betrays you by turning solid. Poof, she's gone. Poof, all that's left is a memory. Okay, take care, Liam McEnany. And next time you're riding the bus in white shorts, remember, to exercise constant vigilance because things don't always turn out the way you planned. Bye, Liam Nakanini. You sound like someone I would like to get to know. <laughs> 9 11. So, now, somebody said that that's not Rudy Giuliani, that it may be Robert Smigel. I don't believe that.
I don't think it's Robert Smigel. That's Rudy Giuliani. And, and I, if it's Robert Smigel and not Rudy Giuliani, I want my five dollars back. Well, so here's um, here is uh, I'm posting a link in the chat to the original because he also makes a weird pivot to 9 11. Like everything that you and Smigel did in that is oh, like, wait, you can't hear me now. Yeah. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you the yeah, whole time. But uh, I posted a link in the chat. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think I muted something. Okay. Anyway, it's just uh, everything that Smigel does in that, he kind of does in the original video, he pivots to 9 11. Uh, and he tells my friend Caleb he sounds like someone he'd want to know. Because <laughs> I said Caleb had a pickup truck and he called Missy. Uh huh. Giuliani was like trying to pretend to be a man of the people. He said, like, I said, like barbecue beer shrimp. Well, so what did what did Rudy Giuliani really charge you for that? Uh, honestly, I think it was under two hundred bucks. I mean, right yeah. after usually with cameo, someone will launch cheap, and that's when you get them. Is like right when they launch, and you get them cheap, and then once uh, they they get a couple under their belt, and the word spreads that this really famous person is doing it, that's when they jack up. I got like flavor flave for a friend that way really oh my god my dude i got that for my friend's birthday and he fucking went ape shit i got charlie sheen for a friend's birthday what does he need to do that for i think uh he probably infecting women with aids opens you up to one or two lawsuits oh all that money is i, I don't know how much money he has but i just know he was doing fucking cameo and i immediately bought a friend one for his birthday I just I always assumed he made so much two and a half men cash that he was but you're right and also drugs really fucking puts a dent in the bank account I think we both know people who you would assume were going to die billionaires but they did so much drugs so consistently for so long that uh that they have a surprising lack of funds now because in order to get your hands on the drugs you have to hang out with expensive people make it and then you make expensive decisions right yes, and also you just end up doing drugs all day alone in your garage after a while and that's a very expensive habit especially because you got to have like two or three dealers really who are willing to come every day like, you, like your dealer is not going to come like stop at your house every day to re-up you on on base or whatever like you gotta you gotta cycle through multiple people right right and then that usually comes with a host of other things like sex addiction and divorce and you know all that shit that costs of all the vices that are out there what do you think is the best and what do you think is the worst what do you think is the healthiest vice and what's the unhealthiest vice I mean, anything done to extreme can be bad for you, but I feel like things like cooking and exercise are really good, healthy. No, so vices. Oh, vices? Um, pornography, probably. Is the worst? Oh, the worst. I thought you were saying the best. Oh, oh yeah. I'm oh, telling you, when I start, I'm telling you, I tell people, do not, the, the, I wish I had the five years back that I spent working in pornography. <laughs> I would say the worst vice is uh, the one directed by Adam McKay. No, um, that's not nice. That's not nice. We love Adam McKay. Luckily, he doesn't listen to the show. I know. Even uh, I don't listen to the show. Uh, I would say probably <laughs> child molesting is the worst. That's not a vice. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's a crime. I'm talking about like gambling, uh -huh. uh, drugs, sex addiction, sex addiction. I would say probably sex addiction might be the worst. Worse than drugs? Worse than drugs, because it ultimately leads you to hurting people in your life. In a way that even being addicted to drugs doesn't. Being Most addicted like, to sex, you who do you hurt? Your partner. But if you have a lot of partners, 
but you're always going to end up like, oh, now I'm going to date this person exclusively. And that never works out. But that's how I, I, I that, that's my lifestyle. And Are women. You Are you poly? Uh, Are you poly? No, no. It's just like women just, women want to go to bed with me. Right. And that, so right. that's, that's my charity is that. I know they, a lot of women who want a good night's sleep. <laughs> and so they know, they know, they know the game that a guy, a stallion like me right. can't be saddled to one woman. So they yeah. come, I've got hot and cold running women here all day. Wow. So you're running a, you're running an influenza award. <laughs> But aren't there some guys who women know that they're just going to plow their way through the, the female population and they're just going to be one of one of many? And they're, don't you, know, you think? I've known guys like that. Yeah. And there are women who still believe that they are the one who's going to turn that around. Or... The guy will lie to them to get what he wants and then part of that lie is like oh i love you or whatever and then suddenly he's in this relationship he had no intention of of like honoring okay there were comedians who who had sex the way i pee you mean uh after a long strain <laughs> I mean, sex I mean, for them as they're standing there for 15 minutes going, God damn it. Why don't you just go? <laughs> there were there were there are comics I know. Who, uh -huh. Sex, it's no big deal. They every I traveled with them. I was like, wow, that's just amazing. Well, yeah, and, David, I would say that I spent my 20s that way. Like uh, they're having just, sex with comedians. No, having sex with uh, just a lot of women, just kind of with no thought about it. And what happened was, A, I hurt a lot of people without intending to. because like, that, that, That's not sex. That's you. No, I mean, but it, I'm telling you my experience. Uh, and then, B, now I'm 45 and single. Like, right. I had many, many opportunities with many wonderful women to build something meaningful and it just wasn't what I wanted for a long time. And I wouldn't say I was a sex addict, but I would say that I just kind of like blew a lot of chances at a happier life. Who were these guys named chances? <laughs> hey, oh, chances is the name of my dog. <sighs> As Dr. Seuss said, don't be sad. It's over. Be glad it happened. Um, I'll tell you what, man, LA is no place to be single and alone and trying to date. That is for goddamn sure. But New York is. New York really is, man. Oh, come on. New York's a great place to date. Dude, I went, I went before the shutdown. I went home. I did a show in, in Bushwick. I was on my way out the door with some friends and this woman stopped me and started flirting with me. That shit just doesn't happen to me here in Los Angeles. And what happened? I had to, I, you know what? I don't drink. So I didn't want to like hang out at the bar and drink all night. And because I don't drink, I did, you know, like, and now, cause I live my life in a different way. I didn't want to like abandon my friends to spend, you know, five hours, maybe sleeping with a woman, maybe not. Right. They just let, not how I live my life anymore. Every woman who flirts with me in New York turns out to be an undercover cop. <laughs> Well, asking if you want a date isn't for <laughs> You got to go away from the Holland Tunnel to meet women. <laughs> hey, did you see my interview with uh, Donald Trump? Uh, you mean the thing you bumped me for last week? Yeah, let me play a clip. Okay. Blacks love me and the Latins love me. The Latins, the good Latins. Mariano Rivera, the Yankee pitcher, loves Trump. Antonio Sabato Jr., he voted for me. Some say Antonio Sabato Jr. is Italian and not a Latin, but how could he not be a Latin, David? The Pope lives in Italy, and he speaks 
Latin. So that makes Antonio a Latino. And of course, diamond and silk. Diamond and silk. They voted for me and everyone knows silk is a Latino, which proves the Latins love me. I'm pretty certain silk is not a Latino. Silk is a Latin. Silk is not a Latin. David, David, I know for a fact silk is a Latin. Silk comes from worms. And everyone knows the only place you can get worms is from Mexico. (laughs) You can't drink the water, David. You can't drink the water because you'll get worms. Silk comes from worms. She's part worm, so she's a Latin. (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, okay. Vladimir Putin checkmate, said this week. David, checkmate, David. Checkmate. That was my interview with President Bush. Uh, Again, they're saying it's Smigel. Bush. That's, I mean, President Trump. That's Trump, not Smigel, right? That was great. That was... Uh, that was that's, that's, that's Donald Trump. You know, I wish you would get Donald Trump on the show for real. By the way, the Pope had Donald him. Trump. That was Donald Trump. No, 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 because Trump knows the Pope hates him. <laughs> you know, David, I know a really good roast joke writer out here. Yeah, you should, you should get to know. You guys should know her. I feel like she would work well with you. Okay, I'm just saying. I want to introduce you to a really good joke writer. See, I can tell you're already, you've gone Hollywood. You're, you're putting people together. I see what you're I've doing. I've always done that. In fact, I stopped for a long time, man, because here's the thing about comedians is they never, ever are grateful or pay you back a favor. And it would strictly be doing a favor to you and, and Smigel to introduce you to this woman. Okay. It wouldn't be doing her a favor. It would be doing you a favor. Did you see the Nancy Pelosi documentary on Frontline? Wait, wait. I want to tell you a joke. Well, never mind. Okay. What's the Pelosi doc? No, well, I tell don't me the joke. I don't watch me. Frontline. I do watch PBS NewsHour. Yeah. In fact, I knew the Ukrainians were going to be serious because I was watching PBS NewsHour before the invasion, and they were just showing all these old ladies learning how to shoot rifles. I was like, God damn, these people are not giving up their country without a fight. Now, would if this were happening here in the United States... Uh, I'd be in Mexico or Canada. <laughs> you couldn't get into Canada. There would be a waiting list. <laughs> there would be a waiting list like Sardis in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> it would be harder to get into than Musso and Frank's on Oscar night. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine, like, <laughs> surrounded by all these crackpots, these militia guys? And they're going to train me how to use a gun, and I'm going to fight side by side with them against the invading army. I'd be so out of this country. The funniest thing was there was an article with a headline about <laughs> this reporter's conversation he had with, <laughs> with a taxi driver being driven through Ukraine. Hmm? Like, Who the fuck is still driving a taxi in Kiev? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that's the point where maybe. No, no, no. Maybe Let's you log out for a few hours. Maybe you, maybe you take a couple. Maybe you take a couple shifts off. <laughs> All right. It's very sad what's going on there, and they're very brave. They are, and they remind me of what I'm not. Like I couldn't do what they're doing. You know what? No, you couldn't. <laughs> no, I couldn't. No, I, I, I couldn't either. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people in this country who would be very shocked to learn what they couldn't do if they had if their back was against the wall. I, I say Manhattan, every, here in Manhattan, everyone's an intellectual until they need a plumber. Right. And then all of a sudden they realize how stupid they are. Yeah. That's why, uh, man, if if you, if I never if my nephew ever asked me what college you should go to, I would say fucking technical some technical absolutely or an electrical wiring will never go on absolutely no alienation from the product learn to be a carpenter learn to be a chef learn to work with your hands no it's uh, 
it's a new era. You know, what's so funny is when I was a kid, you know, like we would learn about the Bronze Age and the Stone Age and fucking Renaissance and all that. And I always wondered what it felt like to be just an on the ground peasant as the fucking dark ages shifted to the bronze age or whatever, or, you know, the, to the age of enlightenment. And uh, now I know, and it sucks. I don't think it happened. Like set your clocks. It's now the, the iron age, everybody. No, but I'm saying like, uh, a- really it's the iron age. I just got used to the bronze age. Come oh, on. No, it's the iron age. There's a point where you're watching a blacksmith shoe a horse and you're like 55 years old and you're like, wow, shoot horses, man. The world is passing me by. I guess no more watching a horse die of split hoof at the age of three anymore. <laughs> I think it's gradual. Here I am trained to treat split hooves, watching mm-hmm. a guy shoe a horse, watching my whole livelihood just go up and smoke in a day. Right. That's what it feels like right now. It's things happen fast now, but I don't think people said, well, it's the industrial revolution. We're living in the industrial revolution. No, but one day you wake up here. You are a guy whose entire livelihood was spent pushing a big wooden thing around a pillar to make the machine go. Right. And then you're just watching a fucking engine do your job for you. Right. And you're like, great. I broke my body for 25 years and now I'm out of the job because I'm watching this, this fucking steam engine do my job. That happened to me with talkies. <laughs> you're talking about Takis, the, uh, the Latino spicy snack food. Uh, yeah, we should wrap it up. No, I feel, like it's more huh? I feel like we're the grateful dead halfway through uncle John's band. Uh, I think it started the started the first verse yet. I I think we should wrap it up. It's uh, this has been I I hope this was enjoyable for the listeners because this has been fun for me. What is happening to you? Um, If you really want to know the truth, I'm learning emotional sobriety. And it is fucking open up a whole new world of like get off the wagon. I'm still fine. What does emotional sobriety mean? It means I don't have to sit here and be mad because our segment started a half hour late. And now I'm going to be up till two in the morning doing math homework. I don't have to be mad about that. Yes, you do. I could choose. I could choose to be mad about it or I could choose. To I, I disrespected you. I could have ended the segment 45 minutes ago if I really felt any way. Well, about what it. is this emotional sobriety? Where'd you learn that? I, it's actually me getting out of my own way. It's been great. Get back in your way. You're more fun that way. Really? You think uh, if I'd spent the last hour and 15 minutes bitching at you about yeah. being bumped by Mers- Mersky and Kay? Yeah. Them saying the same thing that they've been saying for the two years you've had them on the show? Now you're talking. Well, now you're audience, talking. Your audience. Needs- <laughs> That's the Liam we love. Your audience needs to be half informed about American <clears throat> politics. Then they can go research it and learn the correct half. <laughs> Are you happy with Biden? <sighs> I think Biden inherited a plate of shit. And I think he is doing about as well as any human being can do with fucking an impossible situation. He walked into the job just in a no-win situation. I think he's handling it about as well as he could. Yeah. I literally don't think, I can't think of an American politician who could do it better. Okay. Can you think of an mm-hmm. American politician who could handle this better? Joe Manchin. <laughs> Sheldon Whitehouse. Sheldon White. Is- Listen. You see him biting his fingernails yesterday? Listen, say what you want about Sheldon Whitehouse. The man last week took on and won a fight against Big Sunshine. Yes, he did. The man protected Sunshine for America. Yes, he did. Does this mean that we're going to wake up and it's going to be dark until 930 in the morning all winter? And no. uh, my uh, and my and my. 
<laughs> my depression is going to be way worse than it ever was because I'm not going to see sun until the noon. Well, yes, but the man struck a blow against big sunshine and won. We need to send White House to the White House. <laughs> All right. I, you know what? Oh. <laughs> I got to go to bed. I love Marianne Cummings, like Biden, the choice of comfortable white lips. What do you think you are, Marianne Cummings? You're right. an academic in America. There's literally no more comfortable life in the world than an academic in America. Really? You don't have to do anything. Once you get tenure, you don't have to do anything. Okay. You, get you, would, make a great, you would make a great professor then. As long as we have tenure. Listen, all I need to do literally is write one shitty script for a movie that gets made, and I could be a screenwriting professor for the rest of my life. When I'm out of the school, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about a screenwriting professor I had. I can't say anything until I'm out of the school. But, but you know, you can teach, but not do. People. But if you want to teach it like a a university that pays well, you have to have like one decent credit under your belt. Even if the movie's a flop, it has to have been a go. Some people are, I, I disagree with you on that. Well, I don't know, maybe that's true. There, Sid Fields never got a movie made. That is true. And his book is great. His book is great. I mean, the Save the Cat guy, he wrote uh, fucking terrible movies. But he was great at teaching screenwriting structure to people who don't right. have screenwriting structure. Exactly. I'm just saying it doesn't, I'm saying you can be a great writer or you can be a terrible writer. You just have to have been a successful writer. In other words, a terrible writer. <laughs> How do people contact you, Mr. McEnany? I actually have something to plug now that everyone's gone to sleep. Yes. I have a show to plug. Good. When was the last time I plugged shit? Um, I'm performing this Saturday, March 26th. At, I swear to God, it's a good show. Even though it's a terrible venue, the Liquid Zoo in Van Nuys on Sherman Way. The Liquid Zoo? The Liquid Zoo. Is that a oh, comedy man. club? What is it? It is a dive bar in Van yeah. Nuys on Sherman Way. It is home to a notoriously terrible open mic. You ever watch Rich Scheidner's I Am Comic? Yeah. You know how part of his journey to getting back into stand-up is performing at a terrible open mic in the yes. valley where nobody's listening? That's the Liquid Zoo. But my friend Ryan runs a great show there. It's half comedy and half karaoke. Um, and then also my friend's band, Vanishing Twin, is at Echo on Sunset on Wednesday the 30th, and I'll be there watching. If anyone wants to come hang out. If anybody wants to watch Liam watching. If anyone nope. wants to hang out, buy me a seltzer. All right. We need to so do the, the Liquid Zoo show is free. Okay. That's it. That's it. Liam McEnany, everybody. Let's do this again. <laughs> That Maybe is, you like, you like radical propositions. Here's one. Yeah. I'll be in New York in the summer. Let's do this live in your apartment. Mm hmm. Okay. You heard that folks. He is, he has committed to this. I will be live in David. Well, actually, we were talking about doing a, a live show somewhere. Yeah. But only if there's a new wave of COVID. Let's do it at the Soho house. Huh? Let's do it at the Soho house. We should try. You were my band leader. We, we did one live show. Yeah, let's do a live show at the Soho house. Let's do you, you'll be my band leader. We'll be, we'll bring professor Alan Minsky and, and, uh, Harvey K to the Soho. House. And have you spoken to our band? Is she available? She's getting married. But, she just got engaged. But is she available for a live show? I don't know, because she, now she performs in, on Broadway. She performs in, uh, on Broadway shows, so I don't know what her schedule's like. Anymore. And she played the bass. She played the bass. And that was our band, and you conducted her. 
Very, con very conceptually it. funny. It was one of the funniest things. It did not quite come off in audio. <laughs> it was great. And Frank Conniff was my sidekick. Frank was your sidekick. And I would, we, the idea, I always wanted to do this, where the host comes out, does the setup to a joke, uh -huh. and then the sidekick comes up with the punchline before I can get right. my punchline in. Like the idea was Frank is so just riffing off the top of his head and his jokes are so much better than mine. And I'm getting progressively conceptually. It was very funny. Let's do a reunion at the Soho house. We could bring Jackie the joke man. You have a great memory. Yes. I forget. And, and Alex Showbriz. Showbriz was probably too busy to, to be there. Alex Brazil is so busy. He doesn't even return his own phone calls. <laughs> That's how busy Alex has become. They all leave us in a cloud of dust. He really they? did. I thought he wouldn't do it, but he did it. Yep. They all get successful. He abandoned his old grandpa. Mm -hmm. Old grandpa Dave. Nah, he's a good guy, Alex. He really is. He's, he's a good He's listening. He's a short Jew in showbiz. He can't be that great. <laughs> Once short Jews enter the industry, they become a different kind of person, and you know it. What are you saying? I'm saying you've met people at William Morris. All right. Let us now say good night. Thank you, oh, Liam. David's a friend of you, buddy. William Morris. Interesting. All right. This was great, Dave. Thank you. Great Let's job see you again in a few weeks. Yep, I'm proud of you. And then you I'm can bump me for a. I don't want to say. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm proud, proud of you too, man. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay. The new Liam McInerney. I got to go do math homework. Holy shit! It's nine thirty. I do got to do math homework. You got homework. I got homework. I'll talk to you. Later. Isn't that okay. terrible? I'll... Am I in show business anymore? I can't tell. You're doing math. It's great. I'm, I'm doing math. Yeah. I don't. It doesn't feel like succeeding, but it is. It is. We're proud of you here. We Robert really Barrera, you missed the whole discussion. Go back an hour. Oh, hang on. Let's go to uh, who do we have here? Rodrigo, you want to say hello to Liam? Oh, my God. Rodrigo is my favorite. He has my favorite questions. Rodrigo, you're muted, buddy. You got Rodrigo. Rodrigo Saldana Zera? Yeah, he's muted. Rod? He's, okay. he's muted. You got to mute him. I'm unmuting him. He might have gone to sleep. He doesn't listen to the show. He's wide awake. He's probably doing something else. I remember him. He has, he has some great questions. Uh huh. You know what I like? Just someone who's Someone who calls into a radio show and is on point, mm -hmm. understands exactly the question they're asking, gets right to the point. And I feel like your man, Rodrigo, is good with that. Yeah. I am eating a chocolate Tootsie Pop. Yes, and you're bald. So I'm going to call you Kojak from now on. Who loves you, baby? All right. Uh, I really do have to do math homework, man. I got to go. Okay. But let me ask you a question before you go. Oh, have okay. you ever eaten a chocolate Tootsie Pop? Um. <laughs> Yeah, 50 bucks, same as in town. This is the worst thing. Like, I like Tootsie Pops. Right. But chocolate Tootsie Pops. Not since I was a child. Okay. This is... All right, the show ended a half hour ago. Let's just... Yeah, okay. Goodbye. All right, goodbye. Liam and David rambled about this for a solid hour. No, with the chocolate Tootsie Pops? Who canceled? Huh? Who canceled? Me. I didn't show up today. No, no, I'm saying you rambled about chocolate tizzy pops. Yeah, I didn't now. show up. Seriously, you you did he did that? I talked about uh Tootsie Pops for about 45 minutes. Why? Because I opened my computer this morning and I saw what was going on in the world. Right. And I said, I can't, I just can't. Not today. I just don't want to talk about listen. Listen, I don't want to talk about it. Listen to this master class and from Johnny Show Prep here. Yeah.
All right, I, I really do have to wrap it up. No, no, Tassi, I gotta go. go. Thank you. Go do your homework. I gotta go. Stop asking about Tassi Tootsie Pops and then okay. try. Go. Right, go. Go do your homework. All right, I gotta go. Go go do your homework. Talk get, to you later. Bye. All right, talk All right. to you. Bye. Thank you. Liam McEnany. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. He's gone. I miss him. I want to thank all our guests. Uh, Grace Jackson was back. Listen to her over at the Literary Hangover podcast. <clears throat> uh, Professor Ben Burgess, read his new piece over at The Daily Beast about Bill Maher. Emil Guillermo over at the American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Read him there. The Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And of course, the PETA podcast. The Hershenfelds, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, and of course, Ethan Hershenfeld. Go watch Thug Thug Jew right now on YouTube. Judah Friedlander, how great was he? Follow him on Twitter at Judah World Champ and his shows. Pay what you want, stand up shows every week. Go to judahfriedlander.com for more information. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn, go to Barry W. Lynn to find out what he's up to. The professors and Mary Ann, Professor Mary Ann Cummings, Professor Ann Lee, Professor Jonathan Bick, Professor Adnan Hussein, and Rachel Ventura. Go to Rachel Ventura's website and donate money. It is, what is her, let me just get her. Ventura, I think it's Rachel. I think it's Rachel, Rachel F Ventura dot com. Give her money right now. Professor Harvey JK, Alan Minsky, and of course, Liam McEnany. I want to thank everybody who puts this show together. Grace Jackson, Hannah Feldman, uh, Professor Jonathan Bick, Sarah Bush, Andy Brown, Joe in Norway, and and of course the brilliant Dan Frankenberger, who whose internet went out today, so we didn't have Dan Frankenberger today. He was here in spirit. He will be with us tomorrow night for office hours every Friday night at eight p.m. Come meet new people. Go to my website to sign up. And uh, while you're over there, sign up for my newsletter. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. To tell a dirty joke, he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckled in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yes, it's time right now for the David Feldman Show. Get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way.